host and welcome everyone to our decision to act session. Rather, you are in Europe and uh, sacrificing your lunch break to be with us today or earlier in uh, on the East Coast or the West Coast of the US or anywhere else in the world. We're very, very thankful that you're connecting and being with us today. We will have eight oral presentations. I've posted them here. I will introduce the name of the speaker, where they're coming from and the subject. Uh, just to give you an idea, we're going to start with some uh, space law related uh, oral presentations on liability waivers and plan planetary defense missions, then obligation to participate in planetary defense actions as part of international youth cogens. Um, uh, and Sophie Martin will introduce us to reacting to near Earth object impact, exceptional circumstances justifying non-compliance with international law. Uh, Avishay will, Melamed will talk about planetary defense as entrepreneurial politics. I will jump in to talk a little bit about socio-anthropological aspects of planetary defense based on natural disaster management literature. Uh, Professor Aaron Bolley will talk about precautionary planetary defense, preemptive deflection and exercising restraint. Detlef Koshny will talk about ESA's activities in planetary defense. And Gerhard, who you just saw, will talk about the scope, objective and first results of the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. I will be uh, co-chairing the session with Rudy, as Gerard just mentioned. And uh, Peter, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Do not forget that we do have fantastic posters for today. Uh, for the decision to act session, you have five posters that you can check out. Uh, as mentioned by some already in the chat, uh, you can feel free to check them out. And then maybe during the breakouts, uh, if you're not too tired and want to talk about something else, we can go talk about the posters together. And the posters are from Peter Buhatchek. Uh, one is entitled Effective or Inclusive Decision Making, Normative and Empirical Analysis of the Governance trade-offs in planetary defense. Joel Marx presents what is planetary defense from research to implementation. Haynes Mayers presents planetary defense timelines of key developments. Ryan Puello, Puleo, sorry, uh, presents the future role of the United States in planetary defense. And Elisa Simo Soler presents saving humanity democratically from impact uh, impact refugees to deterioration states, depending the extreme legal and policy cases. So, if you are interested in any of these posters, I invite you uh, all of these posters. Please go check them out. And as Gerard mentioned, they are on the website. There is no specific time to go look at them. So, so feel free to do so. And panelists, um, speakers today, know that I will be turning my camera off, so will Rudy, and we will turn it back on when you are at the one minute uh, mark left. So you'll have seven minutes, you'll see me pop up at the top of your screen uh, when you have one minute left, and so this way you know uh, when to wrap up. And like every other session, all uh, presenters and panelists and participants know, we will only have Q and A's at the end of all the presentations. So on that note, uh, Peter, if you could load the first talk, and uh, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Luciano Vaz Ferreira, who is a PhD student at the University of Reading. He will be presenting on liability waivers and planetary defense missions, the Good Samaritan Principle. Luciano, the, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. But we can see you. That's a good start. Nope. I see your mouse moving, but no sound. No. Unfortunately, I mean, you are not muted. Maybe uh, there's some problem with the connection or with the settings on on your microphone. Luciano, would you like us to move to the next presentation while you figure this out? Let us know by yes or no on the camera. Yes, okay, great. Well, Peter, if you can assist me in uh, in launching the next presentation by, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Christoph Newell-Glowitz, 
who's a PhD candidate at Marie Curie University in Lublin. And his presentation is on obligation to participate in planetary defense action as part of international use cogets. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Is the sound okay? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Niewęgłowski. I'm a PhD student at Maria Curie Skłodowska University in Lublin, Poland, uh, and I have an honor to present you the presentation called Obligation to Participate in Planetary Defense Action as part of International Use Cogens. Uh, in this short presentation, I'm going to outline you the concept of International Use Cogens and link it by using the provisions of the UN Charter to the issue of participation in planetary defense action. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my argument is reasoning uh, and reasoning is based on the thesis that threat of asteroid collision uh, with global consequences can be considered as threat to international peace and security. It implies that provisions of the UN Charter could be applied in order to prevent a global catastrophe. Maintenance uh, of international peace and security is United Nations Security Council primary responsibility. All of the UN members are obligated to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the UN Charter. Next slide, please. The concept of use cogens in international public law, although having strong roots that go back to the 18th century, was formally introduced into international legal system in the Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. In the light of this provision, a use cogens norm, in other words, a peremptory norm, is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as a norm from which no derogation is permitted and which can be modified only by subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. The concept of use cogens uh, uh, is named inter alia as a vision of international order hope for public order of mankind or as symbolic value in the international community. However, it's rarely referred in jurisprudence despite the fact that the violations of these norms have far-reaching consequences, not only in terms of law of treaties, but also international responsibility. Next slide, please. While drafting the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, International Law Commission decided not to include a catalog of these norms which should be considered as use cogens. Their content was left to be worked out by jurisprudence and international law doctrine. However, the definition of use cogens contained in Article 53 of the, convention, of the Convention provides three criterions that can help identify legal norms as peremptory norms. As you can see on the slide, the sociological criterion is met if the norm is accepted and recognized as peremptory by the international community of states as a whole. Uh, the normative criterion consists in the prohibition of derogation, and the axiological criterion concerns the values cited above that underlie uh, the contemporary international community. Only the combined fulfillment of these three criteria allows for the recognition of an international legal norm as a new student's norm. Next slide, please. And the next one. Now, uh, having in mind that the threat of the collision with global consequences can be considered as threat to international peace and security, I will recall three few provisions of the UN Charter that can be considered as legal considered as legal basis for a planetary defense action. First of all, Article 1 states that the very purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security, and to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace. Next slide, please. Article 2 of the Charter sets out a number of principles to be followed by states in pursuit of the purpose of the United Nations. States are obliged to fulfill in good faith these obligations assumed by them in accordance with the Charter, and they should give the United Nations every assistance in any action it takes with accordance uh, in accordance with the char Charter. Moreover, United Nations shall ensure that the states which are not members of the United Nations act in accordance with these principles, so far as may be necessary for maintenance of international peace and security. Next slide, please. 
The UN's organ, which will have vital role in planetary defense action, is Security Council. Its primary responsibility is the maintenance of international peace and security. This organ determines the existence of any threat to the peace and makes recommendations or decides what measures shall be taken to maintain or restore international peace and security. States agree that in carrying out its duties under uh, these responsibilities, the Security Council acts on their behalf. The very ob uh, important obligation is the obli obligation to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council by the UN members. Next slide, please. Measures adopted by the Security Council um, to cease a threat to international peace and security should be decided in accordance with the UN Charter. Firstly, the measures should not involve the use of armed force, but if they, if they are an inadequate, the Security Council can take action by air, sea or land forces as may be necessary. In the context of planetary defense action, Article 43 of UN Charter contains a very important obligation. All members of the United Nations, in order to contribute to the maintenance of international peace and security, are obliged to make available to the Security Council Air Forces assistance and facilities. Next slide, please. Moreover, states have to take action required to carry out the decisions of the Security Council and not only allow it to work on its own. The obligation, obligation requires an activity on the state side. All members of the UN should also join in affording mutual assistance in carrying the measures decided upon by the Security Council. Next slide. So, are these obligations to be considered as use against? There is no strict answer to that question. On the one hand, they meet the criteria set out by the Article 53 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties. During the drafting process of the Convention, Articles 1 and 2 of the UN Charter were shown as an example of the use against norms. They, will also uh, they also protect uh, values of the international community, the values that are also protected by more, more recognized in jurisprudence uh, peremptory norms. On the other hand, due to the article, of, uh, article 103 of the UN Charter, obligations resulting from the document are sometimes considered as, uh, in the international law doctrine as separate types of international obligations. What's more, although the concept of peremptory norm is linked to the issue of international responsibility, the main consequences of breaches of Juskogans uh, are visible in the area of the law of treaties. Finally, beside the Vienna Conference, there is little to no proof of Juskogans' character of the recalled UN Charter obligations. Next slide, please. You have 30 seconds left. Uh, to conclude my presentation, the states are obliged under the UN Charter provisions to participate in global planetary defense action. The uh, participation is governed by the rules set out in the set document. Uh, however, there is no definite answer to the question if the obligations to participate in planetary defense action are part of the international use governance. This lack of certain, certainty is linked to the very nature of the UN Charter obligations and the vagueness of the concept of the use governance itself. Thank you for your attention. Perfectly on time. Thank you so much, Christoph, for this very interesting first presentation. We're jumping into international law, uh, thanks to you. And uh, as I saw it in the chat, I think Luciano is ready to go. So let's test your mic, Luciano. Can you hear us? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Perfect. Wonderful. Oh, great. Peter, if great. you would kindly put back uh, Luciano's presentation. So we are going to listen from Luciano Ferreira, who is a PhD student at the University of Reading, and his presentation will be on liability waivers and planetary defense missions, the Good Samaritan Principle. Luciano, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Luciano Vas Ferreira. I'm from the University of Reading, a PhD student, and my presentation is about liability waivers and Planetary Defense Missions, the Good Samaritan Principle. Next slide, please. So uh, I always start uh, making the following question. What if a uh, planetary defense mission goes wrong, like uh, error in orbit correction or fragmentation or uh, modification of the impact site or maybe uh, direct damage caused by spacecraft from a planetary defense mission? Next slide. What are the legal, international legal consequences uh, if a planetary defense mission failed? 
So the international law in general imposes payment of compensation to the victim state for damages caused by space object in almost any circumstances. So we, we must ask ourselves, is it fair for a planetary defense mission? You have a group of, of, of um, states uh, acting in good faith to, to save humanity. So my research question is to explore alternatives to the cor current international liability regime applied to, to planetary defense missions offering options that could contemplate liability waivers. Next slide, please. Um, we have a, a concept of liability in international law. Uh, in, liability is different from responsibility. Responsibility is related to internationally wrongful acts, uh, violations to international law, like uh, nuclear explosives device, and liability, on the other hand, liability is um, injurious consequence arising out of acts not prohibited by international law, like uh, by space launching or other planetary defense alternatives, like uh, net impactor or gravity tractor. Uh, there is an obligation to prevent harm and eliminate or mitigate damages. Um, the, the international law sources are international custom, the other space treaty, and the Space Liability Convention. Next slide, please. There's three types of liability in international law. The first one, fault-based liability, uh, is about intentional or a negligent act, strict liability for risk uh, activities. The compensation is due even if there's a compliance with standards of care, and absolute liability is more rigorous than restrict liability restricted um, uh, with restricted exoneration clause. Next slide, please. Let's uh, analyze the Space Liability Convention in the sp uh, planetary defense perspective. So uh, a very important concept is launching state term. And uh, we, states which launches or procure the launching and states whose territory or facility a space is is object is launching um, that's the concept of the launching state. And uh, the treaty, according to the treaty, there's two types of liability for, for a launching state. The first one is the absolute liability for, for damages causing earth, earth and aircraft flighting, and the fault based liability for other space objects like satellites or other spacecraft uh, on orbit. Next slide. So, in my PA research that I'm currently um, developing, it's a work in progress. Um, I find some issues for planetary defense missions um, in, the, in the Space Liability Convention. Um, the um, uh, absolute liability seems unfair for planetary defense missions. There's no standards of care for fault-based liability. Uh, there's no liability exoneration based on first measure, necessity, or distress. And uh, the term precuse the launching is very broad, so it brings a disproportionate liability for all participants in a planetary defense mission, like a state that is find, founding a, a planetary defense mission or a state that make available their, the, the, uh, its territory for a planetary defense mission could be absolutely liable if uh, something goes wrong. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, I, I'm trying to bring some alternatives to liability exoneration and liability waivers for planetary defense missions. And my, my inspiration is on the, the Good Samaritan principle in domestic law, some legal systems has this kind of, of principle and, and mechanism, legal mechanism. Uh, it's, uh, it's a legal protection to those who help injure sick or endangered person. person. And uh, for me, it's, it's similar if uh, in a planetary defense mission situation. So you, you, you have to protect uh, the states that are acting in good faith to save humanity. Just like uh, this, this kind of Good Samaritan situation, 
And, and my, my proposal is that I'm currently working. Um, uh, the first one is um, using the Article 5 of the Space Liability Convention. And there's a mention about the apportioning agreements. So uh, a group of states that uh, they are conducting a planetary defense mission could make this kind of agreement to uh, of no no legal claim in the case of planetary defense mission, and we have a, a, a very good experience related with the international space station agreements. Uh, there is a cross waiver um, cross waiver liability, and. Um, and the other the other option is to create an amendment to the space liability convention or maybe a new treaty on planetary defense mission uh, creating an entire new liability system and the last option is uh, may, maybe uh, using the security council the united nations security council resolution to create uh, a new law next slide please that's all. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much, Luciano, for your presentation. Um, our next presenter, the one scheduled, is not currently connected, so I will keep checking with her and making sure that as soon as she does connect, we will let the floor uh, to her. So I will now call upon Avice Melamed. Peter, if you could put uh, Avice's presentation up, that would be fantastic. Avice Melamed is an incoming graduate student at Cornell University, and he will be presenting on planetary defense as entrepreneurial politics, the case for policy optimization. Avice, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Let's get started then. Hi, so this presentation is going to discuss a conceptualization of planetary defense as a potential example of entrepreneurial politics and look into how that can shape our planning of planetary defense. Next slide. So for a quick summary, we currently have the opportunity to improve on the potential effectiveness of our planetary defense efforts, but requesting funding for improvements faces several obstacles. Some are natural with the statistical low likelihood of neo hazards reducing their perceived threat salience. Others are political stemming from the restrictive distribution of benefits under planetary defense's current majoritarian framework. I offer two non mutually exclusive solutions to these obstacles. The first is to concentrate the benefits of planetary defense as to raise organized support for its development. Alternatively, we can attempt greater dispersion of development costs to reduce the potential budgetary opposition our proposal can face. I'll also consider entrepreneurial politics as a transitional stage for planetary defense that complicates implementation of these prospective solutions. Next slide, please. So to start, what does efficient planetary defense look like? So as my previous planetary defense conference uh, presentation noted, an efficient program has the capacity to act as early in a scenario as the policymaker deems necessary. This requires us to prepare advanced threat warning and develop the capacity to mitigate a range of neo threats alongside contingencies if unexpected difficulties arise until planetary defense is more of a routine operation than a singular emergency. Likewise, we should allow for programmatic improvements as technology and experience evolve. However, we will then face the need to justify the increased costs of all these measures. Next slide, please. So this presentation will discuss the application of this concept through uh, James Wilson and Theodore Lowy's matrix of interest groups. And in this image, we see that different proposed policies face different conditions based on whether their costs and benefits are concentrated on specific parties or dispersed between many. Concentration pushes supporters and opponents of a policy to organize their uh, in favor of their perspective, while dispersion removes that incentive. Contemporary Princeton political scientist Charles Cameron has identified modern planetary defense as a case of majoritarian politics in the bottom right, with both dispersed costs and benefits. Because planetary defense is generally viewed favorably and consumes little government resources, no significant bloc really advocates against it. 
However, because the program provides a benefit against a low likelihood threat that most people don't consider regularly, few will actually go out of their way to advocate on behalf of planetary defense either. This translates into a limited level of support for planetary defense that, while broadly acceptable, may not maximize our program's potential efficiency. Uh, can uh, next slide, please. So, one might ask what happens uh, when we ask for the funds we need to improve our program's readiness. And in doing so, we would be entering the realm of entrepreneurial politics in the top right of the matrix where we face several challenges. Domestically, increased funding concentrates the costs of planetary defense, as our funding request would motivate advocates of rival budgetary priorities to oppose us. We may face some difficulties answering their accusations as our benefits would remain dispersed. Internationally, planetary defense constitutes a collective action problem where the non-excludability of global protection might motivate free-riding states to leave the costs of initial investment all to a single spacefaring country as to exclusively enjoy the benefits of planetary defense rather than contributing together. This highly concentrates costs and therefore reduces incentives to be that initial investor, potentially stunting the program's development. Overall, increased funding would also push new opponents to organize while doing the opposite for its advocates. Without a planetary defense lobby to defend the issue and all hypothetical future targets of an asteroid unaware for the time being, uh, our, ad our advocacy can't yet match rival programs. Uh, next slide, please. So how can we solve this issue? This presentation discusses two non-mutually exclusive uh, prospective paths, starting with the concentration of benefits. The objective in this approach would be to attract more supporters for planetary defense who could organize. Note that this process would likely be incremental and therefore still involve a sequential move through entrepreneurial politics as we approach the more ideal phases. I'll discuss this a bit more later. Next slide, please. So functionally, concentrating benefits expands the funding proposal's support base improving the organization of our advocacy, and helping answer criticisms by budgetary critics. We can pursue this by emphasizing financial returns on investments into planetary defense, for example, involving the manufacturers of threat mitigation assets, like lifter manufacturers, who might prove natural allies of a multi-lifter program. Simultaneously, planners would do well to consider methodologies with secondary applications beyond planetary defense. Also in this vein, uh, planetary defense has the capacity to support major national priorities in space. For example, as long as no NEO threat emerges, a multi-lifter surplus inventory can stand by for other on-call uses, such as the replacement of unexpected, unexpectedly disabled satellites. More broadly, the research and development of planetary defense assets may have positive externalities, supporting the stated national goal of expanding space activities. Recent estimates project a vastly expanding market for space projects, and planetary defense could valuably contribute to that trend. With concentrated benefits realized, an organized constituency can finally answer questions about the need for increased spending. Next slide, please. A non-mutually exclusive alternative exists. Uh, the status quo of majoritarian politics demonstrates that a dispersed cost-benefit balance does not completely preclude growing planetary defense investments. A request for increased funding may still be possible if we can match this new sum with an even wider dispersion of these costs as to avoid antagonizing budgetary critics. Next slide, please. The dispersion of costs may require us to re-examine the global collective action problem. The gamble to enjoy the non-excludable benefits of planetary defense without contributing may detract from the quality of those same protections that the states may eventually depend on. If, even on a limited scale, additional contributors can help relieve the burden of a foundational capacity, they can valuably accelerate the attainment of efficient protections without aggravating domestic opposition by undertaking the burden on their own. And again, this approach is compatible with concentrating benefits and their joint application could allow us to reach the ideal conditions for advocating planetary defense, client politics. When the benefits are concentrated, but the costs are dispersed, they can facilitate easier adoption and ask for even greater investments. Next slide, please. 
Uh, you have 30 seconds left. All right, we should note that this process is likely incremental as establishing new benefits and relationships to disperse costs will not be immediate. Instead, planners should prepare to spend some time in the entrepreneurial stage and work to minimize its drawbacks until the benefits and value of efficient planetary defense can speak for itself. I've attached a paper on this topic using the multiple streams policy framework to guide this stage. In next slide, please. So, in summary, planetary defense can help us achieve a more effective program beyond the limits of the current majoritarian framework with efficient policy planning. Thank you. That's the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Aviche. And I see that there's some uh, questions starting to be put in the chat, so we will address those uh, once we are at our Q&A time. So for those who were uh, waiting for uh, Anne Sophie's presentation, she is trying to connect via phone. She also submitted a video. So if we cannot get her linked to us by the end of the panel, we will simply run her video so that you have her presentation. And now I will jump in myself and uh, Rudy, I let you <laughs> run the clock for me. Uh, so my name is Adisa Jihanadaji. I teach space law policy and ethics at Harvard University. And today I will talk about the social socio-anthropological lessons learned from natural disaster management. Next slide, please. So a quick introduction, what is anthropology? Because we were uh, diving into law uh, uh, and, and policy a second ago. Anthropology comes from the word anthropos, meaning human, and logos, meaning study. So a very short version of saying, what is anthropology? It's the study of humans. So socio-anthropology enables the analysis of local cultural knowledge in the context of planetary defense. It aims to contextualize and understand better the population that may be impacted. A disaster will disrupt a pre-established social order that one must get acquainted with to better assist it. Next, next slide, please. So my structure, I will give some examples of social challenges that we may face in a situation of an asteroid impact, and then go through the social socio-anthropological lessons learned from natural disaster management literature. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So first thing is the population that we may talk to and ask, for example, to evacuate may have very different priorities. Social inequalities induce the probability that some social categories will suffer more significant damage than others. On most occasions, severe so socioeconomic problems will be perceived as more important than a natural threat. The risk of an asteroid colliding with Earth may seem quite abstract and not of immediate importance to populations facing life-threatening struggles, such as famines, war, economic hardship, or lack of health care coverage. So it may be possible that due to those social challenges, populations may not react to uh, an asteroid impact threat information or asking for them to relocate. Next slide, please. Another point is the resistance to displacement. As anthropologist Bosco, uh, Bosco Boynik, sorry, has explained, despite seismic shocks uh, or tsunami warning, human communities over the ages have consistently avoiding being displaced. This can be explained by a cultural attachment to their land or a fatalistic belief that it is their, it is their fate to be killed by the disaster in question. For economic reason, to connect to my previous point, can also play an important part of their refusal to be displaced. Indeed, they may not have anywhere else to go or may not have the economic resources necessary to leave. Decision makers dealing with asteroid threat management will therefore have to consider that some populations will decide to remain in the zone of impact. Next slide, please. Another problem that uh, that is relevant from literature of anthropologists is the question of math test management. An asteroid impact would entail a collective trauma where as uh, anthropologists say, the living sleep with the dead, with mass graves, cities eradicated, saturated cemeteries, etc. Local population can be deeply disturbed by the lack of cultural care during mass burials. During a natural disaster, population can perceive death rituals as necessary to try to make sense and somehow normalize the disaster. A disregard for death rituals can deeply disturb sets of population and enhance their trauma. So that would be something to keep in uh, to keep in mind if we were in situation of math test management. Next slide, please. Finally, there is a 
potentiality of losing face. An asteroid impact may deprive some people of their face. Such was the case after the earthquake that shook Lisbon, Portugal in 1755, killing in an instant 100,000 people. Philosophers from all over Western Europe came then to challenge the concept of divine justice, the existence of God itself, and precipitated the belief of a secular catastrophe. Next slide, please. And finally, the loss of world heritage, an asteroid impact may result in great cultural loss, which previous disaster may inform the planetary defense community on. For example, the fire of the Alexandria Library, uh, which was the largest collection of classical antiquity and Egyptian literature, more than 100,000 pieces of literature that burned and disappeared. Next slide, please. So what can we learn from socio-anthropological lessons from natural disaster literature? Next slide, please. First of all, uh, there are three ways as identified by anthropologist Douglas to face a disaster. You can be optimistic about it and think that you're the, the object is going to miss the Earth or that the min mitigation mission is going to be successful. You can be pessimistic about it, and this may result in mass panic, attempts to evacuate the zone of potential impact, not listen to information and just flee. And you have a fatalistic approach, which connects again to the previous point, where fate, their fate is to die from the asteroid impact, and that this event may not, it would not be meant to be prevented. The three attitudes will entail radically different reaction and will thus impact risk management. Next slide, please. Lesson from the past, uh, if we look, for example, at pandemic literature, uh, for example, the four years in, seven, in 1347 to 1351 during the Black Plague pandemic that killed between 20% and 60% of the West, uh, Western world population. Uh, or if we look at Vesuvius, these events are so rare that the, the means to fight them and adapt to them tend to fade over the centuries. That time scale defies generational memory and is one of the main challenges facing planetary defense. Next slide, please. Another way is to better know natural disasters that we already know quite well. For example, if we look at rare occurring recurring deadly events such as uh, volcanoes or earthquakes. If we look, for example, at Fukushima to get an estimate of how costly it was, 235 billion to date. And if we look also at the information that is provided by, uh, by the United Nations, for example, uh, they tell us from the United Nations Refu Refugee Agency that out of the 70 million people forcibly displaced worldwide, 80% live in countries neighboring their countries of origin. So when we are doing a rehearsal of an experiment on planetary defense, we can think of the neighboring countries because this is where most of the populations would be displaced. Next slide, please. We can also try to build a bottom-up system. In order to be efficient and resilient, any intervention would need to be locally rooted. Top-down only systems should be avoided as they are eventually poorly adapted to local needs or do not know or take into account local practices. Detailed knowledge of international relations and local regimes are also important to set up cross-border space risk management systems. Next slide, please. We can also help population cope with the catastrophe. The catastrophe, this black swan that Taleb taught, tell us about, this low probability, unpredictable event, which would occur and would have exceptionally far-reaching consequences to the point that it could put us in a state of scotomization, meaning a state of shock where we are in comprehensive denial. Educating population on the topping of planetary defense could help prevent this mental shock. Next slide, please. 30 seconds. And now that I'm almost at time, these are my conclusions. Natural disaster management literature teaches us that risk perception will vary depending on the local population observed. I share James and Friedman's anthropologist recommendation to invite anthropologists, psychologists, economists, and religious experts in the design phase of crisis management planning and would extend it to future planetary defense conferences and similar venues. The goal? to build joint academic research projects to reflect on and plan the most adequate ways to interact with populations under a potential asteroid impact threat. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. And back to you. 
Perfect. Well, thank you, Rudy. Uh, our next presenter is Professor Aaron Bolly. Aaron is an associate professor at UBC. He will be presenting on precautionary planetary defense, preemptive pre deflection and exercises restraint. Professor Bolly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Can you, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd like to begin yes. by acknowledging that the University of British Columbia is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Okay, next slide, please. So when we are thinking about the choices that go into the decision to act, there are many that you would probably consider to be precautionary. For the purposes of this talk, there are two things that we mean when we say precautionary planetary defense, and that is restraint and active management. And we're going to discuss those in turn. Next slide. For showing restraint, we're going to use a POFIS as a working example for a number of reasons. Its size, how close it's going to come to Earth, the 2029 B-plane keyhole complexes, and up until recently, the uncertainty about how accessible those keyholes might be. Because this close approach is going to be so fantastic in 2029, there is general interest among scientists and the public with this asteroid. Next slide. So a question that we need to consider is what happens if everyone wants to go and visit Apophis? So multiple state actors may want to go to this high value target, which is completely understandable. Uh, but there may also uh, be non-state actors who want to get involved. So maybe you have a lot of different people going there because they each have their own idea of what is the best thing to do. And uh, among the distribution of outcomes, we need to consider low probability, high consequence mission failures. Next slide, please. Now, you might ask, why should non-state actors want to get involved? And there could be multiple reasons. Uh, they could want to demonstrate technology, de generate publicity, or both, just like the Tesla launch did for SpaceX. And these new space actors are incredibly innovative and creative with their uses of space. So we need to be cautious about saying, oh, they would have no interest in doing X, Y, or Z, for example. Now, eventually, asteroid mining will become a consideration, and that goes into the motivation for non-state actors at least in the long term. Now, commercial activity on an asteroid could be a benefit or a liability for planetary defense, depending on how it's carried out and the degree of information sharing. So the governance models that would go into showing restraint could also be applicable, at least in part, to future commercial asteroid use. Next slide. Now, for the sake of discussion, we're going to return to Apophis and show a map of the closest approach or focus would have in the next 100 years for a passage through specific coordinates on the OPIC 2029 B-plane. Now, let us consider a hypothetical situation, fortunately, that uh, Apophis's uncertainty still overlaps the 2051 keyhole complex in which the 2068 keyhole resides. If that is the case, we can ask ourselves whether we should be laissez-faire with who goes to Apophis or whether we should Restrict who goes to maybe one or, or two actors because we want to minimize a low probability, high consequence event, such as a bad mission failure that leads to an impact and nudging a focus. And if you come to the conclusion, for whatever reason, that you want to be restrictive in some way, we need to ask who decides. Next slide. So same page does develop cooperative activities, but it is important to recall it's advisory only. It is ultimately the launching state that has authority for granting launch licenses. Now, provided that the past levels of cooperation are maintained among states, then same page does provide a working framework for decision making. But there are worries about how we might go forward, and we see that clearly with the moon. So we have the U.S. led Artemis Accords, which were rejected by Russia and China. And Russia and China are now developing their own model for using the moon. What is potentially more problematic is the militarization of cislunar space. So the U.S. has announced plans for putting military satellites in cislunar orbit, ships in B2S2. And DARPA has released plans for manufacturing capabilities on orbit and on the moon. And many states might interpret the installation of a factory on the moon as a military installation if done by DARPA. And that would contravene Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. It's hard to stress how big of a deal that is. Uh, all of this can create tension that could bleed over into planetary defense. Next slide, please. 
And then we do have to consider that non-state actors can be very capable, but launching from states with very national regulation, and they are not directly involved at the same page. Next slide. Now, ultimately, there is a group in charge, the UN Security Council, and if we really want to restrict who might go to an asteroid, there could be a Security Council resolution. That is heavy-handed and would require wide support and no vetoes. If we have a fractured environment for space cooperation, that could be a problem as well. Now, right now, we are okay. So, in principle, a preparatory resolution toward an international planetary defense governance regime might be possible. But, of course, uh, an open multilateral process should be pursued if that is indeed possible. And this is, that's been discussed a couple times so far in this conference. Next slide. So this takes us to the second part of precautionary planetary defense, at least that I want to discuss, that is active management. So maybe you have an asteroid with a high collision probability, but it's way in the future. That particular situation uh, is something that blends into typical decision to act scenarios. A more nuanced question is if you have an asteroid in an okay orbit, but for whatever reason, you think it could be in a better orbit. So you try to move the asteroid. It is this, the distinction between finding a safe harbor and finding the safest accessible harbor. So any port will do in a storm, but if you have fair weather, do you choose where to go? Next slide. Now, I don't know what the metric is for making that decision, um, and you do need some metric for doing that. But just for the sake of discussion, we could take a look at this keyhole map once again, and we see many different resonance spikes. Now, those are those downward thrusts in the uh, close approach, and they are not keyholes. Uh, they just take the asteroid close to Earth. But we also see that there are these cusps and large plateaus within uh, this map. And for one reason or another, maybe you want to argue that it's better to keep the asteroid as far away from uh, uh, any of these spikes or from Earth uh, as possible. Or maybe you find a spike that has a convenient um, distance uh, for the close approach, and you want to use that for a future characterization. And so there could be a number of different ways you go with this. But either way, you want to just nudge the asteroid on the B-plane. And you could do that um, with a gravity tractor in a very precise way and in a safe way. Next slide. Now, of course, there is conflict between restraint and active management. Um, but arguably, we need to at least have some practice in tractoring the event uh, tractoring in the event of an impact emergency. Uh, next slide. This is my final slide. Now, a reusable gravity tractor for that type of precision work might not be far away. So SpaceX is testing its Starship, which will be a totally reusable spacecraft if works as planned. And they are already planning on having five variants. There could be more. The Starship PD, Planetary Defense, such a situation could really change the way we think about planetary defense, but just like showing restraint, we would likely want to have an international decision-making regime to carry it out in a responsible way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, for those who are following the story of what's gonna happen with Anne-Sophie's Martin presentation, so she confirmed that she is unable to connect a uh, problem of internet apparently. So uh, thanks to uh, Peter and the ESA team, we will launch um, her video, if that's okay. Uh, we would prefer to launch it now rather than after, because this is the kind of the last legal presentation before we jump into uh, more of the policy uh, presentations with Detlef and, and Gerhardt. So the presentation from Anne-Sophie Martin, uh, she's a postdoctoral research fellow at Sapienza University of Rome, and her presentation is on reacting to near-Earth object impact, exceptional circumstances, justifying non-compliance with international law. Here we go. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. First, I would like to thank the session chair for giving me the opportunity to talk about the exceptional circumstances justifying non compliance with international law in case of near Earth object impact. 
In the introduction, uh, I would like to say that first, the neighbor's objects are less predictable and pose much greater harm than falling space debris, for example. And it is not impossible to control outer space and deep space and to monitor all potential asteroid and comet threats. In case of a near Earth object threat, each state has the right and obligation to try to protect its territory and its population, but there is no obligation under international law to assist other states, because states maintain territorial sovereignty and jurisdictions over their territory and the population living there. And lastly, there is a duty of, of non-intervention in internal affairs of other states. I would like now to uh, underscore some relevant provisions under space law and international uh, law that could be relevant for um, in case of planetary defense uh, methods. First, Article 3, 6 and 7 of the Outer Space Treaty. Article uh, 9, um, which um, the, the fact that states shall conduct their activity in outer space with due regard to the corresponding interest of all the states, and Article 10 and 11 about uh, international cooperation, um, observation of the flight of space objects, and also uh, you should consider near Earth object uh, trajectory, um, uh, Article 11 about information and data sharing about space objects, and so maybe. Um, uh, we should consider, also consider nearest object. And uh, principle 10 of the UN principles on uh, remote sensing. Under international law, um, I'd like to mention the precautionary principle, uh, the principle 18 of the Rio Declaration, and the article 9 of the International Law Commission in its articles on the protection of person in the event of a disaster. Uh, which provide an obligation on states to take the necessary and appropriate measures to prevent harm from independent uh, disasters. Under international law, states' responsibility results in a violation of international law, and such a violation um, leads to the international responsibility of the state that has breached that norm. Um, Article 2 of the 2001 Articles on Responsibility of States for Internationally Wrongful Act define an internationally wrongful act as a conduct consisting of an action or an omission that is attributable to the states under international law and constitutes a breach of an international obligation of the state. The consequences of um, the breach of a breach of international norms um, at the following. Uh, the state remain under the obligation to face the wrongful conduct and to assure non-reiteration and um, is so requested uh, to make a reparation. But it exists some, uh, some circumstances where the wrongfulness is excluded uh, in the use of a planetary defense method. Uh, three are cases, uh, the consent, distress and necessity. In case of consent, um, the wrongfulness of a particular act that is not in conformity with international law is excluded. If a state or um, various states, maybe all states, um, have to give this, uh, their consent. Uh, in case of third states which have not consented to the planetary defense missions, the wrongfulness is not uh, excluded. Um, the possibility um, for expressing broad consent to a particularly um, a particular planetary defense mission uh, would be uh, a UN General Assembly uh, resolution or from the uh, Security Council's resolution reflecting broad consent to a specific planetary defense mission on a case-by-case -case basis. In case of uh, distress, um, the, the wrongfulness of an act of a state not in conformity with international obligation is precluded if the author of the act in question has no other reasonable way in a situation of distress of saving the author's life of the, or the lives of other persons entrusted 
to the author's uh, care. Uh, so the planetary defense method has to be justified if there is no other reasonable way of saving lives and must not endanger the population uh, and put the territory of other states at risk. Uh, the principle of uh, necessity. Um, necessity can only excuse conduct, which is the only way for the state to safeguard a national interest against a grave and imminent peril, and which does not seriously impair an essential interest of the states or states toward which the obligation exists or of the international community as a whole. So the threat has to be objectively and clearly established, not just speculated. Um, and the action uh, undertaken uh, is the only way to safeguard the, the interest uh, of the states. But uh, in practice, um, some circumstances uh, can be changed, for example, orbit trajectory, rotational dynamics may avoid, uh, that may avoid the potential impact without that other measures are necessary to conduct. And um, today we can say, we can observe also that technological development uh, will also allow to anticipate near subject threats and to obtain accurate data, avoiding uh, planetary defense uh, methods. The response uh, is that um, it is possible that some acknowledge about uh, previously unknown facts or the reconsideration of existing, existing facts um, may uh, poss make possible to avoid planetary defense uh, methods. But it is difficult to undertake a comprehensive evaluation if the specific condition for um, invoking circumstances pregnant wrongfulness are, are present. So as soon as the invoked circumstance, the threat ceases to exist, states are, are obliged to return to lawful uh, conduct. Uh, in case um, of disputes between states with regard to the conduct of planetary defense methods, um, the dispute is to be settled by peaceful means. So through mediation, negotiation, arbitration, or by judicial uh, settlement of, by the International Court of Justice. Also, the Security Council or General Assembly um, can make some uh, recommendations about uh, appropriate uh, procedures. So to conclude, any planetary defense action affecting the territory and population under the jurisdiction of another state could be contrary to international unless the action is justified by a circumstance precluding wrongfulness or authorized by resolution of the UN um, Security Council, um, obviously with time limited and under uh, specific circumstances. Um, second point, there is a duty of states under international law to mitigate disasters related to, knee, to a near Earth object impact and to inform about a potential uh, impact threat uh, the international community. And uh, lastly, um, the international community should uh, establish a guideline code of conduct containing um, some principle about international cooperation, obligations under international law, duty to inform, exceptions to comply with international law, and dispute settlements mechanisms um, that could apply in case of planetary defense methods and um, should be widely distributed to the governments, space agencies, and the industries. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you to Anne-Sophie Martin for her presentation. And our next presentation is by our very own Detlef Koshny, who is the acting head of the Planetary Defense Office at ESA, and he will be presenting on ESA's activities in planetary defense. Detlef, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alisa. So we're going a bit back into the more technical stuff because that's uh, what we're currently working on. If you could give me the next slide, please, Peter. So just a summary of what we are doing at the European Space Agency. You have hopefully heard all the detailed presentations of my colleagues already. If you go back to this conference in a few months from now and want to have an overview, you can start here. 
Our official mission statement in our space safety program is the protection of our planet, humanity and assets in space and on Earth from dangers originating in space. And the Planetary Defense Office is part of our space safety program, so this is applicable to us. In a bit simpler English and really dedicated to the work we are doing in the Planetary Defense Office, we are required to be aware of the situation of natural objects in space, predict possible impacts, their consequences, inform relevant parties, and to prepare for risk mitigation. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought it might be useful for you to get the context. So where is the Planetary Defense Office within the European Space Agency? While you hopefully heard the video message of our Director General, Josef Aschbacher, he is on the top. On the next level, we have something called directorates and uh, our Planetary Defense Office is in the Directorate of Oper Operations and there we have something called Space Safety Office. So space safety is of course much more than what we are doing. It includes space weather activities and space debris activities. We have a bit of special setup. Of course, the HERA mission is a very relevant contribution of ESA to planetary defense for historical reasons and technical reasons. That's in another directorate, but the dashed line is indicating and the fact that I put the planetary defense office box right next to the HERA boxes that of course we're talking a lot to each other. In fact, uh, Richard Meusel, who, is, who was taking care of our uh contribution to the impact scenario to the exercise he spends half of his time supporting Hera so we are very really closely working together next slide we divide our work in three pillars we have heard over the conference we need to find these objects be before they find us I quote Don Yeomans here that's the first pillar observations then we need to compute the orbits and provide the data to the community. That's done in our information provision pillar. And last not least, we have mitigation, talking to the emergency response agencies within the legal constraints that we've heard in the beginning of the sessions. And all three pillars stand on a common foundation, which we call ground and data systems like Giampiero's presentation uh, about how we actually maintain software and things like that. That's not something where we have the expertise in our own office, but we get support actually across the space safety program of a different group in ESA. Next slide, please. I uh, added the names to it just for your reference. I'm not going to read them all, but if you want to find out, okay, I heard this presentation of this guy, where is he actually located? Is he part of the Planetary Defense Office? We call us the Planetary Defense Team and are organized in the Planetary Defense Office. Next slide, please. Let's go through, uh, before we go through the three different pillars, just something nice photographs of our new building. We actually have uh, something called the Building 18 at Esrin, which is in Frascati, close to Rome. So we have just a newly refurbished building. It's just a small building, 150 square meters. Most of our team will be located there once they let us back on site. Next slide. Observations. Here you see some of the assets we are working with. We have our own telescopes, like the optical ground station on the lower right. Uh, you heard Luca mentioning the testbed telescope, where just when Luca gave his presentation on Tuesday, uh, we had a press release out together with the European Southern Observatory. We now have a dedicated, relatively small telescope in La Silla in South America. Next slide. And I do this now that always I have a slide with some pictures and then on the next slide for your reference, you find a link to the presentations that you can find somewhere else in the program. So go ahead to the next slide. We don't need to read this here now. This is for your reference. With information provision, we cover really everything from producing the information to generating, sorry, to distributing it. 
We have a sense of few months, our own independent orbit determination and impact monitoring software, which is, of course, based a lot on the work of the company Space Dice, uh, linked to the University of Pisa. And uh, but it's it's our own software now, and it's independent from the old Neodice system. So we can proudly say, okay, we have an, a real uh, our own activities here. We distribute the information via a web portal, uh, which also just was really updated to the latest shiny visual corporate identity rules of the European Space Agency. And of course, there are many tools and little scripts, notification systems out there. Next slide, please. Uh, there you find some references again to presentations. Uh, I mentioned we are working really closely in the orbit determination part with NeoDice, with the NeoDice team. So I think it's worth to also look at uh, Fabrizio's presentation about the new tools they uh, developed also under European Union funding. Next slide, please. Mitigation, well, this is what we discussed at length also in the exercise. Uh, you heard or saw that the JPL colleagues were kind enough to have the final impact location just above my house in the Bavarian forest. My family was not very happy about that, uh, but okay, luckily I'm in the Netherlands right now, so nothing happened. Uh, more seriously, we have developed methods and formats to communicate with emergency response agencies. We have just done an end-to-end -end exercise with uh, the Germans, and of course, this all is linked to the international process, which uh, mentions same page, same page, and I one. Next slide shows you a summary of the activities we are doing there and go one further, which should be actually the end of the presentation. I say thank you very much for your attention and uh, hand over to the next or back to Alisa actually. Thank you very much, Detlev. And you were perfectly on time. Uh, well, we come then to our final presentation for this session by Gerhard Drolschagen, who is a senior expert at the University of Oldenburg, and he will present on the scope, objective, and first results of the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. Gerhard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alisa. I will try to stay on time as well. So you heard about same page uh, on several occasions uh, of this PDC. And I will give some additional information and also about the scope objectives and some first results of the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. And I'm giving this presentation uh, on behalf of the whole same page group, but listed here are three uh, co-authors. So first myself as present and outgoing chair of same page, then Romana Kofler, representing uh, UN USA as secretary of same page, and Detlef Koshny as a new chair. Next slide, please. The United Nations formed the Action Team 14 to address neo mitigation issues. And they recommended the formation of two groups, I1 and Same Page. And the formation of Same Page and also I1 was endorsed by the United Nations in 2013. And then in the year later, same page was officially established. And in blue here, the main purpose is listed. So the purpose of the same page is to prepare for an international response to a neo impact threat through the exchange of information, development of options for collaborative research and mission opportunities, and neo threat mitigation planning activities. Next slide. The same page is an international technical scientific group with some political touch. And same page is an advisory group, as the title and the name already say. So it should present options for near mitigation missions to decision makers, but has no decision power itself. Membership is open to international space agencies or other governmental or intergovernmental space entities who can contribute to planetary defense space missions. Same page works by consensus and all costs, for example, for studies, simulations and meetings uh, have to be covered by the members. 
Next slide, please. So at present, same page has 19 official members and six permanent observers. ESA is presently chair of same page. UN USA is the secretariat to same page. Same page has established a work plan comprising 11 items and same page typically meets twice per year. And also once per year, same page reports annually to the STSC of UN COPOS. So the last meeting of same page took place uh, in March. And last week, same page like I1 reported to the STSC of UN COPOS on what they did during the last year. Next slide, please. Here's a brief overview of the present 19 members and also of the six permanent observers. So additional and new members are welcome. I mean, the Brazilian Space Agency has already announced their intent to join same page and others have indicated interest as well. If you want to uh, join same page, you should send a letter of application and this will be, then be considered by the next same page meeting and uh, consensus is needed by all existing members to accept a new member. So it's a little bit of formal process and more details can be obtained from the same page chair or from the secretary. Next slide, please. So a list of 11 initial activities has been identified by same page and these activities and their status are described in a work plan. This is a living document, so activities could be modified, edit, or combined. And I'll just give two examples here. First, the criteria and thresholds for impact threat responses have been agreed jointly with I1. And uh, so it just defines when should same page actually get into action. And the second one is a study of the nuclear device option. We learned also from these legal discussions that is a bit a sensitive issue. And uh, therefore, it was agreed at this work activity to collect publicly available reports and articles on the subject. And this will be complemented by some introductory and background information. Next slide, please. Here are the agreed criteria and thresholds jointly agreed by I1. First one, issue warnings if an object has an impact probability larger than 1%, and a diameter of roughly larger than 10 meters. Second one, to prepare for civil protection measures if an object has an impact probability larger than 10% within 20 years and is roughly larger than 20 meter in diameter. And finally, same page should get into action. So start to assess space mission options if an object has an impact probability larger than 1% within 50 years and is larger than roughly 50 meters in diameter. So for the hypothetical object uh, 2021 PDC, all three of these conditions are fulfilled. Therefore, each one of those activities was executed. Next slide. Also, we same page issued some recommendations like to perform a demonstration of an asteroid deflection mission and that HERA is now ongoing. Also, one recommendation just issued at the last meeting, uh, perform small class high velocity flyby missions to small bodies like Comet Interceptor of ESA or Destiny Plus of JAXA. Both of these missions are in preparation. And a joint same page I1 UN USA brochure was produced. It is available at this given website unusa.org and several presentations and publications uh, have been made. And just see the website samepage.net for reports and presentations of the meetings. Next slide. And an ad hoc working group on legal issues, in short, same page legal working group, was officially established during the seventh same page meeting in October 2016. And this legal working group made a major effort to review and assess existing space laws relevant for planetary defense. And a report of the legal working group entitled Planetary Defense Legal Overview and Assessment has been produced and delivered to same page. This is also available at samepage.net. And on the second day of this PDC conference, we had a nice session on legal issues. 
Next slide. It is also discussed to perform a same page exercise. This would be something new. And this would assess space mission options for a threatening object with the aim to, for example, practice and test the working procedure of same page. Assess the status of available knowledge and tools for planetary defense missions. Practice the coordination and flow of information between participants. Prepare an output format of the assessment results and advice for decision makers. And as, re as a realistic case, a virtual impactor from an existing object in the risk list could be used for the exercise. We want to be really realistic, but it will be a paper exercise. And a preparatory workshop is planned during the summer to assess the effort, feasibility, requirements, format, etc., for such an exercise. So it might be undertaken now in the future. Next and last slide. Thank you for your attention. So what you see here is a picture of the deep impact space mission from NASA hitting Comet Temple 1 in 2005. That was not uh, an intention to deflect the object, but it was an impact on a comet, on a large comet. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Gerach, and you are also perfectly on time. But between the, the videos and the little check-ins from me, we ran a tiny bit late. So instead of having a 20 to 15 minute session Q&A, we'll have a 10 minute uh, Q&A session. So if you have questions, this is a great time to put them in the chat. Thankfully, a lot of you have had fantastic conversation already in the chat. And I have uh, picked questions from the chat that, I've, uh, that I'm ready to ask to our presenters. So first up is Christoph. We have a question which lists would a similar article by article breakdown of the applicability of resulting obligations be possible for the here relevant treaties in particular in particular those related to NEDs in an urgent emergency use like this conference's exercise scenario thank you for your question but unfortunately i don't understand it uh, uh... The article by article breakdown of uh, uh, applicable uh, obligations resulting from uh, space law treaties or uh, another uh, international treaties uh, is possible. I, I can do it, uh, but uh, I don't understand the last part of the question. Sorry. I think the meaning was that could this article by article breakdown that you did in your own presentation be applied uh, to the articles of treaties that relate to NEDs? Because we are in the situation where we would need to send uh, potentially an NED and uh, and could a breakdown of those articles about uh, the use of nuclear devices in space be applicable to enable the use of NEDs? Yes, uh, I think that it is possible to apply that uh, train of thought which I presented in my presentation. Uh, it's, in my opinion, applicable to uh, all breaches and threats to international peace and security. Uh, the question remains of the scale uh, of the threat and the grievance of it, but I think it's applicable. Thank you. Uh, and I will invite uh, Timo Grimman, who was the author of this question. If I misrepresented uh, and misrephrased uh, your question, feel free to put it back in the chat and, and so that Christoph can, can see it directly. And uh, now, next up, we have a question for Luciano, which states, um, first, he thanks you for your presentation and says that it's a very promising approach, especially uh, the the notion of the Good Samaritan principle that your presentation talks about, but are there risks of creating a slippery slide towards abuse? What do you think? Um, thank you. Thanks for, for your question. I'm not a strong ad advocate for imposing an uh, obligation to act based on international law. So my, my idea is to protect states that act in good faith create um, a legal protection for possible claims. So I, I, I'm not sure that it will be, it, it will create um, new obligation. The goal is to not create more obligations, but to protect this state directing good faith. That makes sense. 
Well, uh, I did not have direct question, I think, for my own presentation, but I would like to recognize a long discussion that was happening in the chat about mythology and uh, the use of tales and the connection from that to anthropology. So thank you, Anya, Heinz, and all who participate in that conversation. I think I noticed also another question, which I'm guessing uh, will is towards Gerhard and Detlef. So either one of you, if you're interested in that question, how would the UN or maybe Romana, how would the UN define the term imminent with respect to an asteroid impact? Considering a scenario where it was determined that five years from now there was going to be an impact with 100% certainty, but the impact was confined to a single nation state. If the UN refused to approve a deflection disruption effort, would the nation state be capable or justified in unilateral launching mission to the impactor? Actually, it looked like an international question, but that's also very much a legal question. So if any of our presenters uh, who presented on space law today would like to tackle this question, feel free to, to take the floor. Well, okay, let, let me just say, Imminent, if you just look on, 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 say, Google, what it means, it means about to occur impending. So to me, it always means it's, it's close. Huh? Uh, from a more technical point of view, I would consider something imminent if the object is on what we call the final plunge. So we, we don't have another orbit around the sun or something. If the question goes more, how would the UN define that? That's more something for Romana or indeed the legal experts. Yes, if you I wish. Could, I could briefly add to this before Romana gets into it. So same page would get into action because it's within 50 years and there is no short time distinction. They would look what are technical options for whatever time is left. And then someone would have to take the decision. Maybe that's something Romana can address. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so basically where we are now is that we have um, information flow enabled from same page and i1 to the 95 member states of the committee on the peaceful uses of outer space as we have discussed on day one at the panel the next step when we first heard of this hypothetical um asteroid impact scenario the question would be who would be the final decision maker now obviously and uh, we have a lot of uh, legal people here great discussion uh, under the um, um charter of the un in case there is a, a threat to international peace and security, is the Security Council who would take up this imminent threat and discuss and, and take uh, the final decision making. But for now, uh, in, in the case of um, uh, an asteroid impact hazard, what is important is that we have two entities that are by now recognized global entities that report to COPOS member states, uh, and that we have this transparency um enabled so that the member states would be duly informed and then the process would go further but we do not discuss at the moment at the committee the decision making aspects of all this thank you that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your for your input. Uh, additionally, I appreciated uh, Romana uh, highlighting that it was um, a hazard and not a threat. And as you know, in anthropology or any social sciences, words matter. And so the definition of threat and hazard is is clearly stated within UN USA, but also when you look uh, at the websites of the various planetary defense offices. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Aaron Bolly in because he's making a very interesting point in the chat on national self-defense and and how to use and not use that notion to respond to a question that was in the chat. So if uh, if Aaron, you could uh, you could shine the light on when you were just explaining in the chat. Oh, well, it's just that you know, there's nothing that fundamentally precludes a nation from acting unilaterally. Uh, we have, you know, information sharing. Uh, we, we try to have a cooperative regime, but uh, a nation state that wants to launch something can do that. Um, presumably a non-state actor who wants to launch something has to go through the uh, national regulation in order to do so. Uh, but, you know, if it gets through there, then they could also do it. So, uh, you know, there's no necessarily, the, the point was that there's no reason to invoke necessarily self-defense because you're not violating something to uh, invoke an exception for. And so that's, that's been um, discussed in the, I, I think in the, the, um, 
the same page legal analysis uh, the subcommittee. So that I was just referring to that particular uh, point. I do not want to put you on the spot, but I know from the chat and previous uh, chat discussions in the during the week that a lot of uh, of participants are wondering what would actually happen with again this notion of a rogue nation, but more precisely a rogue company uh, who would play the maybe cowboy in some ways. We know legally speaking that uh, there are laws about this, but what do you think would happen if tomorrow an asteroid were to uh, to become threatening and a company were to say we are sending something? Uh, yeah, so if, for example, SpaceX decides to rapidly disassemble one of its uh, starships and just send something there to slam into the asteroid, um, you know, uh, as as a working example, um, you know, they would they would have to have a, a launch license, and uh, there could be a petition process. There would be a petition process that would be part of that, and so there could be an attempt there to to fundamentally you know stop that type of process. Uh, if we um, and and hopefully something like that could in fact happen. I mean, there was you know uh, a a bit of an uh, an issue with the with planetary protection concerns with the Tesla launch, for example, but it was mainly uh, a lack of clarity of what that orbit would be. SpaceX fundamentally um, adhered to planetary protection as you know uh, prescribed by the law. So there was an attempt to stop it there, but you know they they couldn't. Um, uh, but the um, you know, for this particular situation, there might hopefully be some stronger pushback to say, just just wait a second. Um, but I, I'm not sure how it would actually play out. Uh, the the satellite, like if we're looking at satellites, for example, and you know that's currently being regulated by companies pointing figures at each other. You know, the, so it's a petition process again, mainly with the FCC, uh, and and that's you know not going well for the sustainable development of space. And we're going to get started with uh, our first presentation, teaming up for asteroid deflection uh, with Nahum Melamed, uh, Monica Maynard, and Melissa McGinley. Go ahead, Nahum and colleagues. Hi, um, I'm Leanne McGinley with the Aerospace Corporation, and joining me today are Nahum Melamed and Monica Maynard, my colleagues. And I represent the corporate social responsibility team here at Aerospace. And one of our main pillars of our CSR program is our K through 12 STEM outreach to um, underserved and underrepresented communities, targeting students to pursue a STEM degree. To help us accomplish this goal, the K through 12 STEM outreach team works together with our scientists and engineers to find ways to engage and excite students and educators. Our team today will share more about a STEM outreach resource with you called the Near Earth Object or NEO Deflection App, which we use in support of our corporation's efforts to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. We hope you'd like to try it out too. Um, so we're going to go to our next slide here, please. And this is just an image of our corporate social responsibility team where we are out in the community and, and just pointing you to a video if you'd like to learn more about that. And on to our next slide. Um, at Aerospace, we know that talent doesn't discriminate and tomorrow's leaders will come from every neighborhood and background. Aerospace will need diversity in our company to remain the most innovative and creative leader in space. Mission success for aerospace means making sure no students are left behind and that everyone is given a chance to flourish and pursue a STEM career. In other words, Aerospace wants to create a place in space for all students, no matter their background. And one way we are working to accomplish this is by taking the work that Aerospace is known for and creating engaging resources. And next up, Nahum will introduce you to the Neo Deflection app and share more with you about how we are inspiring the next generation of scientists and engineers with this app. Nahum, over to you to take it away. You can move on to the next slide. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, the main tool used in our STEM workshops is a physics-based web app developed in collaboration between uh, NASA's JPL and the Aerospace Corporation. The NDA applies orbital mechanics and launch vehicle performance to approximate 
neo deflection missions by high velocity kinetic impact spacecraft. Uh, next slide, please. To further introduce collaborative teaming dimension to the neo deflection app, Aerospace added capability to conduct asteroid deflection contests. Several participants are grouped into teams and are giving an increasingly challenging hypothetical asteroid collision scenario to solve. The team with the highest performance metric wins the competition. Aerospace has run nine virtual and in-person asteroid deflection workshop, workshops for teachers, students, and the public to date. Next is more info on our STEM program and workshops by Monica Maynard. Monica, the floor is yours. Next slide, please. Thank you, Nahum. By providing tools to engage in uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM education, the goal is to motivate the students not only to be informed citizens, but potentially select a STEM field as their career choice. STEM education seeks to build competencies necessary to succeed in a global economy as it prepares our youth to work together to address global challenges by employing critical thinking skills, creativity, collaboration, and problem, problem solving. Additionally, STEM education not only promotes 21st century skills, but it also reinforces behavioral competencies that require perseverance, cooperation, organization, and adaptability to succeed. Next slide, please. The Teaming Neo Deflection app has been deployed in in-person events as well as in virtual platforms. The app is fully supported and accessible via both formats, in-person and virtual. The benefit of the virtual events is that it can run across regions and more students can be reached. Moreover, because the, the teaming NDA is accessible to all, it works well for in-person events that can be run post-pandemic in the classrooms. Over the, uh, over the past few years, the Aerospace Corporation has run nine workshops for teachers and the public. Three of the workshops were in-person and six were, in, uh, were virtual. Now, about 90% of the participants in our workshops, both teachers and students, have expressed that their experience with the teaming app was excellent and have indicated that they would participate in a future workshop. Future work using the teaming app includes continuing to offer outreach events on a quarterly basis, teacher training on how to run sessions to increase student usage of the app is critical as teachers have greater access to students in our target areas. The developed program strives to bridge the ethnic, gender, and socioeconomic gaps that exist in our educational system by providing these events free of charge for participants and highlighting that diversity breeds success. Aerospace is partnering with other nonprofit organizations to deliver the programming to a wider, wider field on specific occasions such as Asteroid Day and during Engineers Week and creating an online request for education groups that would like a classroom experience. Furthermore, Aerospace has created lessons that furnish activities to educators to use in the classrooms in tandem with the teaming app. And I just want to, lastly, I just want to say that um, on May 4th, we will be running one of these workshops uh, with the public. So we invite all of you to participate in, in our in a game on activity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julian and Monica. And uh, we are uh, done with the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Lena, over to you. All right. I forgot I was muted, Nahum. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you, you were more than on time. You were done in uh, seven minutes. So thank you so much. That was very interesting. Next up is um, a brother and sister team, Artash and Arushi Nath, uh, aiming for a purpose. How we use uh, COVID-19 school lockdown is an opportunity to do asteroid astronomy and teach others. Go ahead, Artash and Arushi. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Arushi, and I'm in grade six. Hi, everyone. I'm Artash. I'm from grade nine, and we're from Toronto. Today, we're going to be talking to you about our journey imaging Apophis. Next slide, please. 
So how did we first learn about Apophis? Well, it all started in 2019 when I attended my first planetary defense conference in Maryland. And there I had the opportunity to give a poster presentation about one of my projects. And even better, I got to listen to a ton of presenters talk about various interesting topics about asteroids, like mapping and characterizing them. And while I was not able to attend the conference, my bro brother brought back 3D printed models of the asteroid Apophis, and I got really interested in them and started to learn as much as I could about asteroids. I even attended and participated in an international asteroid search campaign where I had to search for asteroids in many different images. Next slide, please. So this year has been different because of the COVID-19 pandemic, so our schools have turned online. This meant that we had much more free time to pursue our passions, and we ended up making several projects related to robotics and science. So aiming for Apophis and imaging it seemed like a great project to do next. Next slide, please. So first I had to take the picture of Apophis. To do so, I couldn't just use my whole eight inch telescope because at that time, Apophis had a magnitude of 20. That meant that my, my um, telescope's aperture was too small. So I had to search for many robotic telescopes. I searched for many of them from places like SLU and iTelescope, searching for the best criteria. I finally came across the Fox Telescope South from the Las Cumbres Observatory. And this telescope was um, located in Sang Springs from Australia. So this telescope met all the criteria. It had a big aperture of two meters and it was an ideal spot for imaging Apophis. Next slide, please. So before I could actually um, image it, I needed to tell the telescope how to image it. To do so, I needed to tell it, for example, where to image it. And to do so, I used help of many websites. For example, the NASA Horizons web interface, where I found a live red section and definition coordinates of the asteroid and telescopius, where you could find the transit time of the asteroid to know the best time to observe it. Next slide, please. So I was able to um, take the image. So, but when I opened it, I saw a black screen, not what I would have expected, like many white objects, signaling objects like stars or whatever. So I was like, did I take the wrong exposure time or whatever? But I found out it was nothing to do with that. I had to scale my image. What scaling does is it makes sure I can see the bright and dimmer objects. I did this using the DS9 SAW image software. Next slide, please. So now I had the great image. So to make sure I took the image in the right spot, I, oh, I used a worldwide telescope where I could basically insert this image into the sky and see if it was taken at the right spot. It also helped me see if the image had been rotated or flipped. Next slide, please. So now it was time to actually find the asteroid. To do so, I decided to remove all the fixed objects, so the stars, because I knew Apophis could not be one of them. To do so, I used the Astrometrica, Astrometrica software and the star catalog USNOP1. Next slide, please. But there were still many different objects left. So how would I know which one of them were Apophis? And those objects would have been like comets or different asteroids or even new stars. So to find Apophis among them, I used the Minor Plan Center database, which estimated the coordinates of known asteroids like Apophis. So using that, I was able to find the asteroid in the image, as you can see right on the slide. Next slide, please. So I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to calculate the proper motion of Apophis. So to do so, I took two images of this asteroid, in my case, a day apart. Then I found the exact right ascension and definition coordinates of the asteroid in both images. Next slide, please. So, but the problem was, it was a bit difficult to calculate the change in right ascension and declination, because the change in right ascension is not constant based on if you're nearer to the poles or nearer to the equator. With that meant that I needed to use the declination as well to find the right ascension. And 
after applying a simple Pythagorean theorem, I found out that the actual moved 0.011268 arc seconds every second. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to replicate the same steps that Arushi did to find the asteroid, but in Python, to open up more room for different types of analysis. Next slide, please. The first step inside my code was to load up the libraries I would be using for my program, which includes AstroPy, an astronomy library. Then, I opened the FITS files containing the asteroid imagery data. Next slide, please. When I first opened up the images, just like Arushi, I was came up with a black screen with almost no stars on it. So I created a function that calculated the mean pixel value of the image, and then used the image's standard deviation to correct the image to a range in which I could see the dimmer and brighter objects in the image. Next slide, please. Now that I had a scaled image where I could see the stars, I created a centroiding program, which went through the image and then put centroids around each of the bright objects into the image. Once I had that, I needed to be able to correlate the pixels inside my CCD frame to act to the celestial view in the sky. And I needed to, for that, I needed to know where exactly in the sky was this image taken and what, how much arc seconds did each pixel in the image represent. Luckily, all that information was available in the FITS files header. So I used Python to query the FITS file for that information. Next slide, please. Then I need to understand which object inside my images were stars so that I could locate the asteroid. And for that, I loaded in the USNO star catalog and overlaid the stars from the catalog onto my CCD image. Next slide, please. Then, even though I had the right place in the sky and the right size, the orientation of the telescope could still be different from the stars in the catalog. So I created another function that slowly rotated the image in increments of one degree until it found the perfect match between the USNO catalog stars and the bright objects inside my image. One Next minute, slide, please. Next slide, please. Then I was able to subtract the stars from the catalog on my image, and then what was left was the possible asteroid candidate shown in the image. Next slide, please. Like with all our projects, we have been presenting this at several different conferences and venues, like the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Global Innovation Field Trip, and even at our local schools to inspire the next generation. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present our project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Artash and Arushi. I'm, I'm certain, absolutely certain that you two will be famous someday. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Juan Cano with ESA, and he will be talking about evaluation of a neo-close approach frequency index for public and media release purposes. Go ahead, Juan. Thank you, Linda. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thanks. Thanks. First of all, congratulations to Artash and Darushia. Guys, you have done a fantastic job. Um, so on my side, our presentation is going to be focusing on communication aspects. And uh, I'd like to start by uh, recognizing the labor of my colleagues in the in this uh, uh, work, and particularly Gianmarco Valletta, who's done a fantastic uh, work in this, in this activity. Next slide, please. So, uh, first slide that I want to show is related to a, a kind of collage of, of news about close approaches. I'm, I'm completely sure that you have faced it in many occasions um, uh, this type of news where you've seen that uh, the, uh, any communication media has hyped on, on close approaches and actually um, has uh, put, in, in many cases, information that is right, but also leaving, leaving a lot of space for um, lucubration and uh, so not giving full information on the close approaches. So we wanted to make with this uh, work um, uh, uh, something to help the media to uh, understand where, uh, in relative terms what would be the importance of, of a given close approach. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, what we were looking at is uh, uh, on something that had been already used in the past. So when we start think, started thinking on this, we realized that there was something that we could already extend uh, its use, and it was the concept of the impact, impact frequency. So uh, this, this uh, aspect has been already discussed in the last 50 years a lot, 
And we have a very good models now of, of the impact frequency of asteroids of different sizes and with the air. So why not extend in such concept to the close approaches such that we could reach and we could uh, get to an index that we could use to actually uh, relate the, uh, the, the close approaches. If we go to the next slide, then this is, uh, as I was commenting, this is something that has been already presented many times. Uh, I've just taken here uh, the last uh, uh, nice uh, uh, diagram from Alan, Alan Harris from PDC 2019, where you see this uh, very much already uh, seen plot of, of the um, uh, population uh, uh, distribution model for, for NEOs. And uh, you see directly the direct relation between the number of objects and the impact uh, uh, frequency interval you, that you can see on the right side of the diagram. And this is direct, uh, for a given population of NEOs, this is a direct relation to the number of, of, uh, of objects, uh, which I have, for example, put here with this K constant between the number of asteroids of NEOs and the, the impact frequency with Earth that we have called here F0. If we go to the next slide, please. So what, what we can, what we have done uh, as a next step is to actually, uh, as I was mentioning before, use this for close approaches. So, uh, and what's, uh, what's coming feared is uh, simply the fact that uh, when a close approach happens, um, there is the, um, it confronts the earth and increasing the number of, of close approaches um, uh, is squares with the, uh, it it's, uh, has a, law, a square law. And this is what we have uh, put in this for, for first formula here, where you see that uh, the uh, impact parameter is the, the key factor here to take into account. If we develop that, that uh, impact uh, parameter into uh, the two uh, other parameters that affect its computation, which are the uh, actual close approach distance D and the uh, infinite uh, velocity B infinity, we can arrive to the formula that it's uh, below, uh, where we have already a frequency of the close approaches as a function of the number of uh, objects in the population, the distance to the Earth at the close approach, and the, the infinity in the close, uh, close approach with Earth. Next slide, please. So the, the other part of the model that we needed to, uh, to actually put forward is the actual population model. And for this, we, used, uh, we made use of the Grandke model, which um, models the, the population distribution up to an absolute magnitude of 25. Uh, we extended that by uh, taking the slope at the last part of this model up to 28.5. And above that value of absolute magnitude, we tried to feed the, the model from uh, Brown uh, to, uh, to actually model the, uh, the impact probability of a small, very small objects. So this is the last uh, uh, equation that you see there in the slide. If, we, uh, if you move to the next slide, please. So this is the, the resulting uh, model that you see in the left uh, image, where you see that uh, the first part that until age 25 is the grand model, then this linear log uh, extrapolation, and finally the, the second uh, extrapolation above age 20.5 to adapt it to the Brown model. And you can see the, the comparison with, the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with these models in the, in the right uh, diagram. Next slide, please. Last element in, the, in our uh, model for this computation of this index was the K parameter. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the last 40, 50 years on the value of this impact parameter and starting with, uh, with Shoemaker. Uh, and we, are, we centered our discussion in the last two ones in this list, uh, one computed by NASA in a document uh, in 2017 and another one that we computed with the uh, NEO population tool from ESA Neopop. And we were, uh, in our case, uh, simulating uh, 7 million uh, asteroids uh, propagated in 10 years. And we were arriving to a very similar number figure. Uh, in the end, we decided to take the uh, 1.66 uh, time, times 10 to the minus 9 impacts per year figure uh, because it was obtained from through a, a much longer simulation period. Next slide, please. So putting all these elements together, we already had this function fully defined, this FCA, the, the, fun, the frequency of the close approach. And we decided to, to, to have uh, manageable numbers to, to take the decimal logarithm and to arrive to this, what we have called the close approach index, CIA. And uh, um, if this value uh, is above uh, one, uh, then we would have a, freq uh, a, a close approach frequency, which uh, would be larger than once per, per month. So this would be a very frequent event. In the case between zero and one, uh, we have a, a frequency larger than once per year, and this we would tag as a frequent event. 
with between minus one and zero, this would be a frequency larger than once per year, per 10 years, sorry. And so this would be an infrequent event. Between minus two and minus one, this would be um, a bit with a frequency larger than once uh, every 100 years. And this we would quote as a rare event. And in the cases where CIA would be uh, smaller than minus one, uh, then this would be a very, very rare, rare event. So this is actually the index that we are proposing. And if you go to the next slide, what we did is to um, actually take the close approaches list that we provide in the NEOCC close approaches page. And we took the, the recent ones, which are in the last month and the next ones in the next year. And we actually computed this uh, close approach frequency and uh, computed this index that I was referring to and actually obtained the ranking. Uh, uh, and, and as you we will see in the next page, please. One minute. Yes, thank you. You will see that we had uh, for the recent ones in the last month, we had 124 frequent, very frequent events, semi frequent events, one infrequent event, non rare or very rare. And for the upcoming in the next year, we had 129, 10 frequent, uh, five infrequent, and one rare event. If we pass to the next slide, we are providing here the values, uh, the object that we obtained. So we had FO32 where that had an infrequent event uh, one month ago. We had this. We have these other six objects in the next year that we will have either an infrequent event in most of the cases or a rare event in the case of 1994 PC1. And finally, we included in this list Apophis, uh, which it's a very interesting case for 2019. This very, very close approach with the Earth that it's, it's uh, ranking as minus 4.15, so a very rare event as expected. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, we're proposing to community to, to use an objective index to evaluate the relative importance of a given close approach. Such uh, index uh, has, is, is based on the current annual population models. Uh, it, as explained, it expands on the, on the concept of impact frequency by taking into account the distance to the Earth at the close approach, the velocity, and then of course the uh, age magnitude related to the annual population. And we have already applied that to the, to the close approaches list that we have. And we have found that for this next year, there will be five infrequent events and one rare event. And uh, of course, above office in 2029, which, is, uh, which will be a very rare event. Uh, finally, we are planning to include this evaluation index in our NEOCC uh, close approach page. And if you want to have more details, uh, let me tell you that we have written a full paper for this and it's already in the, in the web portal of the, of the conference. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Juan. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have uh, Smriti Srivastava online with us? Uh, yes. Hi, Linda. Oh, good. You are here. Thank you. Okay, you're ready to go. Yes. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Smriti Srivastava, and I'm the co-lead of Near Earth Object Project Group at Space Generation Advisory Council. In my role as a project group co-lead, I would like to provide you an overview of the role of SJAC in global planetary defense and outreach. Next slide, please. So SJAC is a non-governmental, non-profit organization whose objective is to represent university students and young space professionals to United Nations space agencies and academia. SJAC was born more than 20 years ago at Unispace 3, uh, where its objective came out to create um, a, a consultative mechanism within the COCUS committee. Uh, to represent the young people from all over the world. Now, SJAC is represented in all the six regions of the United Nations uh, with more than 15,000 members in more than 150 countries. Next slide, please. So, uh, what does SJAC does in terms of uh, global planetary defense and outreach activities? Um, so, this can be described through the main five pillars of SJAC. And these five pillars are discussed in the upcoming uh, next slides with link to uh, more detail on every single slide. Um, so, these are the uh, 10 project uh, groups at SGAC, which focus on uh, different, different topics in space techno technology um, uh, exploration and research, and NEO project group being one of them, which focuses on the planetary defense uh, and public outreach activities. Next slide, please. Uh, the Near uh, Earth Object Project Group is uh, dedicated to helping the worldwide planetary defense community to meet one of the nature's greatest challenges. Uh, it provides youth perspective to planetary defense through submitting annual reports, organizing and participating in competitions, and um, attending conferences, and of course, organizing the public outreach projects, which are specifically dedicated to raising awareness about planetary defense. Next slide, please. 
So now discussing about the main internal activities, the projects um, that uh, Neo Project Group organizes or participates uh, in. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the main um, campaign uh, activity, uh, campaign and activity that is organized by the Neo Project Group of SGAC is the Find an Asteroid campaign. Uh, this campaign is a collaboration between SGAC and International Astronomical Search Collaboration, where applicants are invited from all over the world with um, for um, where they receive telescopic images, which are only a few hours old, and they are analyzed for preliminary, provisional, and the final discoveries of asteroids. Next slide, please. Another important activity uh, is the Move an Asteroid um, competition, where we invite abstract and paper submissions from applicants all around the world on the topics related to planetary defense, exploration, new resource utilization, and how new resources and technologies can help the United Nations in um, attaining the sustainable development goals. Other topics are listed here. And um, the winners of this competition are provided scholarships to attend SGC and IAC every single year. Next slide, please. Another very exciting activity in which the SGAC team participated in 2020 was Mars City State Design Competition. It was a collaboration between the six different project groups of SGAC. There were 27 members joining from 19 different countries and 10 different time zones. And uh, SGAC made to the top finalists for their design. And the contribution of Neo Project Group came in terms of providing an insight into planetary defense and its technology and how, um, like, why they are required to be incorporated when we are designing a self-supporting city on Mars. So um, this was a very exciting competition, and uh, you can have a look at our uh, results and reports on the link mentioned at the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Now, shifting to a more artistic competition, um, Neo Renaissance was an initiative by the Neo Project Group members in the time of COVID-19 to help people express their creative ideas. So we uh, invited submissions in terms of the posters uh, from people in different space, science, and artistic backgrounds to submit their visual ideas on topics related to, of course, planetary defense, uh, new, new near Earth alternative destinations, and how asteroid impacts led to the extinction of uh, the dinosaurs. Uh, there were many. Um, um, amazing entries uh, that we received, and you can have a look at it on our Facebook and Twitter pages. You can also have a look at the winning entries that we received for this competition. Next slide, please. Now, um, in 2020, we collaborated with the IAF Neo Technical Committee to celebrate the International Asteroid Day, and uh, we also launched our first special edition newsletter, and uh, which featured our uh, featured an interview with the SGAC Neo PG uh, founder Alex Carl, who is also the chair of IF Neo Technical Committee. And um, we are specifically focused on raising awareness about planetary defense and how global cooperation and collaboration is required to, um, to raise awareness about uh, this global issue. Next slide, please. Another co collaboration with the IF Neo Technical Committee was um, during the AIAA LA Planetary Defense panel, um, where we again focused on strengthening the global efforts and the requirements of uh, international collaborations to uh, raise awareness about planetary defense. You can have a look at it on, on the YouTube channel on the link mentioned here. Next slide, please. Now, a new project group is uh, a regular participant in the international conferences like PDC, IAC, GLEX, and SGC. All of our work are specifically dedicated to planetary defense. How, um, what are the readiness level of asteroid mining industry, space resource utilization missions, and of course, the public outreach activities um, and the educational activities that specifically, that specifically support the goals of UNOSA. Next slide, please. Now, the UN related activities. Um, next slide, please. One minute. One minute. Yes, uh, thanks to the um, permanent observer status of SJAC at uh, UN Corpus and the consultative status at uh, UN ICASOC, SJAC presents the outcome of all its conferences and project group at, at the scientific and technical subcommittee and the legal subcommittee meetings every single year. Next slide, please. And the NEO project group um, specifically annually submits and presents the result of all the competitions and campaigns and papers that we discussed um, in the previous slides and um, with, with a special focus on raising awareness about planetary defense and to support the goals of United Nations 
Um, and uh, this is it from my side. Um, due to the time constraints, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I would like to invite you to have a look at our uh, paper and uh, presentation on the PDC portal. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Smriti. That's wonderful. Very impressive. I'm very impressed with uh, the scope of the activities of the SGAC. Thank you so much. Our thank next you. speaker is um, Alex Carl, who is not only a co-chair of the session, but he's the co-chair of the entire PDC. And he is also co-chair of the IAF Technical Committee on NEOs, which Smir Smriti just mentioned. So go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Linda. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned, I'm currently chairing the IF Technical Committee on NEOs. And next slide, please. And for the uh, IEC 2019, we organized a special session called Get Ready to Protect Earth from Asteroids, Planetary Defense in Your Hands. We had an expert panel there with uh, Bill Nye, Lindley Johnson, Doran Fornario, Mariana Graziano, and myself. Next slide, please. And the aim was to engage the audience. Um, we wanted to bring what is happening here at the PDC to the audience of the IEC, which is a much larger conference, but not that much um, concerned with what is happening in the planetary defense community. So we thought it would be a good idea to bring that over and uh, raise awareness what we are doing. Uh, in this case, we had about 200, 250 people in the audience. We had uh, about 60 active poll participants. And during the question and answer um, section of the um, event, we uh, received about 40 questions and they got uh, 90 upvotes through the uh, IF app. Um, how did we engage the audience? We took the 2019 PDC hypothetical asteroid impact scenario, which some of you might remember. And we had five injects there and um, had a poll after each inject. Uh, inject. Now, of course, uh, the poll has its limitations. Uh, people can only choose the answers that are given. Only one answer was possible to select. So if there was an overlap in agreement to something else, that would not be recorded. There's a, a initial uh, bias to or an inherent bias to the way the questions are asked. And of course, uh, not to forget, we have a very small section of the population here. Most of them are space uh, professionals and it was a conference held in the US. So it's um, not really representative, but it's, it's something to give you some ideas. Next slide, please. So the first inject, um, gave us a 1% chance of an asteroid impacting Earth eight years from now, and the size estimate was about 100 to 300 meters. And the poll was simple, what is your reaction? Um, as you can see, 7% of the audience uh, was not very, uh, very worried, while 93% uh, um, said we should take some form of action. Next slide, please. Just six months later, the impact probability uh, rose to 10%. The size estimate uh, was a bit um, improved, and we could say that uh, it could pr uh, produce some serious devastation over a large region, but it was too small to cause globally damaging effects. And same page calls a meeting. Again, same question posed to the audience. What is the, your reaction? Again, 7% said no need to do anything. And uh, again, 93%, so at least we stayed consistent there, said we need to do something. What is interesting is that 25% uh, jumped from um, let's get ready and prepare for the worst to I'm worried and losing sleep. So that's quite a significant uh, change there uh, with, with that um, new information. Next slide, please. The next inject already had us at 100% chance of impacting Denver five years from now. Um, the information was given that we had a contact binary and the asteroid is large enough to cause major damage over a large region around the Denver area. And in terms of mitigation actions, uh, a fleet of six kinetic impactors will need to be built and launched by space agencies 
as well as to rendezvous spacecraft to gather data on the asteroid. And the poll asked the audience, what do you think about the plans to deflect the asteroid? 8% were more worried about we should do nothing or we should prepare Denver for impact. And 92%, which is a nice um, uh, consistency with the 93% from the two previous questions we advocated for, for taking an active approach, uh, said, oh, we need to act and um, get ready for all kinds of outcomes. Next slide, please. Uh, in the next inject, we learned that uh, three kinetic impactors were successful in the deflection of the main body, but the last piece, uh, piece broke off, which is still on course. The fragment is estimated to be 50 to 80 meters large, and the exact location is not exactly known yet. No active spacecraft is left, uh, left from the original fleet, and same page and the UN are considering to launch a nuclear device for deflection. Question to the audience, now what? 47% said, uh, space is hard, let's try again and send the nuke. Uh, while uh, only 2% lost uh, faith in um, and trust in NASA and other space agencies. So I guess that's um, uh, good news is that uh, we can't fail. Um, however, uh, also a large number, 39% said, the nuke is too risky, there must be other op uh, options for deflection. Next slide, please. The final inject um, had uh, the 60 meter fragment hit uh, New York Central Park. Uh, it turned out to be too late to launch the NED and FEMA is evacuating residents and preparing uh, the infrastructure. And the last poll we asked the audience, what do you think we need to work on most urgently? Somewhat um, to our surprise of the panel, at least if 53% said communication was a public followed by our deflection capabilities, detection capabilities, and establishing geopolitical agreements. Last slide, please. So in conclusion, we um, could observe that uh, a vast majority, more than 90% of the uh, audience was in favor of being prepared and taking action. So I think that's, uh, uh, can be taken as a mandate, a mandate for what we're doing. Uh, we also need to take into account the uh, risk perception when communicating to the public. So um, we've seen that the change from 1% impact probability to 10% let 25% of the people um, get worried in addition. And uh, I find that is a, um, a large number. Uh, likewise, the potential effects of warnings on mental health should uh, therefore also um, be at least considered. Um, I know this might not be super realistic in this case, but we had 40% of the people starting to worry and losing sleep almost eight years ahead of an event that is very likely not going to happen. So this is maybe something related to the way it's communicated, to the way it's received. Uh, it can be part of the exercise, but I found it a very interesting um, outcome. Uh, the next um, observation is um, nothing new, but uh, it uh, just confirmed that the use of NEDs is controversial. We had 47% in favor and 53% um, against it in some form. And um, more than half of the audience thinks that communication with the public is the most urgent matter to work on for the planetary defense community, um, which from our point of view was surprising, but I think we saw that yesterday a bit in the, in the communications panel and the discussions that followed in the chat and uh, in the breakout rooms, um, that there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, concluding, it um, uh, Polls are a really good way to engage the audience. We, we got questions for the, for the Q&A section and uh, a good response rate. And also after the, um, the event, we received lots of positive feedback, both from the panelists as well as from the uh, audience. Thank you. Then Thank you, Alex. You. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is um, Sergei Schmaltz, 
uh, with the Keldish Institute, and he is going to talk about observations of near-Earth asteroids and national public outreach at the Astronomical Observatory of Castel Grande in Italy. Go ahead, Sergey. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Excuse me that you cannot see me because my webcam doesn't seem to work in WebEx. Um, so my name is Sergei Schmalz. I am from the Kaldish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and I work at the Astronomical Observatory of Castel Grande, also known as Ison Observatory, uh, Ison Castel Grande Observatory, which is located in South Italy in the region of Basilicata, roughly 150 kilometers away from Naples. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, I will just give you some, uh, just a little bit of background information about the uh, uh, work regarding the observation of NEOS. So the observatory started its work in September, October 2017, and just a half year later, we have got the MPC code. From that point onwards, we started our regular work on NEOS. And uh, <clears throat> we have already uh, got published uh, minor planet electronic circulars. We have done also a lot of photometry work. Uh, currently, we are a collaboration of eight observatories in five countries like Italy, Russia, Kazakhstan, Mexico, and Uzbekistan. Soon, we will start publishing our results in Minor Planet Blue Team. And here I mentioned uh, a couple of uh, near-Earth asteroids which have been uh, important milestones, not only in observational work, but also in the work uh, in communication and uh, uh, education of the public. Next slide, please. So almost from the first days, um, the observatory have been visited regularly by the local television, Rai television, especially after the first uh, important observation of the decaying Chinese uh, space station Tiangong One, which also was kind of uh, <clears throat> dangerous for the south of Italy. Actually, I forgot to mention that the observatory is uh, active in two major fields like observation of space debris and near-Earth asteroids. So we are often visited by the journalists and they do interviews which are then streamed on local and lately also on national television. Next slide, please. <clears throat> But generally, we communicate with the audience, with the local national public, through one local daily newspaper, which, newspaper, which is called Le Cronache Lucane. And uh, the first great uh, article was uh, the one about the near Earth asteroid last year, uh, 52768. Uh, because already in those days, I have seen a lot of fake news, which always come up. Uh, I will never forget the case of a colleague of mine, Leonid Yelenin, who had discovered a comet 2010X1. I remember how he was telling that his uh, discoverer name in those days was interpreted by some people as extinction level event, Nibiru is near. <laughs> so similar fake news also appear about near Earth asteroids and this was also the case. So I decided immediately to inform a journalist of this newspaper and we have prepared a full page article which described what will happen in the few days. Uh, next slide, please. So similarly last year we have for the first time participated in the asteroid day. Um, <clears throat> it was also uh, published in form of a video on the same on the web page of the same uh, newspaper, and also in September we have participated in the international uh, observe the moon night, which has have, which I have also connected to uh, asteroids because near Earth asteroids because one of the near Earth asteroids have been our second moon for some months. And also I have described in that event uh, the lunar impacts which have been observed by the Spanish Midas project. And I hope we will also organize the same thing also here in the observatory of Castel Grande. Next, please. Also last year, for the first time, we have made a great event, public event. Uh, roughly 100 persons have participated in that event uh, during which I have also uh, explained where do these beaters come from, or whether they are dangerous for airplanes. So it had really a great acceptance. And this year we will repeat it again with a larger scale with a public lecture. We do it on a large uh, surface of the uh, soccer field uh, exactly in the, uh, in the village of Castel Grande. Next slide, please. 
So uh, also uh, at the observatory, we have a, a large conference hall with 100 seats. And we uh, every every summer, uh, because of the pandemic, we cannot do it right now, for instance, because everything is closed. But every summer we have uh, many groups of visitors, both children and adults. And I always explain them the topic of the near Earth asteroids and space debris dangers. And here I always uh, show them this kind of shooting target, which you can see here. Uh, showing them, explaining them how distant was that 2019 OK near Earth asteroid, which passed just by 70,000 kilometers last year from Earth. Actually, I have an arrow here. It's not in Earth ready, but in Earth uh, diameters. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And these are the things which have done already and will do uh, regularly, but we have a lot in preparation in the village, in the old town hall, we have um, um, a multimedia uh, hall with two big rooms. In one of them, we have a 3D cinema with 25 seats where we can show uh, 3D cinemas. We have already acquired some of the 3D cinemas. One of them is about near Earth asteroids. Also in the second room, we have uh, multiple uh, large touch screens and we plan to install there. There is already pre-installed software, but we will also use a, a very well-known software universe sandbox uh, where you can let the visitors place, uh, let me say, a demiurge and uh, collide the Earth with different um, celestial bodies of different size at different velocities and see what are the consequences. Um, and another great project we, are, we, are, we have just started and hopefully we will be able to announce it on uh, the next asteroid date on June uh, day, on June 30, it will be a national website uh, which will give uh, an easy to understand and comprehend information on uh, near Earth asteroids and potentially hazardous asteroids. Because as you know, we have a lot of professional websites like the MPC, NEODIS, JPL, and uh, CNEOS, but the information there is given first of all in English and secondly in a very technical and not easy to understand information. Like the most common question of visitors is how distant will it, an asteroid be? And these professional websites, they give the distances in astronomical units or lunar distances, which is completely not understandable for a common person. So this will be a website in Italian language so that everyone, uh, starting from a child, continue to uh, ad adult people who are not familiar with astronomy, will be able to understand what is happening right now. Uh, how, uh, how, how dangerous is this or that asteroid of, of which he or she has heard probably in some fake news. Um, One minute. Also, yes. Also, uh, lately I have got a lot of re requests uh, from different uh, schools and um, organizations of the universities to give some uh, lectures in person, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it is not possible right now. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I have done a polling uh, on Facebook just to ask which software is being used uh, at different school, local schools. I've got a lot of uh, public and personal uh, uh, replies. And now I ha have started to prepare different uh, educational courses, uh, including uh, for the near Earth asteroids. And soon we will start doing these kind of online lectures for school children. And of course, we will also plan something new uh, for the asteroid day workshop this year with the botanical garden of the village. So we will combine astronomy and uh, earth protection. And the last slide, please. So I would also like to share information with other people who are active in this field and exchange the information about what and how can be done. And probably this could be a topic for the panel discussion. Maybe we should set up a mailing list for those who are really active in this kind of uh, field. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sergey. And I just want to mention a comment in the chat that your talk, and I would also say many, many uh, talks and presentations throughout the course of this meeting, uh, point out uh, the importance and, and the actually the pretty widespread um, existence of regional and local activities in planetary defense. So thank you so much. Our last but not least speaker is Carrie Nugent of Olin College in the US. And she is going to talk about public communication in the case of an impending impact lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Her talk is pre-recorded 
and um, Peter's going to play the talk, but Carrie is online with us. And so if there are any questions for her, we'll be able to take care of that uh, during Q&A. Peter, are you ready to play the talk? Yes, Romana should have the video ready. So I just- oh, Romana, okay, to... thank you. So it should come up straight ahead in a, I hope for. Great, thank you. If not, I'm happy to give it to the slides if this is technically stressful. Yeah, something's not working this time. Let me try it. Through. One thing I've thought, I'm sure we all have many thoughts about the pandemic we are living through. One thing I've thought of a lot through the last year is how it's a real world test of large scale science communication. We're in this situation where a group of experts needs to communicate scientific principles and advice in order to save lives. One could imagine that the planetary defense community would be in a similar situation if there was an impending impact. So in this brief talk, I want to go over just a few important takeaways in terms of communication. I want to acknowledge that communication is a huge field and there's a lot of studies I can't cover in eight minutes. I also want to take a minute to thank my co-author, Dr. Billings, who has a doctorate in mass communication and has contributed a great deal to this work. So to be an effective communicator, you must be apolitical. A successful example of this in the United States is Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's not affiliated with a political party and he has served both Democrat and Republican administrations. If you affiliate yourself with one party, then you alienate a portion of your audience. And if your goal is to reach people and save lives, you have to keep politics out of this. There's an excellent case study of this principle in the paper called A Tale of Two Vaccines and Their Science Communication Environments in the Oxford Handbook of the Science of Science Communication. This paper describes two vaccines. They're both for cancer-causing sexually transmitted diseases. One is for HPV, and it was manufactured by Merck and Company. To, exped to expedite approval of the vaccine, Merck recruited lobbyists on the left and the right, but this backfired as religious conservatives objected to the work of one of the lobbying groups. So as a result, adoption of that vaccine was poor. You can contrast that to another vaccine, which was for hepatitis B. That vaccine's manufacturer stayed apolitical and the vaccine was approved and adopted very quickly. If there was an impending impact and you were giving an interview, you might be tempted to explain several things to the public at once. Asteroid composition may be, orbital mechanics, observational techniques, this is inadvisable. You overload your audience with too much information too quickly. Research on science communication indicates you should stick to one simple message per day. Distilling a complex situation into one advisory message is very difficult, but necessary. The United States CDC trains spokes I'm sure we all have many thoughts about the tanks announced that he and his wife had contactful or impending impact. Useful SACOs might be get ready to evacuate, or if there's very limited information, we will have more information tomorrow. It's important for scientists to communicate using words. That's a great tool that humans have, but we can also communicate through actions. This was done very effectively in March 2020 by politicians in Washington state. They realized that it was important for people to start working from home if they could. And at that time, it was seen as a huge, hard to imagine shift in behavior. And businesses would need to realize the situation was serious before they told their workers to stay home. So local leader, Dow Constantine, called the president of Microsoft, and he asked if he would instruct his employees to work from home. Dow Constantine said, I thought if they told everyone to stay home, it could shift how the state was thinking. It would make the pandemic real. And it did. Businesses across the nation followed suit. 
Similarly, once Princeton announced that they were transitioning to remote learning, colleges and universities across the nation and the world, including my own, followed within 24 hours. It just took one influential institution to influence the rest of them. In the case of an impending impact, the planetary defense community should think creatively about how leading businesses and institutions could act to convey the seriousness, to show the seriousness of the situation to everyone else. We should directly contact those institutions and urge them to set an example for others. We don't often talk about celebrities here at the PDC, but they can also play a role in crisis communications. Tom Hanks announced that he and his wife had contact, contracted COVID-19 on March 11, 2020. A study conducted within 24 hours of this announcement showed that 92% of people had heard about his diagnosis. Of those people, about half said the announcement had caused them to change their behavior. I also wanted to share some highlights of studies on science communication. There's two key points on numerical information. One is to use graphics. You may know that already, but it's important and worth repeating. A picture is worth a thousand words. You may, the other is that frequencies are much more comprehensible to most people than percentages. So instead of saying something has a 5% chance, say it has a one in 20 chance. That's a simple thing we can all do to make uncertainty more understandable. The amount of misinformation during this pandemic has shocked a lot of experts. It's something that some people were not expecting at all. If there is an impending asteroid impact, we have to be ready to combat misinformation. This means that we need to monitor social media. We need to establish as a community where people can find reliable sources of information and refer to those sources repeatedly. And ideally, we should forge relationships with social media companies now. We need to have a way to communicate with them directly to make sure that misinformation is taken down quickly. And finally, I think we need to carefully consider the fatigue problem. In my corner of the world, people were careful about social distancing and mask wearing for a long time. But in the last few months, it seems like people have given up. They are exhausted and they don't care anymore. Ideally, there would be many years or even decades between a possible impactor being discovered and the possible date of impact. And there's lots of ways that situation may play out. But I would like everyone here to remember the fatigue felt at this point in the pandemic. We should be very cautious to only ask things of people when they are absolutely necessary, and we should be prepared for some people to feel fatigue and revert back to original behavior after some period of time. For more information, you can download the US CDC's Crisis Emergency Risk Communication Handbook. I've got a link via the QR code here. You can just hold up your phone and uh, on camera mode and it should link you right to it. That's targeted towards a US audience, but it's good general advice that I think would be applicable worldwide. There's also the Oxford Handbook of the Science of Science Communication, which is an excellent place to start. Dr. Billings and I are preparing a paper on the subject and you're welcome to contact us if you have comments or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. So interesting. Okay, we're coming back. Okay, now we're moving on to Q&A. And before Alex and uh, Alyssa take over for Q&A, I just want to mention, and I should have mentioned this when we started the session, that we do have some e-lightning posters, uh, sorry, e-posters and e-lightning talks um, associated with this session. Uh, and they have been available on the conference website all week long, and they're still there, so check them out. And I also want to say that um, when we break, I'm going to join the breakout room on Zoom called Meteor Crater, if anybody who's uh, uh, participating in this session wants to talk further. Okay, Alex and Alyssa. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I think Alex had a first question from our two uh, young presenters. If not, I will just jump in and read it. Uh, so Monica Maynard asked Artash and Aruchi, how long did it take you to find a office using the resources that you had? Well, it took us around um, two months and this included everything from like starting to actually finding telescopes, seeing how they worked, to actually finding the asteroid Apophis in the image after several tries. 
That makes sense. Well, and I, we have another question for you from Tom Stuckler, who asked, Artash and Aruchi, are you finding that there are a lot of other people your age who have the knowledge, resources, and interest to do the kind of work you've done, or is this just very rare? Uh, so we were able to do this because during the COVID-19 pandemic, school shut down. So all our learnings to this project were done online through applications like YouTube and other online services. Uh, so unfortunately, they don't really talk about this stuff much in school. So it's not that common, uh, I guess, to find other people are you working on this kind of things. Well, we thank well, you for inspiring the youth. It was uh, a lot of, I mean, you saw in the chat, so many people were excited about your presentation and you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Alisa, I'm back. I just forgot to unmute myself. So that was a <laughs> little technical problem. <laughs> well, I'm happy because the next questions are for you. <laughs> All right. So, Alex, some of your poll questions that you talked about and some of the answers were phrased in a particular provocative way. They failed. We trust uh, in NASA and the other space agencies were gone. Was this intentional? Were uh, were there appropriate dividing lines between engaging and provoking? And how does that affect the reliability of the responses that are collected? Yes, uh, that was uh, to some degree uh, intentional. Again, the, the idea was to, um, to raise awareness, but to also make it uh, entertaining to some degree. Uh, that's why also we had Bill Nye there, uh, which helped a great deal. Um, yeah, so we wanted to get um, really extremes in a way, just to get an idea. And as I mentioned, there are definitely limitations with a poll like this um, that are not super scientific in that sense, but it, it gives you first first idea what is coming back from the audience. And that was the intent here, to engage them mainly and then the, the secondary um, was to, to see what comes back with the information, what we can do with that. Uh, of course, um, I would not use this too much or weight it too much, if you understand what I mean. It's, uh, it's definitely um, uh, more used as a tool to engage. And I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that makes sense. We actually have a follow up question for you, but I would like to open it to all our panelists for today for this session. Uh, how can and it's asked by Tarek Daly. How can future planetary defense exercises better test our uh, be better test out or help us refine communication with the public? What can be done to assess the extent to which we are improving in that area? What do you think, Alex? Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I remember back in the first um, exercise that we did back in Flagstaff in, in 2013, that uh, we had different tables with different um, experts, so to speak. We had the, the UN people, we had the deflection people, we had the observation people and so on. And we had one table, a table with the general public that was composed of mainly of spouses of the, the conference participants to have um, uh, we would assume they have the, the least amount of, of technical knowledge of the subject. Um, so for, for future conferences, um, maybe that's an idea. So I guess really what we're trying here was, was, was this year's PDC is to engage the decision makers. So I think if we really want to test how is our communication with the public going, we should do the real test case and engage the public. Uh, of course, we have to see how that can be done, but uh, probably a small sample size group. Um, but maybe go on the streets and uh, ask people questions or invite relatives or ask the community to speak to uh, their friends and relatives, for example. Uh, we, can, we can definitely think about it, but I think the way forward is to actually engage the public. That makes sense. And Nahum or any other panelists for today, you've worked on the planetary defense exercises. What would be the best way to refine our communication with the public? I uh, interrupt and just say that, um, you know, there's a, a wealth of literature about science communication that's been done. 
And we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel here. We can rely on those previous studies that have been done about effective ways to communicate as well as effective metrics. Um, I think it would be great if we involved more of the uh, science communication scientists into this group uh, to do those types of studies. Um, I would also say that, uh, you know, what's coming to a lot of people's minds are failures in science communication, because those are ones we remember. What are hidden are the successful non politicized science communication uh, examples. Um, and if you kind of look into the literature of science communication, for example, the Oxford Handbook of the Science of Science Communication, you'll see great examples that you've never heard of of effective science communication, and you haven't heard of them because they've gone smoothly. And uh, for me, uh, I'd like to add that we were running those workshops uh, since 2012, mostly in the classroom or at aerospace. And we recently have found that when you inject uh, an element of competition into those workshops, this is how you uh, gain much interest and uh, energy into those workshops. So uh, in the last couple of years, we've been doing this type of competitions and uh, uh, engage groups in um, having a, an increasing challenge to deflect an asteroid using the app that uh, JPL and us are collaboratively developing. And I think this is an element that uh, engaged both teachers and students in trying to uh, increase the outreach beyond just uh, lo local classrooms, but across uh, regions. So this is a tool that was very, very effective in engaging uh, many more uh, students that we were able, able to get by a small group in the classroom. Uh, and this effectiveness comes from the collaboration between our communications department Monica, and our experts. Monica, you might want to unmute. I could hear her. Uh, can you, you can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying this uh, collaboration um, is effective because we, our communications department and our experts work together. So we uh, we talk to our experts, we listen to them, and I mean this this is Nahum's um, app, and we have uh, adapted it to teachers and students, and so far it's you know it, it's running smoothly and it's great. We now have a website up, and so it's accessible to everyone for free. Very good. Well, we are at time, but we have one last question from Brent Barney, which is a general question to all of you. So if you have a thought on this, please jump in. To what extent, if any, have official emergency response plans for other types of disaster, not any impact, been exercised in ways that include the general public? And he's thinking of the way that marketing advertising companies use focus groups. I think that uh, we kind of touched on this already. We we package this Neo app in, in a way that it's uh, not only accessible to the public, but it's um, it's attractive to students. I mean, if you go to our web page, it's you know very futuristic, and you can access the app. And then uh, when we meet with them, um, it, it's very interactive. So I think just having that interaction. Um, with uh, with our communications department and the experts uh, and directly with the participants it is great awareness for the public. Thank you. And I'd like to add to the, that the, the app is actually a collaboration between Aerospace and uh, JPL. So this is a project that is in, intended to increase the outreach across regions in Southern California. Um, and that is a, a project that is supported by NASA. Excellent. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Session 13 about Apophis and other asteroids. Um, this session is about the opportunities that a close approaching asteroid, especially Apophis, is going to present to us uh, over the next few years. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Mikhail Granvik. And um, earlier, Carrie said that we should talk in terms of frequency and not probability. And Mikhail is going to talk about the frequency of close approaching uh, uh, asteroids to Earth by near Earth objects. So take it away, Mikhail. Okay, thanks, Larry. 
Uh, so um, thanks for the introduction also. So here I will be building on the on the results that we published uh, uh, some years ago uh, or when we described the d biased orbit and absolute magnitude distributions of uh, NEOs. And, and this paper has been cited or referenced uh, during this meeting and you probably have seen it uh, before. So I will not go into any further details with that. Next slide. Uh, so the, uh, in that paper, we actually provided a, a predicted rate of impacts uh, 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 and uh, for for the inner planets, and we also compared this rate with what we see for bolides. But then, of course, and and this was an extrapolation of the model, so it wasn't actually in the size range where the model was developed, but but for very uh, much smaller objects. So the question is, uh, can we say anything about the, the, the rate of this or make a sanity check of these uh, uh, larger objects? Next slide. So, uh, for example, the question that I posed to myself uh, was, uh, what's the frequency of encounters such as Apophis in 29? And here I assume that, that Apophis has an age magnitude of 19.1 and the closest geocentric distance in 29 is roughly a tenth of a lunar distance. So in the literature, there has been casual statements. I don't actually know where these numbers come from, probably from some source, but it's unclear where they come from. That apophis encounters would happen every once every millennium. When I look at our model, the prediction is that the frequency should be about once in every um, 6,500 years. So roughly an order of magnitude uh, more uh, rare. Next slide. Uh, so the question then is, can we rely on the prediction from the model in, in, in terms of the impact uh, rates? Well, uh, of course, for the bolides, it seems to make sense. Of course, there's some gap in there because the model wasn't even aimed for those uh, objects, but at least the general trend points in the right direction. Uh, a direct verification is, of course, and luckily is out of the question because we don't see any of those uh, uh, large impacts or, or hasn't seen them in, in, in recent years. So the, the solution that, that we use is uh, here is, is to look at the close encounter statistics, but they also need to be corrected because the, uh, regardless of what, how we observe, we will always have some observational biases and we would need to compare against a fairly uh, unbiased sample. Next slide. So if I pull out the uh, the data from uh, CNEOs, for instance, their uh, close encounter tables, the, the distribution looks like this in terms of absolute magnitude and the Earth encounter distance. So in black here, you have the past encounters and the, the red ones are the future predicted encounters. And you clearly see that there's a difference between these distributions. And the reason is that you, we actually only see those very small ones, that is those with, with high absolute or large absolute magnitudes when they already do the close encounters, so we cannot actually predict their close encounters very well. So the question is, where do we have to draw the, the, the limit in absolute magnitude so that these two distributions basically agree with each other? Next slide. And I used the, uh, the Anderson-Darling test and, and used as a null hypothesis that, that two samples are drawn from the same distribution. So on the left-hand side here, you see the uh, distribution in terms of age magnitude uh, without any assumptions uh, for the for the limiting magnitude, and you can clearly see that okay, these distributions are not equal, so we can rule them out. Then, if I step down in absolute magnitudes and and look at okay, at what stage do we can we no longer rule out the hypothesis? It turns out that it's about at at age of twenty one. The 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 previous uh, distrib uh, di distributions of um, previous uh, 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 observed close encounters and the predictive ones can no longer be separated. They seem to come from the from the same distribution, and that's what you see here on the on the right hand side. Next slide. One minute now. Thanks. So this is the model prediction for the close encounters by large NEOs with with three different uh, sorry four different uh, age magnitude bins. And now next slide. If you plot on top of this. Uh, the observed ones, we see that the, the agreement is fairly good. I mean, we're only a, a factor of few off, but we are still a factor of few off. And it's at this stage a bit unclear what the reason actually is. Next slide. So if, uh, I mean, one explanation is that we still are not complete, even at these large uh, uh, sizes, and we need to actually, uh, pr uh, there's some problems with the selection effects that we haven't accounted for. And then the final slide, thanks. 
So in uh, summary, uh, the frequency of uh, close encounters by apophis scale objects seems to be a factor of few lower than the model predicts. And the apophis encounter in 29 is apparently or seems to be a once in 20,000 year event. And the root cause of this disagreement is still to be determined, but, but it might at least partly be depending on the, on the uh, observational biases. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mikhail. Um, and of course, everybody's welcome to enter questions into the chat box and we'll um, compile those and ask the questions at the end of the session. All right. Awesome. Okay. So next we'll be hearing from um, Michael Kelly uh, presenting um, Iwan planetary defense um, exor exercise Apophis observing campaign 2020 through 2021. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, of the conference for giving us this time. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, on this presentation to point out that we're just representing a large group of participants in the campaign. Uh, there's too many to list on the abstract, but they'll be in, in the paper. And um, a special call out here to Gerbs Bauer and Elizabeth Warner and Tony Farnham at the University of Maryland for maintaining the uh, websites and um, hosting the telecons for the campaign. At this point, um, I would go to the next one. At this point, planetary defense exercises are not a new concept. Um, there was a series of, of exercises that usually destroyed towns called Pasadena by Lindley Johnson and, and colleagues uh, that were conducted with local and regional authorities and emergency personnel. Um, and this week, um, uh, there, there are, uh, we see another example of exercises conducted during the PDC conference, uh, both of those sets of, of um, uh, exercises are relatively short term, conducted over a period of a week or less. Um, but during uh, a program review in 2017, the idea was patched to do an observational campaign with a real asteroid uh, as a as a uh, exercise. Um, to that end, we, we conducted an exercise with um, uh, asteroid 20, 2012 TC4 in 2017. And in 2019, we conducted a similar campaign with a binary NEA uh, called 1999 KW4, which is now 66391 Um And that focused mostly on characterization. Um, and then Apophis was, a, uh, was an obvious choice um, uh, for a third campaign. Next slide. Um, I think it was our colleague Rob Landis who applied the term coalition of the willing to the participants in these exercises. We don't actually provide any funding aside from the, the usual surveys funded by PDCO. Um, and um, what we do typically is decide in the first telecon or two um, who the group leads will be, and we try to rotate those duties among participants. Uh, the typical working groups are shown here. Uh, cadence is usually limited to one hour every two weeks, so as not to overburden the, the participants. Uh, otherwise, communications through email. Um, and um, we may step that cadence up to once a week during close approach on, in some cases. And um, we strive to stick to an operational timeline um, that would simulate a, a real event rather than the usual lengthy scientific analysis type um, timelines. Next slide. Uh, observational data feed into the pair model, which you've seen presented by our colleague Jesse Dotson earlier this week. And here we can see the, the group leads um, superimposed on, on that typical process. Uh, next slide. And again, you've seen this um, uh, presented by Jesse uh, earlier. Uh, we use the impact risk uh, model to assess the potential damage from the campaign target asteroid uh, based on our, our real-time uh, observations. Next slide, please. We were well prepared to conduct an exercise during a global pandemic since all of these campaigns have been conducted virtually. We kicked off the Apophis campaign last fall, concluded formal meetings just two weeks ago, and um, we show 40 participants here, but um, uh, previous papers, we've had closer to 70 co-authors. So we'll see once the group leads have, have provided uh, a complete list. Uh, next, please. As with previous cases, we treated Apophis 
um, as a newly discovered NEA to help simulate a real world scenario. Um, during the campaign, the threat from Apophis began decreasing. So we began using a hypothetical impactor based on the actual measurements we made of the real Apophis during the campaign itself. And we did modeling in three, uh, uh, three epochs throughout the campaign. Next. And here again, this is this is kind of content rich, but I'll I'll just mention that um, um, in Epic One, you see a very broad and and uncertain uh, impact corridor, uh, but the based on the astrometry and NEOWISE data, um, we 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 got an average total risk of about 0.6 percent, with anywhere from zero to 61 million people affected depending on where the impact occurred, with an average of about 2 million people. Next. And then between Epic 1 and Epic 2, we obtained IRTF data, more photometric data. Um, you can see the spectrum there from, from IRTF, uh, which compares well to an SQ-type asteroid. Uh, and the phot photometric data showed us a period rotation period of about 30, uh, 30 hours. Uh, next. So in Epic 2, We've now, you can see a much more uh, refined or defined uh, impact corridor, still quite long, but much, much narrower. Um, and, but the, the uh, average risk has now jumped by an order of magnitude to about 6%. The range of the population is fairly similar, zero to 54 million, but the average has increased slightly to 2.3 million in this, in this epic. Next. So between Epic 2 and Epic 3, we obtained radar data um, in uh, early to mid-March, um, which uh, was done using Goldstone and Green Bank uh, with sim similar signal to noise as uh, uh, observations done in 2013. Next. And so prior to uh, the radar observations, we still we see a well defined impact risk corridor, but but it's still quite lengthy. Um, next, and then afterwards, uh, coming out of Epic Three, we see a much much shorter corridor. Next, next. By mid March, the threat from the real Apophis was ruled out, but of course we weren't going to let that deter us from having a truly spectacular disaster. Next. And what we can see here is the final uh, risk corridor with, with more detail and larger population centers. Next. What we found is that the blast damage is, is the primary hazard for about 98% of the, the cases. Thermal damage also occurs in those cases, but is less severe than the, than the blast damage. Next. One minute left. Okay. It turned out that the highest probability impact site also happened to be the highest population center in the swath, Istanbul. Uh, and the tsunami threat just happened to be the highest uh, at that point as well due to the proximity to the, to the Black Sea. The one location where no casualties uh, occurred was, was in the English Channel, unless of course one happened to choose that day to go sailing. Um, uh, next. So, as a result of the observations during the campaign, uh, we found that Apoph Apophis uh, poses no real threat to the Earth for at least the next 100 years, uh, completely ruling out the, the, the risk of impact in 2068. Um, the exercises with an observational component involving real asteroids have been a practical learning experience, and participants have, have frequently expressed an enthusiasm for continuing to conduct these exercises approximately once every one and a half to two years. It seems to be a, a good cadence. And with that, I'll invite any of the participants to, um, uh, in, in the campaigns to respond to questions or make comments in the, in the chat. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm the... Other chair, uh, Gers um, Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, and again, sorry everyone for having technical uh, difficulties connecting. Um, our next talk is going to be given by uh, Dr. Dave Dolan uh, from uh, the University of Hawaii, and he's going to discuss detection of Yarkovsky acceleration of nine 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 four two Apophis. Take it away, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Gerbs. Aloha, everyone. 
by now, I assume everyone understands the importance of including the Arkowski effect when computing impact probabilities for hazardous asteroids. And Apophis is certainly no exception to that. Uh, multiple people have been uh, doing the orbit computations, trying to make a statistically significant detection of Yarkovsky acceleration for some time now. And uh, we finally succeeded uh, about a year ago in getting a statistically significant detection. So next slide, please. So we uh, first reported on this detection at the uh, DPS meeting last October, and then a couple of weeks later, repeated that at the uh, Apophis T-9 workshop. So what I would like to do today is to provide just a bit of an update because uh, we do have additional data. Uh, in December, we had uh, an, another set of five observations made with the Subaru telescope, which are good to 10 milliarc seconds. And really, that was the key to getting the detection of the Yarkovsky acceleration a year ago. We had a, a set of uh, uh, observations from, from Subaru in January and March, which were all better than 10 milliarc seconds. And that just uh, really nailed it for us. Um, so our A2 value is now, um, it, it's slightly larger in an absolute value sense, but it is negative, so it, the value decreased. So our uh, value for A2 is now minus 30 plus or minus three times 10 to the minus 15 astronomical <laughs> units per day squared. And uh, that's, a, that's a 10 sigma detection. And it, it shifted the peak of the probability distribution a little farther away from the 2068 keyhole. And um, the uh, distance from the Earth in the 2029 B plane would be uh, 47,355 plus or minus 36 kilometers. Uh, next slide, please. So this just shows that information graphically. The uh, red curve is uh, our solution, including all of these uh, recent Subaru observations. And uh, if, if you were to totally ignore the Yarkovsky effect, then you would have something over around the right edge of that diagram, uh, well outside of the 2068 keyhole. Uh, and now the inclusion of the Yarkovsky effect, we have shifted that uh, distance uh, to the left side of the uh, 2068 keyhole, and it's still down there in the tail. So uh, we couldn't entirely rule it out at the at the time of the, these observations. Uh, the other curve on there, the blue dashed curve, was the prediction by Vokerlicki et al. in a 2015 paper where they took into account the measured thermal properties of Apophis and the measured rotational state of Apophis. And that's their prediction as to what the uh, A2 value ought to be. And um, uh, congratulations, they did a fantastic job. I think uh, the uh, prediction matches extremely well with the observed value. Okay, next slide, please. All right, we now know that the impact probability has dropped down to zero. It's been mentioned several times now during the conference. But for historical purposes, I think it's still useful to mention what the status of the impact prob probability was as of the time of the abstract deadline for this conference. Uh, prior to the deadline, we had time to run 10 million clone orbits and those were all checked for Earth impacts over the next century. And we did find 13 impacting solutions. Eight of those corresponded to the 2068 keyhole, corresponding to a impact probability of a slightly less than one in a million. Single impacts were also found in 2075, 2083, 2091 and at the two different node passages in 2079. So interesting to see an impact in October show up there, whereas all the others are around that April the 13th uh, timeframe. Okay, so uh, next slide. 
it's uh, been a pleasure to work with a number of different people over the last 14 years, getting observations of POFIS that uh, went into this analysis. So I, I've mentioned some of them there, Fabrizio Bernardi, Marco Michelli, Garrett Elliott, Dora Foring, Denise Hung. And uh, uh, 14 years of observations has not been covered by a single grant. There have been multiple grants in there that are worth acknowledging, including the National Science Foundation and the most recent NASA grant, uh, which I've shown there. And then one last slide. And I just wanted to uh, dedicate this presentation to the memory of Roy Tucker, who is a, a co-discoverer of Apophis and a dear friend of mine. He passed away from uh, pancreatic cancer on March 5th, just a couple hours before the close approach of Apophis to the Earth in this year. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Dave. And, and, uh, and, uh... Uh, heartfelt and and uh, uh, very appropriate tribute. Okay, uh, thanks, Dave. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Johnny Frado, who is going to tell us about Apophis Express, a uh, spacecraft concept that uh, could take advantage of the Apophis Close Approach in 2029. Yes, I am Jean Prado. I'm a retired engineer from CNES, but still interested in planetary defense. So the co authors are Daniel Stroffer from Paris Observatory and Anna Eric from Grenoble University. So next slide, please. So the main outline of the, the scenario uh, that I will describe is to have an interception and rendezvous with Apophis when it comes on its incoming leg a few days before its flyby. So uh, this can be done so with a launch, a launch on a, a high, highly eccentric orbit uh, with an apogee of about uh, one or two million kilometers. And it will be uh, used it after the, the rendezvous uh, to deliver a set of modules so, um, close navigation, a service module, an orbiter, a lander, and possibly a return capsule. So, the main mission, the main advantages of this mission is uh, very short duration, a few weeks, very late departure, and uh, so it can take into account the observation, the data that will have been collected before by other uh, missions and the system requirements for the spacecraft and the, uh, all the uh, hardware uh, will be more similar to uh, Sun Earth uh, L1 or L2 missions than uh, to the interplanetary missions. So next slide, please. The traditional scenario is to use a Hohmann transfer, which takes about uh, one year, and the uh, last possible uh, such uh, scheme would consist in a launch in May 2028, so one year before the Apophis pass, and the arrival a few, two months before the, the closest approach, for a total delta V, about 5.2 kilometers per second. So next slide, please. What is proposed in the geometry of the uh, uh, Apophis approach is uh, summarized in these uh, graphics. The, uh, if we encounter uh, Apophis uh, two or three days before, uh, so it uh, tens or events of uh, April, uh, the distance will be between uh, less than two million kilometers, and the relative velocity of Apophis will be uh, five, less than six kilometers per second. So the definition is uh, in the southern hemisphere is uh, minus uh, 30 degrees. So next slide, please. The mission scheme that uh, uh, is proposed through this uh, Mission Express mission would be a very long uh, apogee, a very long uh, uh, elliptic orbit with an apogee of uh, one, between one and two million kilometers. And the um, uh, then, after the ignition of the apogee kick module uh, between A and B, the points of these graphics, uh, 
there will be a separation and the, uh, the, the set of remaining uh, modules, so the service module, orbital module, uh, apophis lander, and return capture will uh, fly by uh, and rendezvous uh, with uh, apophis in the uh, uh, hours after the, uh, uh, the apogeetic modern ignition. And there will be a separation of the uh, apophis lander uh, that could. Uh, uh, integrate the re-entry capsule, and then uh, the, this mission will uh, follow, will uh, uh, be able to observe Apophis during uh, four or five days from the uh, incoming leg to the departure from us. So next slide, please. So the launch options that are based, they are very uh, uh, rough uh, estimations. Uh, I could not make a very uh, in-depth uh, study. So it's based on the publicly uh, available data uh, concerning the uh, L2 performances of some uh, Ariane Space uh, launchers. So you can see that uh, it's uh, from the right uh, side of the right column of the of the the the, 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 branch, the this um, table is about 200 kilograms that could be uh, allocated for scientific instrumentation. So uh, the next slide, please. So the, the, so the short duration and short distance uh, with respect to the years have very positive effects on the operation costs and the less late launch is uh, also uh, favorable because the decision-making process is not as uh, constraining as for an ordinary mission, and it can benefit from the results obtained by uh, other space missions and ground observations. So uh, up to, let's say, uh, one, one month before the, the launch, uh, there, there could be the possibility for adjusting the, uh, the payload. And uh, among the, the scientific payload that could be delivered on the surface of Apophis, uh, it could be an interest in uh, uh, including a laser reflectometer, such as the one which has been uh, deposited on the, on the moon during the Apollo program. And uh, even if Apophis is not a danger for the next century, it will be able for our for the next generations to track its orbit uh, very regularly when it uh, passes close to the Earth. So as it's, uh, it has been, if this uh, mission idea is uh, supported, uh, it could be, uh, it should be uh, designed in coherence with other missions. So uh, I think it would be the, the role of the SMPH uh, group to, uh, to include or to, to consider this uh, the, the, the complementarity of these missions, of this uh, Apophis Express mission, with respect to the uh, other uh, missions. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. So next we will be hearing from Dr. Patrick Taylor um, presenting about uh, the characterization of near Earth asteroid 153814. Um, and prospects for the 2028 close encounter with Earth. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you let me know how much time I have? Yes, I'll give you a one minute warning. But how much total? Sorry. Sorry, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, so I'll be presenting on 2001 WN5, some very preliminary work. Uh, with my co-authors from NEOWISE and also the Arecibo radar team. Next slide, please. So 2001 WN5 was, of course, discovered in 2001 by Lonios, though there are recoveries that date back to 1996 using Spacewatch. Its absolute magnitude is about 18.3, so suggesting a diameter of hundreds of meters, and it has a an Earth of orbit inter, uh, intersection distance of less than a lunar distance, so within the orbit of the moon. 
So it's obviously described as a potentially hazardous asteroid to Earth. Uh, that said, its orbit is very well known with now with a data arc spanning 25 years and 11 heliocentric orbits. Uh, it is not, it does not have any impact risk associated with it. So essentially it makes a close approach to Earth every nine years. So discovered in 2001 and then 2010, 2019, and then in 2028, there will be a close approach within one lunar distance. So within the orbit of the moon on June 26, 2028. And it's hard to see in the figure on the right, but at the very bottom, the points for the Earth and WN5 essentially overlap at roughly the ascending node of the asteroid. Next slide, please. So previous observations include optical light curves in 2010 and 2019. They show a pretty interesting trimodal light curve with three peaks in it rather than the typical two and a well-established period of 4.25 4 hours. It also shows a high amplitude, especially at high phase, so roughly 0.6 magnitudes at 60-some degrees of phase, and that amplitude gets smaller as the phase decreases. So likely we're dealing with something that's not quite spheroidal. Next slide, please. So previous spectroscopy that's been done from the 2010 apparition, uh, one set of observations from the IRTF by Thomas et al showed a relatively featureless uh, spectrum there on the upper right, but pretty much contemporaneous observations by Binzel et al showed that there's actually a pretty sharp increase from about 0.4 to 0.7 microns and a pretty clear absorption feature around 0.9 or 1 microns and an overall red slope. And this was categorized, categorized as a, as a L-type asteroid. Next slide, please. There's also several epochs of Neowise observations shown on the right. Uh, the original, one of the first observations done with cryogenic y, uh, Neowise found a diameter of about 930 meters. That's the green curve in the center of the figure. Uh, since then, there's been several more epochs using the non-cryogenic Ys, so where they only have two bands rather than four. And an example in the magenta curve near the top of the figure with a, a, a needham fit to that also finds a diameter of about 940 meters, but a much larger uncertainty. There's been a recent attempt to do a, a thermophysical fit with a, a full thermophysical model to all of the NEOWISE data. And interestingly, that found a much smaller diameter of only about 600 meters. So we're still trying to understand what that discrepancy is between the needham and the full thermophysical model. Next slide, please. So we also have radar observations from Arecibo in 2010 and 2019. There's an example there on the right of a Doppler only spectrum. Uh, the bandwidth, so the width of that curve there is related to how large the asteroid is and how fast it rotates. Since we already have the rotation period from light curves, the bandwidth there is suggesting that the diameter of the asteroid is roughly one kilometer and possibly even larger. Other things that we can take out of this figure are that the object is not metallic. It doesn't have a very high radar albedo suggesting metallicity. Uh, the polarization ratio, which is essentially just the, the dashed curve divided by the uh, solid curve is 0.4, which is elevated for the S complex, but it's not unusual. For comparison, it's similar to what you see for MASHA or 1999 KW4. We also see no evidence for satellites. And we have very precise uh, range astrometry, but it actually didn't improve the orbit itself very much because there was just so much optical data already available for this object. Next slide, please. So we do have radar images. These are from 2019. They are very coarse. This is 75 meter resolution per pixel on the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is a Doppler shift or speed at 0.24, uh, 0 0.24 hertz. If you kind of squint and look really closely at these, you can see that, that the echo or echoes are kind of asymmetric. That suggests to us that this is not a, a spherical, completely spherical object, and it's clearly rotating in, in these images, similar to how uh, the rotation period from light curves. And in the bottom row of images, in the, the first image on the left and the one next to it, you might be able to convince yourself that there's a bit of structure on the on the leading edge of that of that echo, suggesting maybe some some large scale structure on the the shape. 
Next slide, please. So what's happening in 2028? So on the left, you have the, the distance to Earth as a function of time. So it comes in and spends about 16 hours or so within the orbit of the moon with a minimum distance of about 0.7 lunar distances. And on the right, you can see how it's moving uh, through the sky with time. So you're going to start on the right side of the figure at, at June 25th. You can see it at about minus 40 declination that it moves rapidly to far southern declinations. Each of those diamonds there is a one hour time step. So it's trucking along through the sky at about eight degrees per hour. And eventually it passes through close approach at nearly minus 60 degrees declination that rapidly moves to the north before receding from Earth at about plus 30. Uh, next slide, please. So on the left here, you have the visual magnitude for the entire year of 2028. And if you go to the, the next slide, it'll show, it'll annotate it. So some points to notice, uh, if you have a very large telescope, this the object will be brighter than 20 second magnitude starting in February, so several months before close approach. And it steadily gets uh, brighter each month, essentially. Uh, by the end of March, it's less than magnitude 20. By the beginning of May, it's less than magnitude 18. Beginning of June, it's less than magnitude 15. And then it peaks at brighter than seventh magnitude during its closest approach. After that, it rapidly fades to about 19th magnitude. And if you look on the right, that is a plot of both the phase angle in black and the solar elongation in red. So inbound, it's coming in at sort of 20 or 30 degrees phase angle while the elongation is much greater than 90. And then during the close approach, everything swaps and uh, you get a very high phase angle and a very low solar elongation. Next slide. One minute left. Okay. So what are the prospects? So pretty much summarizing the previous slide for optical and spectroscopic observations, this object will be brighter than 18th magnitude at low phase and high elongation, pretty much from May all the way through June but then it's going to rapidly fade after close approach. In terms of tracking, the orbit, as I said, is extremely well known, even with seven years, seven years, looking seven years in the future, the plane of sky uncertainty is a fraction of an arc minute. The only possible challenge is maybe the, the, fast, uh, the fast sky motion, but that really shouldn't be a problem either. In terms of radar, obviously anything this large that comes this close will be an amazing radar target. In terms of existing uh, cap capabilities, Goldstone will be able to observe this with meter scale resolution pretty much from mid-June until early July, so several weeks of possible observations. Unfortunately, it's going to be a little too far south during the exact close approach, but there's still going to be plenty of time for Goldstone to look at it. Greenbank has a similar observing window to Goldstone, and what you can do with Greenbank will depend on their, uh, their budding uh, transmitter capability. But uh, the really interesting thing is this is a perfect target for the, the uh, radar capabilities in Australia, such as the DSS-43 in Canberra and the other smaller telescopes down there. So this would be a great target for them in 2028. And also looking forward to NEO Surveyor, although it's not up in the, up in the sky yet, uh, nominally it will WN5 will pass through the survey field of any surveyor several times before its close approach. And the final slide, next. So physical characterization is ongoing. It's very preliminary at this point, but it looks like this object is probably one, a one kilometer, possibly even larger, likely elongated, possibly has large surface features. We have a good handle on the rotation, uh, rotation period, but not really on the spin axis quite yet. We think, although uh, the radar images are not amazing, uh, we think we can do some basic shape modeling in terms of an ellipsoidal shape and possibly large scale features. And once we do a little bit more on the spin axis and shape modeling, hopefully that can help us understand the discrepancies between the thermophysical model and the NEDA model for the NEOWISE observations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Okay, so our our uh, last speaker for the session is uh, Maxime Bukov, um, and he'll be 
um, presenting extension of the Earth Libration Point missions by targeting a spacecraft to near Earth asteroids. Um, and uh, just a reminder that uh, Q and A session begins after this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Popkov Maxim. I'm a student of Bauman Moscow State Technical University and also I work in Space Research Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences. Today I will present you results of our recent research about possibility of this extension. Next slide, please. An idea of an extended mission of a spacecraft after the completion of the main mission was initially used in the IC3 project. After completing the planned scientific program, the spacecraft was targeted to the Jacobini Zina and Halley comets by performing several lunar gravity assist maneuvers. One of the possible scenarios of the extended mission of a spacecraft may be its redirection to the trajectory of approach to a potentially hazardous asteroid to obtain a new scientific data about it. For example, mass of the asteroid can be estimated by assessing its gravitational influence on the spacecraft trajectory. <coughs> A possible method for measuring the mass of the asteroid was proposed by Perrin. Next slide, please. As a spacecraft which can be retargeted to asteroid exploration after completion of the main mission, we consider it the Spectrum Rontgen Gamma SRG spacecraft that uh, currently located at the vicinity of the Kalinia Sun Earth Liberation Point A2. SRG is a Russian German high energy space astrophysical observatory. Uh, and the main scientific goal of SRG is to measure X-rays from celestial <laughs> objects. According to preliminary estimates by approximately 2029, after completing its mission, the SRG spacecraft is expected to have an hour onboard propellant to perform a total impulse of 200 meters per second that can be used in extended mission. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a simulated trajectory of SRG using correction impulses. So it can be maintained in periodic orbit by low impulses for quite a long time. Next slide, please. Uh, this simulation was carried out in the NASA General Mission Analysis Tool that allows to numerically integrate the equations of motion of the spacecraft in a realistic force model. Next slide, please. So. Uh, after the completion of the main mission, SRG can be redirected towards exploration of some near Earth asteroids or comets, as shown on this slide. Uh, for simulate their trajectories, we use NASA Horizons interface. Next slide. Uh, according to NASA report, asteroid 1997 XF11 should approach the Earth on the 26th of October 2028 at a distance of 930,000 kilometers. Uh, this asteroid could be a good candidate as a potential object of study. Uh, the dependence of the minimum required impulse value on the date of its application was calculated. As you can see, it completely satisfies the restriction on the maximum impulse value at 200 meters per second. Uh, the relative velocity of the spacecraft during the close approach is about 14 kilometers per second. Next slide, please. Uh, another possible target for the extended mission e of SRG is the Apophis asteroid. Since on the 13th of April 2029, it will approach the Earth at a distance of about 31,000 kilometers. Uh, due to this, Apophis can be considered as one of the most preferred targets for an additional research. Uh, the simplest way to approach Apophis for the SRG spacecraft is the direct flight from the liberation point vicinity. Required impulse value satisfies the restriction on its maximum value at 200 meters per second only for dates from 25th of February to 15th of March. Next slide, please. Another possibility of observing a office by SRG is to study it from the current orbit in the vicinity of the Sun Earth liberation point L2. Uh, preliminary calculations show that in this case, SRG will approach Apophis at a distance of about 300,000 kilometers on the 11th of April. Relative velocity of the SRG is about 6 kilometers per second. Next slide, please. 
Uh, now let's talk about perspectives of the SRG flight to comets 289P Blind Pain and 300P Catalina. These comets are expected to approach the Earth at 2035 and 2036. Uh, since the SRG spacecraft can be maintained in a periodic orbit by lowering process for quite a long time, these comets are of interest as objects to study by the spacecraft. So, um, the comets will approach the Earth at a distance of 8 and 12 million kilometers. So, the use of uh, moon gravity assist to reach these comets were considered to approach them. Uh, this figure shows the dependencies of the required impulse value on the maneuver date. Note that the flight to 289 people in pain required two gravity assist maneuvers of the moon, while the flight to 300 P Catalina required only one such maneuver. Required impulse value is always less than 200 meters per second. Next slide, please. Um, that's strange. Okay, so um, you can see, but uh, main conclusions of our research. The technical feasibility of the proposed extended mission of the SLG spacecraft is shown. It is demonstrated that with the existing propellant resource of the SLG spacecraft, various scenarios of an extended mission are possible. And the proposed concept can be applied to other spacecraft for additional use at the final stage of their missions. So thank you for attention and back to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, and so I think we'll we'll open up our uh, Q and A sessions uh, session now. And um, before before we do, I do want to encourage everyone to uh, look at the poster sessions uh, or the poster present presenters and presentations. Um, uh, we have a lot of very interesting talks in in the poster sessions and I know that they have not had a, uh, a chance to speak here but um, uh, the content there is is um, uh, very exciting including uh, neowise results um, photometry uh, from the Apophis 2021 campaign uh, uh, perturbations of Apophis by other asteroids um, and um, uh, also, um, uh, a, a further investigation of the acrostomy effect for for Apophis, and um, and then uh, a a investigation into um, the impact of or or what may be determined from a seismic uh, response mission uh, for the 2029 Apophis encounter, and those as a simulation based study on that. So. Those are all very exciting. Um, please do um, go to the poster uh, links and pull those down. Um, so I will open up uh, the session um, actually with a uh, with a first uh, question myself to um, to Patrick, and um, it it may be um, uh, uh, just a straightforward question. Uh, do you know um, why? Is there any speculation as to why there is a discrepancy between the NEOIS results and the size um, determined by the radar at present? Is there, for example, um, a uh, was the was the beaming parameter fit uh, uh, more consistent or or outside of the range? Do you know offhand? Uh, well, I, th I think. Some of the key differences are you have two fits to, with a NEDAM model to a, to specific epochs. So one fit to one epoch, one fit to another epoch. And you have the thermophysical model that's trying to fit the ensemble. So it, it's possible there's something about phase angles. It could be a shape effect since it's probably not really a spherical object. Um, we're still trying to to really understand what's going on. There might also be something with uh, sort of the weighting scheme, having some cryogenic data versus some non cryo data and, and things like that. It, it's still pretty early. 
to understand what exactly is going on. Definitely a very interesting uh, object, all the same. And um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, Brent Barbie asks, uh, uh, what do you see as some key goals uh, uh, for the future WN5 observations? Gee, who's this? I'm not sure. Who, yeah, that's that's to you, Patrick. That's to me. Um, well, that's why I came to this conference to find out what <laughs> what we should be doing. Uh, it, it certainly could be kind of seen as a, a dry run for Apophis being about it a year prior, uh, perhaps not in the send a spacecraft to it kind of way, but being able to do uh, a global a global effort of looking at an object with many different types of observational uh, methods, I, I think is would certainly be worthwhile. And something being that bright is is obviously a good public relations sort of thing. There was another comment in the chat that said this would probably be a, a good binocular level object that could be really important for public outreach. So I think really it's it's an object that that can kind of test the things you might want to do with Apophis and hopefully this can help spur some more conversation on that. Um, uh, uh, another question for Patrick from, from uh, Paul Abel, and that is, um, is there a chance the light curve is due to some sort of albedo feature? I think, go ahead. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty early to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm happy to take any advice from the, the light curve folks that might be in the audience. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're still pretty early. I, I was, it was interesting earlier in this conference to just be reminded that Bennu has a trimodal light curve, perhaps not as uh, high amplitude as this one, but it's just interesting what kind of shapes could possibly give you that sort of uh, light curve. Um, it looks like one more question for Patrick, um, and that is what fraction of rotation phase is covered by the delayed Doppler imaging and how much of the surface have you seen? So the, the images that I showed where it was four images in a row, those were roughly, I think 1.5 hours. So sort of, uh, a third of the rotation in each of those. So that's pretty much limited by how long Arecibo could track, but uh, it's a it's a decent fraction enough that you could see uh, obvious rotation of the body. So my co-chair um, Larry had a question, I think, for uh, uh, Mikhail. Okay. Is that is that right? Larry, did you want to? Uh, so there were a few questions for Mikhail um, in the chat. They were mostly answered, but I'll try to summarize them and Mikhail can chime in himself. Um, there was the question about the uh, frequency of cometary impacts and his work. Um, there is another question about the cluster of uh, big encounters prior to Apophis um, of the asteroids 1999 AN10, 2001 WN5, and 1997 XF11. So how do these close encounters rate in um, the uh, one and X scale of uh, opportunities. And finally, a question from Rob Seaman about the, what does the one in 20,000 years Apophis close approach frequency say about the impact frequency of asteroids of that size or larger? Do you want to- Mikhail, are you? Yeah, so that's for you, Mikhail. Yeah, so for the, well, if we start from the, from the la last one, I, th I think, uh, we, I mean, I brought uh, an answer to the, to the chat also about this, but, but basically the current understanding or what's out in the community right now is, is that these uh, kilometer sized uh, impactors should, uh, should strike us uh, roughly twice in a million years or so. 
uh, and, and this is what uh, I think uh, the the Harris and the Brahma model also predicts. But but we already in the paper also say that we get uh, uh, roughly a three times uh, lower impact rate, and uh, and that's mainly due to the or, 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 or only due to the the fact that we have a different orbit and size distribution or mainly orbit distribution model. And but if we, I mean, looking at what I presented today, it, it seems that we're not low enough anyway. Or then there's something, maybe maybe the rates are correct that we should get, but 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 we haven't accounted for the for the biases um, for these uh, multiple close encounters of that that are rare. That's an that's statistically an interesting problem. How to deal with that? But if we start seeing, I mean, I I, I already think that. Uh, Having an up office encounter of once in even a thousand years, let alone twenty thousand years, happening exactly at the time when we have the capability to detect it and follow it up is is quite amazing. We're quite lucky, almost suspiciously lucky. So I'm 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 I'm, I'm not clear that we understand everything about this these frequencies yet. And um, what was the comments? Uh, the contribution to risk of comets. Oh yeah, yeah. So we we our model only considered the JFC Jupiter family comets, although uh, uh, or small perihelion, uh, small or low pe period, short period comets. So we don't actually count for the long period comets at all, and and that's that has been uh, the reason behind that is is that the, the risk from long period comets has been substantially smaller than from anything else so until the risk is retired quite substantially the long period comets won't make a difference most of the risk will come from elsewhere well, good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you may be thank you for uh, joining us uh, uh, for this panel uh, the Planetary Defense Conference. Our panel will be discussing a proposal for an international year of planetary defense. We are going to start with a couple of presentation and then we will open it for a good period for questions and answer. So first, let me uh, present myself. My name is Doris Dow. I'm a program scientist in the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters and a member of the Planetary Defense Coordinating office. Uh, I would like to introduce you to my panelists. Uh, I'm going to start in alphabetical order, if you don't mind. So first, we have uh, Sergio Camanco, uh, who is the Secretary General of the Regional Center for Space and Technology Education for Latin America and the Caribbean. And then we have Kevin Covender, who is the director of the International Astronomical Union Office of Astronomy for Development in Cape Town. Uh, then we have Romana Koffler, who is the program officer for the Committee of Policy and Legal Affairs section uh, for the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. And uh, uh, finally, definitely not least, uh, Pedro Russo, who is the global coordinator of the International Year of Astronomy and a university professor of astronomy and society at Leiden University. So uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this. I think uh, we will start with uh, each one of you just giving us uh, a, a small uh, introduction, and then we will pass on to Pedro and Kevin's presentation. So uh, I'll first, uh, uh, Sergio, if you'd like to uh, give us a few points. Oh, I don't want to get ahead of everything, yeah, but I guess as an introduction, I would say that I think it's uh, a, a very achievable goal. We have examples from the past, uh, an example in which the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Water Space was involved with the International Space Year, ISY, in, in 92. And there was a procedure of how it was presented and eventually how it was endorsed by the General Assembly. And I believe that uh, it 
pretty much sets a road that we could follow. It's not the only road that we can follow, but it, it, it is something that is very doable. And I'll reserve specific points for a little bit later after, you know, after the presentations, or I'll wait to see also uh, the guidelines that Romano is going to present. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And speaking of the guidelines, Romano. Yes, thank you very much, Doris, and uh, welcome everyone to this panel. Um, so I will just briefly um, speak about the guidelines that were uh, shared with us with the Department of General Assembly uh, Conferences Department. Uh, I will go mo into more detail once we also hear the presentation uh, by our uh, distinguished colleagues. Uh, but just to let you know, so international years and observances um, are usually um, um, proclaimed uh, by the General Assembly upon submission of a proposal by a member state of the United Nations or a group of member states. And uh, in terms of timelines, um, this process uh, is usually um, taken up at least a year before the actual proclamation of that year. Uh, and it is advisable uh, in the criteria and guidelines for, for pre preparation of such an international year uh, to have um, the organization in place at least uh, two years in advance. So that's just in short from, from my side, and uh, I'll be glad to hear the good practices that um, were in place during International Year of Astronomy, and then I will, I will make some further points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romana. And now we'll move on to the presentation that you all heard of. <laughs> the International Year for Astronomy it will be given by Kevin Carpenter and Petro Rousseau. Let me share my, uh, let me see. I hope that you can hear me well and you can see my slides. My, my name is Pedro Russo, and I will share this presentation with Kevin, my colleague, and also he's been uh, not only a colleague, but also a friend, a friendship that started back in 2009. So I'm really, really happy to be back and talk about the project that brought us together and especially giving this talk together. Like Doris mentioned, uh, I was the international coordinator for the International Year of Astronomy, and I'll give just a very, very brief overview of the process. What was the process for us and what were pretty much the foundations that we used when we decided to implement and really to run this project. As you can see already from this slide, it was a partnership uh, between UNESCO and the International Astronomical Union. And that was a key aspect of the International Year of Astronomy. And uh, the International Year of Astronomy was really a global celebration of astronomy. In 2009, we're celebrating the 400 years of the use of the telescope for the first time by Galileo Galilei. That was a milestone in terms of how we changed the way that we start doing or we were doing astronomy. We can almost say that is the beginning of modern astronomy. And in 2009, since we're celebrating these 400 years, we decided to celebrate International Year of Astronomy. It was a truly global effort. We had uh, we, more than 148 countries involved. Uh, so we had activities at least 148 different countries. We had more than 40 international organizations uh, like the European Space Agency uh, and many others, and we run more than 20, 28 global projects. At the time, and even now, I think we can keep saying that this was most probably the largest network in science, a network of different countries all around the world celebrating one event under one mission and one vision. So this, this celebration was really so a massive effort from many, many colleagues from all around the world and included several different types of activities. It was decided from the beginning that this would be a celebration for the public and with the public. So it was uh, that we had a lot of scientific activities around the International of Astronomy but the main core aspect of the International of Astronomy was the public participation and the activities that were completely designed to engage with the public. That was something that the IAU, together with UNESCO, the International Astronomical Union, with UNESCO decided. I can just suggest some, uh, some impressions from a room full of people at the opening of the International of Astronomy back in 2009 at UNESCO headquarters. Uh, you can see, for example, the uh, opening event in Spain that brought together classical music with astronomy. 
uh, we had several different types of public events like uh, stargazing observations from all around the world. We had uh, a lot of different cultural manifestations from theaters, documentaries, um, pieces of music that were developed specific for the interest of astronomy and many, many, many activities, some of them traditional, some of them not so traditional around the world, like this exhibition in the UK. At the end of the project, and this uh, it's a fantastic number, 50% uh, of the reports, and we only received 50% of reports from the 148 countries, they show that we engaged, or at least we reached more the, than 800 million people worldwide. This is a fantastic number and makes not only me, but my colleagues and especially all the astronomy community very, very proud of this International Year of Astronomy. Now, how, what was our roadmap? And I hope that this fits what Romana was mentioning in the beginning. So the whole project actually started in 2003. That was the first time that we had this idea to celebrate the International Year of Astronomy. It was back in 2003. At the time, IAU president, the um, Italian astronomer, uh, Franco Pacini had this idea to celebrate in 2009 this, this uh, use of the telescope by Galileo. At the time, there was an, a resolution by the IU to celebrate 2009 International Year of Astronomy. In 2005, through the work of the Italian delegation at UNESCO, there was the endorsement from UNESCO for the International Year of Astronomy. And at this stage, the rationale and the vision of the, the program was defined. In 2006, there was an establishment of a working group around the 11 people that became kind of the steering committee for the rest of the activities. 2006, 2007 were a lot of preparations and simple things like designing the logo, but also defining the projects that we're going to do, what kind of cornerstone projects we're going to have, what kind of global celebrations we're going to have. In 2007, there were two important meetings where we invited the community from uh, astronomers, communicators, and even amateur astronomers to come together in two meetings. And uh, the first meeting with around 100 people and the second one with 400 people in Athens that came together to decide and to, to really uh, uh, decide what we should be doing in 2009. Back in July 2007, so one year and a half before the beginning of the International Year of Astronomy, we established a full-time uh, office for the coordination, the global coordination of the International Year of Astronomy. And that's where I started my job, July 2007. This was established at the European Southern Observatory. At the time, the IU president, uh, Catherine Cesarski, was the director general of ESO, and that was the reason why the uh, headquarters of the International Year of Astronomy were established at, e at ESO. And then that was really the central hub for all the activities for the International Year of Astronomy. Then in 2007, December, late 2007, we had the final United Nations proclamation at the General Assembly. So a bit more than one year before the beginning of the International Year of Astronomy. 2008 preparation, establishing national nodes, establishing projects, started really developing all the ideas and preparing for the full implementation in 2009. When we look back, I think we can think about some of the the recipe, what were the main ingredients for the success of this project? I think we have a, a very good concept, you know, 400 years of using the telescope for the first time, you know, and, I, and, and uh, something that changed dramatically the way that we did astronomy. We had a very strong case. We had the, the Italian UNESCO delegation and also the Italian delegation to United Nations putting together a very strong case, working with European partners and other partners around the world to really get the first recommendation by UNESCO, UN body recommendation, and then the final proclamation. We also had the global community. Uh, at the time, the International Astronomical Union already had around 95 member uh, states connected with the IEU. Uh, so there was already a global, a global participation. And we, I think we managed to really bring the enthusiasm, engagement at all different levels from amateur astronomers all the way to professional astronomers and then they start developing exciting activities. We are talking about 2008 and 2009, uh, one of the major crises of the, the, the last decades in terms of financial crisis. So funding was problematic. We did manage to raise some funds to establish the 
central coordination to run some projects, but we know that many countries around the world struggle to get the necessary resources to really have the implementation that they were wishing for. In terms of coordination, I think it's important to, to think that to, we are trying to coordinate by supporting, not controlling. We never control the use of logos, the brand. We were very much trying to act as catalysts and facilitators of the activities. And I think the most important is really providing a framework for people to work with. And that was, I think, key. We never try to control any type of activity by the, the individual or even by the countries. We're really there as a coordination to support the activities. I think we can almost think about it as a franchising approach, really. Providing central coordination, share a common branding, common goals, share resources, and also provide some seed funding, especially for the cornerstone projects, for the global projects. And we're not talking a lot of a lot of money, really very seed funding that then enable them to go out and look for my, more funding and raise more resources. All these findings are available on this final report. We published two. We have one that is uh, complete. It's almost uh, 2,000 pages that you can find on the International Year of Astronomy uh, website. And we also have a short executive summary that I think really provides the, the not only all this background of the activities that we did, but also a lot of reports from country by country of what the countries did. And it's quite impressive to see the diversity and the, how rich these activities were. Uh, these are some of the, the main partners. The website is still up and running, so you can go there, see what was done. You can download the reports and um, and all the information and the, even this presentation is available there. So you can go there and, and check for, for more information. An important aspect, and then I'll ask Kevin to take over, is that even already in 2009, we already were thinking, oops, we're already thinking about what will come next? What was the beyond international of astronomy? So, Kevin, I think it's a uh, now it's your turn to to really tell us what came next. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. And uh, uh, you know, I think. Uh, uh, um, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think there's something okay, with cool. the presentation, but uh... no, it's cool. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe before we get to these slides, oh, is it going on? <laughs> yeah, it's going on automatically, so I'm going to do something very quickly, but keep, keep, okay, so, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, um, maybe just as an overview, you know, uh, uh, um, I think one of the strengths of the International Year of Astronomy was looking not just, uh, you know, up to and including that international year, but what happens beyond and, uh, uh, um, you know, the events that Pedro just described, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, um, Doris mentioned at the beginning, I think Pedro is is the real giant that managed to pull together this massive uh, uh, um, um, global global community together. And astronomy uh, um, uh, has has that pull, you know, there's there, there's not just the astronomers in the in the community. But there's also the the amateur astronomers, the enthusiasts. There's so many people beyond the professional astronomers, and I think uh, you know. I sometimes say this to people. I think I think the astronomers were the ones that might have been most surprised at how big this actually was, because it really pulled together people from all across the world, and uh, um, and not just from the astronomy field. You know, you had uh, 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 you you have uh, uh, people who are excited about astronomy in every other field. And so in 2009, um, next slide, Pedro, in 2009, the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, put together a strategic plan for the decade beyond the International Year of Astronomy from 2010 to 2020. And uh, uh, a core part of this was, well, we've seen now that, you know, astronomy is bigger than astronomers. Astronomy is something that 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 attracts people. It's something that has the potential to connect different aspects of this field. And this uh, the circle on the cover of that strategic plan, you know, uh, um, 
I tried to express that astronomy links to technology, it links to different science aspects, and but it also links to culture and society. And having all these, these different connections uh, uh, makes this a special field that can be used, that can be used to impact the world more broadly. And so based on this strategic plan and a plan that comes, uh, that, that, that came after, so, so the current strategic plan uh, 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 is from 2020 to 2030, which builds on all the, all the lessons that we've learned over the last decade. Based on this, the IEU established offices, and those offices are what kept the legacy of the International Year of Astronomy. So this is an extract from the current strategic plan. This is the current situation. Now, this has evolved over the last decade, but, but we currently now have four offices of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, the main office that helped, helped to sustain the momentum of the International Year of Astronomy was the Office for Astronomy Outreach that you see on the bottom left. That office was established in Japan and basically uh, um, maintained the networks that were developed during the International Year of Astronomy. Um, uh, um, our office here, here, here in Cape Town was about looking at taking all these aspects of astronomy and seeing how it can impact on development, impact on society beyond just uh, uh, the inspiration aspects and the the outreach aspects, but also what can astronomy and the tools that we use within astronomy, how can that be used for development? Uh, uh, um, now, uh, um, the two other offices uh, focus, uh, um, the one based in Germany now is the Office of Astronomy for Education and on the top left, that focuses on uh, uh, on astronomy education, on looking at school level, how do you use astronomy to inspire STEM education? Uh, um, and the Office for Young Astronomers looks at university level. So with these 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 four offices, we 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 sort of said, okay, let's let's see beyond the International Year of Astronomy, we've got this this global community. What are their interests? What are the aspects that we need to, to focus on? And these are what came out over, over the, the years following the International Year of Astronomy. So next slide. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, uh, um, you know, and something that an International Year for Planetary Defense should also consider is what are the structures in place afterwards? Now, what you see on this map are uh, uh, the four offices that I just mentioned of the International Astronomical Union, as well as regional offices of astronomy for development. Now, that's uh, uh, um, those are all offices that are established in partnership with the IAU, and each of those offices has at least one full-time staff member. And those regional offices coordinate regional activities within either a geographic region or a culture or language region. Now, each of these offices, so I'm, I'm gonna show you in, in the next slide, uh, um, uh, um, just, a, just a brief picture of the projects that we've funded over the, uh, over the years since, since 2013. Uh, uh, the Office of Astronomy for Development was, was established in 2011 and, uh, um, and one of the biggest aspects of the work was to uh, uh, was to fund projects that come from anyone anywhere in the world. This annual call for proposals has built up a community uh, um, right across the world that engages with astronomy and looks at using astronomy for development. Now, this is just our office, which is focused on development. There's a similar map for the Office for Astronomy Outreach. There's a similar map for the Office of Astronomy for Education and a similar map for the Office for Young Astronomers. Each of these offices focus on different aspects, uh, uh, public, school level, research level, and general societal development. Those are the four aspects. And building up this network and maintaining this network has enabled us to sustain the legacy uh, um, that was built uh, um, after the International Year of Astronomy. So uh, this has also enabled us, the next, the last slide, uh, in 2019, uh, um, when it was the 100th anniversary of the International Astronomical Union, 
we were able to use these networks across the world. And these are the same networks that, uh, that were built during the International Year of Astronomy. Um, we, could, we could tap into these networks. 10 years after the International Year of Astronomy, we could tap into these networks and say, right, it's time for the, for the next big celebration. This is 100 years of the International Astronomical Union. And so, uh, uh, and so there were a huge number of events during during 2019 and now that that community is sustained through these uh, four offices of the international astronomical union and uh, um, and we can tap into this uh, uh, for bigger events in future so maybe you can stop sharing Pedro, and i'll just end uh, just with a comment uh, uh, um, you know when we uh, uh, um, when i was preparing for this meeting, you know, and I looked looked up the world of of planetary defense. I mean, you guys are sitting on a gold mine here, right? You know, there's there's really it's a it's a fascinating field, and it's something that ha it really has the potential of bringing people together. You know, the way that we managed to do with the International Year of Astronomy. You know, imagine there's an asteroid heading towards Earth. You know, what better way to bring society together? Um, but we are, of course, in a different time from the International Year of Astronomy. Uh, one would have thought that the pandemic would have brought people together. And we see, you know, issues of misinformation. We see, uh, you know, people uh, uh, um, spreading fear and panic and so on. And so these are sort of uh, um, the different things that one would have to take into account with this International Year. But I'll stop there with that, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll hand it back to Doris. Well, thank you, thank you all so much. This is really very compelling presentation, and but I'm biased. <laughs> no pun intended. Well, uh, first, uh, uh, waiting for questions from our audience, I would like to ask the other panelists about their thoughts and if they have questions directed to you guys regarding the IYA uh, work. And then I'll take it to the questions from uh, the audience. So uh, first I'm gonna ask Sergio and uh, Romana if they have any questions. Sergio, you wanna go ahead? You're, you're... Please, and then I'll follow. Okay. Um, let's see. I did have a question while watching the the uh, presentation. Uh, who made the proposal to? Um, I guess this was done through UNESCO. And who made the proposal? Was it? Uh, an organization or was it a country? Maybe I can, Kevin might be able to answer as well, but may I'll be happy to answer. So this was, was done by the Italian delegation at UNESCO and also the Italian delegation then through the ambassador of Italy at UNESCO. And uh, uh, also then the whole, the whole um, process at the United Nations was also in a way led by the Italian delegation, but in close collaboration with the IAU. Uh, back in the beginning, when the whole process started, the president of the IU was an Italian astronomer that I think that helped a lot with the relationships. Uh, but also then with for the United Nations engagement, uh, especially with the General Assembly, the IU and including Kevin was deeply involved in the lobbying activities. But let's say the, the political side of the, the, the process was always led by the Italian delegations. Okay, now yeah, I can just uh, I can just add brief that I was going to say that clarifies one of the points that in the, in the guidelines that Romana uh, indicated. Uh, he said that uh, international years are proposed by member states or a group of member states. And one of the things to keep in mind in the UN, it's member states. It's not committees. So the committee use water space cannot bring it up to um, to the department of the GA and make the proposal. 
the committee COPUS can endorse the proposal that's made by anybody. It could be member states or it could be um, bodies. But it should be member states, which as we go forward, we should keep keep in mind and start uh, having champions that bring this up in the in the community and eventually are willing to go forward and make the proposal. Thank you, Pedro. Yes. Um, yes, from my side, thank you both. Very inspirational. Uh, this is a, a really uh, good to hear that, you know, you've already been, uh, you've already developed the 2020, 2030 plan. So I was actually, when I was listening to your presentation, I was uh, looking at the guidelines uh, for international years and observances, and obviously you, you have done a, a very good job uh, because the guidelines, as I say, and this resolution goes back to 1980s, but in the annex there are certain criteria uh, and procedures that are defined for uh, starting to prepare an international observance. As Sergio mentioned, uh, we have the Committee on the Peace with Outer Space with 95 uh, member states. Uh, at the moment, and around 40, 42 observers, which are permanent um, permanent observers, NGOs and IGOs. Um, the, the committee, uh, its scientific and technical subcommittee has an agenda item on nearest objects, which is a dedicated agenda item to this topic. So that will be a really good venue once um, the proposal gets a bit further uh, for, for member states and, and permanent observers to discuss this idea. Uh, then secondly, um, so there are certain criteria uh, among them, as you mentioned, it's really important to demonstrate when preparing for such a, a campaign to demonstrate uh, world uh, global benefits. So that really uh, such a, a, an observance would, would bring um, certain benefits, not only to a specific region, but really globally. And obviously we say that nearest object impact hazard is uh, it can be a, a global issue, and uh, we're already at a very good starting point there. Also, yesterday, for example, we heard a really good um, panel on communicating NEOS about NEOS and uh, of demystifying um, uh, this subject. And you know, uh, I, I really appreciated uh, Catherine Rowan saying, "Well, it's about talking about it, but not only you know uh, in this uh, intergovernmental bodies." But also, you know, everywhere uh, in churches, in, in the, on the markets. Uh, so it's the importance of storytelling, and the importance of also, uh, you know, storytelling uh, that is real and uh, authentic. So I think this kind of year of planetary defense uh, could could have, you know, certain certain goals in that direction. Then obviously there are certain uh, procedures as as you have uh, followed them. So basically defining uh, the basic objectives of this year. Uh, as I said, there should be at least two years between the proclamation and the beginning of that year. So after the proclamation, obviously the the procedures uh, start to, um, to to being developed. Um, it's very important that these activities are brought to national levels so that you have certain national committees. Um, as you both pointed out, you provided a framework, you provided sort of um, a branding, but you really let um, then, you know, that this um, nuances to be developed uh, at the national levels. And I think that's, that's a very good um, uh, starting point. Um, yeah, so, and then of course, um, the criteria uh, and, and guidelines in this resolution also speak about the evaluation and the follow-up. And you have presented very clearly that you already, as I said, in 2020, 2030 uh, follow up plan. Uh, so that's a really uh, good um, aspect to look up to. So that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions uh, from uh, for you, Kevin and uh, Pedro. Uh, it started obviously when Kevin, thank you for telling us that we're sitting on a gold mine. I, I happen to agree, <laughs> but I wanted to know if in your opinion, and I want both of you to have a chance to answer if, uh, if we go through with, the uh, IYPD, um, 
Uh, are there any efforts as a result of IYA that on a global level, uh, various countries can leverage over? Uh, or do you think, uh, I mean, basically, I I'm wondering is uh, countries around the world can leverage over their efforts for IYA or what the IAU created for that? So uh, what are your thoughts? Do I start, Kevin? You want to go first, Pedro? Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, I'll start. Uh, you, can, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, just to say, you know, uh, um, everything that we've shown in terms of the networks and so on, they would all be activated for an IYPD because, you know, when you talk about planetary defense, this is this is astronomy. You know, uh, 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 it's close enough related that uh, uh, that it's uh, similar networks that would get excited about this. I mean, in a way, it's sort of bringing astronomy down to earth, but not in a good way. Uh, um, and 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 I think that uh, um, so so in terms of who we could we could access, uh, um, we could use all these. All these different networks. Yeah, I, I also agree. I think that the, um, the astronomy communication community, which is actually a quite large community, as you know, Doris, we we even we're going to have a conference very soon, but it's a, a community that brings easily together around 500 people from all around the world in a in a conference called Communicating Astronomy with a Public Conference. And uh, so there's thousands of people that uh, work in communicating astronomy with the public. And I, I keep saying that uh, in terms of the, the topics, astronomy, space, uh, planetary defense are topics for the general public are the same, they're similar, it's very similar. And I think we should work together. So I think there's a massive network already out there that you can use and leverage and work with them to really do a proper implementation of an international year like this one that you are now planning. So I think the community is there, is ready, it knows how to do it, and will be excited enough to work together with the, with the leadership to really make this international year a successful one. Well, thank you. And actually, just a, a follow up. Uh, you mentioned the communicating astronomy with the public. Uh, would one of you be able to put the URL in the chat for uh, the communicators who are in this audience and do not know about this conference? Uh, it, uh, you know, the abstract submission deadline obviously has passed, but uh, living in a virtual world, there's always an option of at least looking at the uh, uh, presentations or videos or uh, posters. And I do have a comment here uh, from uh, uh, Brent Barbie. Um, he says, I also liked the gold mine comment. It's a great observation, and it certainly does seem that asteroid threat and opportunities could be uniting. But as was pointed out, other things that seem to be of a similar character end up not being uniting or even becoming divisive. What can we learn from those other things and apply here? Basically, what are the lesson learns of specific uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, things that we should avoid? Yes, Kip. Should I? Uh, um, yeah, I think w one of the one of the things, and maybe this also builds on your previous question, Doris, is that can the whole world own something? Can the whole world own not just uh, the uh, you know an idea like defending the earth, but also own responsibility? Because uh, you know when we you know, if we had to look at something like the pandemic, you know, are all countries participating in fighting the pandemic? Or are some countries, you know, sort of dominating the fight against COVID uh, 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 and all the vaccines are being produced in one part of the world and others have to rely on, on that part of the world? So how can we, you know, if we talk about planetary defense, how can how can we get the whole world to own it? And maybe that comes in the form of, you know, small telescopes in every country around the world that contributes some some observations, uh, um, or or maybe it can be in the form of um, I don't know global global competitions for 
what do we do about an asteroid if something is coming towards us? You know, uh, uh, just ways of, of, of making this something that is not dominated by the, by the traditional North or West or however you want to call it, but something that really belongs to everyone, that it's everyone's, it's in everyone's interests, but we do it as partners, not, uh, you know, not some being followers and some being leaders. Petra, do you have anything to add? No, not really. I think Kevin yes. <laughs> approaches really nicely. <laughs> yes, I, I completely agree. And obviously that's well explained in the IYA module, right? At the universe is yours to discover. It's everybody's, uh, not just the one uh, group. Uh, any other questions? Doris, if I may, just a, a small comment um, on the gold mine, and uh, I think also the timing is really um, uh, quite works to our advantage um, because of Apophis, and actually Apophis is is connecting the community, the 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 I I I mean the International Leader of Astronomy that looks up uh, because Apophis will be will be uh, visible with the naked eye apparently in 2029. Um, and um, that is basically a really good campaign to, to first of all, demystify the topic, but also, you know, bring in that, uh, this example that, um, yes, there will be a, a large uh, asteroid making a close approach to Earth. Yes, I've listened to previous presentation about uh, Apophis uh, saying there were 10 million clone orbits uh, checked for Earth impact and that was excluded. So this kind of, uh, you know, information really to be spread among um, uh, globally, also through the help of the existing network, as you mentioned. So actually really uh, joining forces. Uh, I see a lot of uh, benefit in that. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Bill. I just had one, one little note. I, we got a note from uh, the uh, IAU that the uh, IAU General Assembly Symposium number 374. The title of that is going to be Astronomical Hazards for Life on Earth, and it's going to be in uh, August of 2022. And some of the uh, some of the program topics will be planetary ha planetary hazards, asteroids and comet impacts, rogue planets, things like that, uh, terrestrial hazards, Earth magnetic fields, and things. So again, that seems to be quite relevant and would fit very nicely into any kind of program. And Doris, if I may. Yes. Yes, please. I, I agree with. I think I said I think good to begin thinking about specific objectives that can start uh, being put forward. Yeah, something, uh, some of the things like raising awareness of the issue itself and the, uh, not just raising awareness, but ensure, uh, ensuring that it's handled properly so people don't get scared. People do get scared if they think there's an asteroid that could destroy their entire city. So there are many issues that, that need to be to be thought about in under raising awareness. We should also start thinking about uh, one of the values would be to promote the establishment of uh, disaster management protocols in uh, countries, particularly in developing countries. And that will require some capacity development. So those that have experience with developing these protocols can, can, pass, the, can pass it on. And I mean, there should be an emphasis on, from my point of view, I want should be the trusted source of information on um, what is what is the real possibility of any asteroid near to hit the Earth and damage, create damage, and so on. Yeah, but th we need to work on that for sure. But there should be also a network in every country that they have a national trusted source of information that ideally would be linked to Y1. But it is, 
it's good to ha have it nationally because of the language. Um, news media are going to go to experts in their local language, preferably in their country, but at least well, where they can communicate easily. So these are some of some of the things that I I believe that the uh, we as a community should be thinking about establishing objectives so that eventually some of these are presented to the GA with those guidelines that Romana presented. And one of, one of the things that she mentioned was demonstrate global benefit. So we need to we need to start working on some of those issues and eventually distill them down to a punchy type of presentation that can be the, um, presented to the um, uh, I forgot the name in the, it's the department on the GA that approves the um, the international years. And I will I will stop there, but I think it, it, it's necessary to start doing some of the work. Yes. Thank you. I th thank you. I, I think there has been uh, in the comments uh, a lot of agreement, uh, actually more than questions. Obviously, there was the agreement that we do have about three potential opportunities where the close approach would be visible uh, with with a telescope. And that brings to mind, for example, the Galileo scope uh, effort that was done for the International Year for Astronomy. Uh, there was also uh, questions about, you know, uh, uh, demystifying things, you know, comments about how it is very important to demystify uh, uh, NEOs, near Earth uh, objects, uh, potentially hazardous objects and such. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, a comment about how, uh, let me see, I'm trying to go. There were a lot of comments about uh, gold mines and mining for gold, but I don't think this is uh, 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 <laughs> 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 I'm going to keep this to myself, but, <laughs> but uh, 1 of the things, obviously, uh, a lot of people uh, agreed uh, and really are. Uh, I can't find my word now uh, in agreement of the uh, your comments also Sergio about uh, it's very important that each country has their own representative uh, happening with their own language, their own effort. They know where to go. Um, there was a question about also uh, recalling the effort that was done with the, the international uh, uh, year of uh, Earth and and uh, IGY as well. Uh, th there were all comments actually in agreement and encouragement, but I have not seen any questions. So uh, we still have about ten minutes. Uh, if there is any uh, questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, uh, they, the, also, there's agreement that having a 2 year time frame would be advisable as Romana mentioned, you know, from the time, uh, uh, we, uh, it is declared to the time, uh, that will happen. Um, uh, yeah, I have a I, question then to, I, yes, to our distinguished oh, colleagues. Sorry that led the International Year of Astronomy. Um, sure. From the financing perspective, um, because, uh, you know, with the UN Secretariat, um, we are always, uh, we stick to, the, to, to zero um, budget growth. Uh, and obviously any declaration of an international observance um, is conditioned by not having any uh, additional uh, financial burden on the organizations. So how was that handled? Uh, from from your side, you said that you had some seed money available for certain uh, national campaigns. But if you can just uh, explain a bit more, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I can. I, I think I can expand a bit on that. And the whole, let's say, uh, administration and financial structure for the International Astronomy was managed by the International Astronomical Union, 
uh, with headquarters in Paris. And that was the, the body that pretty much managed all the finances and all, all the different legal aspects, always in close collaboration with UNESCO. But there was this the international body, so the International Astronomical Union, which is a very small organization in terms of the, the number of people working in the headquarters. I think at the moment must be two people, three people working there, but they were doing the, the let's say, the administrative management of the organization. The costs, and that includes three people, two people working full time, travel costs, development costs, you know, websites, identity, seed funding for all the cornerstones. The global budget for the International of Astronomy for a period of three years since the preparation, implementation, and then evaluation was around 800,000 euros, less than 1 million at the time. So it was kind of a medium, small operation for an international year, but that were the, the total budget for running the central coordination. Some countries, UK, United States, and some others had bigger budgets to implement the project locally than what we had to coordinate the project globally. But that's also normal, right? Because we are just really providing guidelines, resources, ideas, and of course, people working in the field, they, they had different needs and sometimes uh, bigger budgets to, to implement the project. And where did the money come from? Who provided the funding? That's a very good question, Sergio. And most of the, the let's say, most of the funding coming to the central coordination was provided by national and international astronomy institutes organizations. Sometimes even small institutes provided, you no, know, of the order of magnitude, five, six thousand euros. And then putting all these resources together, we managed to get actually a, a, a considerable amount was a big effort raising these small amounts of money, but actually enable us to implement the project. But we had some organizations giving a bit more resources if they could. Uh, for example, the National Astronomic Observatory of uh, Japan was very nicely. They provide quite a lot of resources, but our organizations provided less. But it was all raised within the community, most of it. Um, and like I said, 2008, 2009, financial crisis, we never, we didn't manage to engage with a lot of uh, private donors or companies. We had some sponsorship, uh, but not a lot. I also would like to add to that on the small national levels. Uh, I was truly uh, pleased, surprised, and amazed at the creativity of uh, certain nodes. And sometimes one hears from villages, honestly, who had an event. Uh, so as far as specific national efforts, uh, I personally don't think I ever worried that there will not be enough engagement because of uh, just the creativity on finding funding. So, uh, you know, if, if Boudreau, if it's not too difficult, you put the page of logos, there were obviously the top ones who put in, uh, you know, enough funding, whether on a national or global level, but that's by no mean, it's at the tip of the iceberg, represents the small, uh, uh, really collective, you know, uh, neighborly efforts that one saw in certain uh, countries and, and even villages. So, and that is not to be discounted, uh, I, I personally believe. And maybe I can, I can add to that, Doris, because we, we saw a large engagement with the amateur astronomers. I think we were very pleased that we had a massive community of amateur astronomers. They really embraced the project like no one. They really were their project, so they were part of our community, and that was very important. Even if the IU is the body for internet for professional astronomers, from the beginning was decided, no, the amateurs are our partners. And of course, there's a large number of amateur astronomers that can really go out, put the telescopes out, and really engage with the public, and that was really, really important. I think Kevin wants to add. Yeah, I just wanted to add on the funding, uh, you know, the thing about IYPD is that, uh, uh, you know, the space sector is way bigger than the astronomy in terms of just having having money, money available. Uh, uh, um, and 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 it could be, you know, uh, it could be seen that an IYPD is is an opportunity 
to to sort of promote and justify the space industry. So you could get a lot of support from you know, uh, you know private space sector and so on, where there's probably lots of money. Thank you, thank you. That's true. Uh, any, I, I see a lot of comments now uh, talking about potential 2029, the year uh, that should be uh, uh, sh should be potentially IYPD, especially as you may have heard the, the session before. Uh, if you attended the session just before us, uh, it's the year of close up, uh, closest approach of uh, of office. So. Uh, definitely, there's interest in our uh, audience here for what we're talking about. Um, again, opening it back question. Uh, planetary defense is an intergenerational activity. It is important to include the next generation at the earliest. It would be great if some time could be made available on robotic telescopes worldwide for use by school students to work on their project in mentorship with astronomers. At present, few such avenues exist. Well, it wasn't a question, but it was a comment, but do you have any thoughts? Uh, maybe I can just say that we have a few projects dealing with robotic telescopes in the astronomy world, uh, where we try to get universities to use, to use robotic telescopes. Uh, uh, um, to train people uh, uh, um, at the university. So one is a is a project called called Astrolab, and I can I can put a link there. Yes, please. Thank you, Kevin. Well, I think uh, this question is perfect for our final deliberation. Uh, this uh, question comes from uh, Terry Daly, and he says. What sort of things can attendees at this conference do to help bring the idea of an inter international year of planetary defense to fruition? And I'm gonna give each one of my, my panelists a chance to answer this. Kevin, you're on my big screen now. Can you please start? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, 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 sorry, I was looking for the link and I and I lost focus oh. a little bit. But uh, then, in terms of what what can people do, uh, um, yeah. so so you know one of the biggest aspects of getting a year declared was the lobbying and uh, you know getting member states on board. And as Sergio said, you know it, it's it, it's really about about the countries. The UN is made up of the member states. Uh, for the International Year of Astronomy, we reached out to the ambassadors uh, 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 um, in several African countries, and a lot of the a lot of the questions that th that came about is, you know, wh what 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 does this year mean for us? Uh, um, many of the of the countries uh, uh, you know would vote for or against something based on their relationships with, with with other countries so having someone who's experienced with sort of politics and lobbying helps a lot um, we were lucky to have klaus madsen from eso uh, uh, um, who guided this whole thing but uh, um, a very uh, so a thought that came to me based on what sergio was saying uh, um, for the iypd in terms of what it means, you know, when we talk about about disaster risk management, we need disaster risk management. We need plans for for disaster mitigation because we're probably going to face more challenges in terms of climate change before an asteroid actually hits us. But the the rallying call for an IYPD could be about the fragility of our planet and the importance for governments and people to invest in uh, um, in in disaster risk risk mitigation, and that could be sort of a hook or a pivot that that can be used. Uh, and so, in terms of what people can do, is to think of all these these different things. What 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 does your country uh, uh, you know focus on, or what what are what are the the sort of big issues in your country and 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 make a collection of all those reasons for having an IYPD because that will help when you when you lobby at the UN. Uh, Petro, would you like to answer also 
No, but just maybe to complement what Kevin said, I think it's uh, to, uh, at the national level, I think the colleagues can really start thinking about who are the main stakeholders and key players within their country, trying to really already bring them together, starting discussing, start thinking about sev several approaches, because uh, as soon as the global coordination is ready to activate them, they need to gonna go and lobbying at the countries, but they also need to think about what kind of activities they would like to have. So I think it's already it's a good time for the different colleagues in the different countries to start thinking, who are, who do we want to bring uh, on board to this as soon as possible? Because then lobbying at the country level is going to be very important. You need to convince your countries that yes, this is something that needs to be endorsed. This is something that needs to be done. Thank you, Romana. Thank you, Doris. Well, I think um, this, this is actually the first time that this idea was presented to this wider audience. Uh, we have discussed it within the International Asteroid Warning Networks meetings. Uh, so I think the conference, the Planetary Defense Conference, is known to come up with certain recommendations. Like in 2019, there were certain recommendations on the Apophis observation campaign, her dark mission support, and so forth. So I think this would be a good start uh, for the conference actually to um put together such a recommendation and then it can be uh brought uh to to the attention of further yeah thank you romana that's you yes and i i fully agree with um what kevin uh presented we need to get some hooks that uh go beyond just the neo aspect but, well, concentrating on the new aspect because that's uh, the year that we're going to to try to get a, a planetary defense um, year. And uh, following up on what Romana said, I was thinking all, also along along the same lines, but um, the planetary defense conference now is in the seventh. So it has created a an awareness throughout throughout the years and has made presentations. The presentations of its works have been made to the committee, to the scientific and technical subcommittee. And I think it, it would be good if the Planetary Defense Conference itself became one of the bodies that recommends the a planetary defense. International year should uh, be agreed upon and offers to uh, participate in the organizing committee of eventually there should be an organizing committee. And I think the uh, planetary defense conference should be represented in it. They have, they have broad experience over these now completed seven conferences for the range of actors that they know and issues and they could distill that as well for uh, presentations that will be made to the scientific and technical subcommittee in the coming years but to start uh, being identified as one of the entities that is supporting the um, declaration of the year thank you Thank you. Thank you all for uh, the wonderful conversation. It really is a, a very compelling. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm already there. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, thank you uh, for taking the time, letting us know about the past and looking into the future. Yes, there are a couple of conference chairs who've done heroic work. First is Brent, and I think Brent has done just a fabulous job in organizing the sessions and Brent pulling those things together, working with the session chairs to make sure that all came in smoothly. And again, I think Brent, you've just done a great job. So thank you very much for that. And um, and also, um, you know, we've had some really creative people. Uh, I think Alex has done a nice job running these polls, which is something we he suggested and thought might be something to try. And I think it's been a very useful experience for us. And, um, you know, we've tried to capture all of these things. And again, I heard the comments about, well, you know, it's not you know, how, how the polling and you should do better polling and such. I think it's a way that we finally found that this kind of thing can work for us. And I think we'll try to do a better job and maybe elicit the help of some of the professional polling people to do <laughs> to, to, to make that work better next time. So it's a nice opportunity. So that's been very good. 
And then each of us has, each of the chairs has been very good. Nahum and Gerhard have, have uh, led sessions and so forth and have played key roles in the background. So we appreciate all of that. And then, of course, we had a pretty strong organizing committee, which has helped put together this particular thing. And um, and so we have about 50 people on the organizing committee, and they've been very active and provide good suggestions as we've moved along on that. And then, of course, we couldn't do it without our sponsor support. So we really appreciate uh, their help as well. Uh, one thing that you uh, are aware of, and we were hoping to have at this particular conference was a, this this video uh, that was put together by IMAX so supporting planetary defense. That mo that video is called uh, the movie is actually called Asteroid Hunters. Uh, I've, as a few of us, a few of us have seen that and participated in development of that movie. Uh, it's going to be really something to see, and I think when that starts hitting, if people start seeing that, they'll really understand why we're doing what we're doing. It basically follows the exercises that we've been running in our in our uh, in our conferences, and uh, I think Phil Groves has just done a great job in pulling that together, and I think you'll enjoy it when you get a chance to see it. About 40 minutes long. It's not a huge long movie, but it's a very very good and uh, for what we're trying to do here. Okay, a few uh, other uh, announcements. Let's see. Uh, we've had about um, uh, 700 actual participants in this. That's individual people who've logged in. Uh, and I think that's really good. We've been averaging between two and 350 or so people uh, at every meeting, which is good. Right now we're about 184, I show, but that's pretty, that's all very good. Um, and I think that's one value of these virtual conferences. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and just every all all of those 700 people will be seeing receiving a certificate of attendance from the from the conference. So you'll have something you can hang on your wall and and tell your friends about. Um, we've we've also thought about uh, having a some of the papers that and presentations have been just really excellent. One of the things we've noticed over time has been that. Um, we're seeing uh, the quality of the work has just been tre tremendous from when we started. Actually, the first conference um, was in 2004. It wasn't an International Academy of Astronautics conference, but uh, when we did that one, we had a long way to go um, in presentations and the quality of work and what we, the, the design of space missions and what would work and so forth. So we've done great, made great strides in that area. And we thought about having maybe a, a, a special publication on to capture some of the really great work that's been done. Now we didn't request uh, papers, along full papers on this particular conference, but there may be some that would really be interested in capturing their work in a full paper and actually trying to include that in a special publication. In the past, uh, Astro Astronautica has han handled those things and we might, uh, per uh, might uh, encourage them to do it again. And uh, we've got a couple of volunteers who would like to help put something like that together, but it'd be interesting to see if uh, any of you would like to uh, participate your work uh, for something like that, and it would be really nice that we could do it. Um, so, in any way, we we can. Uh, I think uh, Brent being is, has uh, volunteered to maybe help organize such a thing. So, if uh, if anybody's interested, if you want to in, uh, just email Brent, uh, and you can even email the conference chairs, of course, but email Brent, and he would uh, help put something like that together. And uh, I think it would excellent. I mean, again, excellent papers. It would look, be nice to cop to put those into the records. So that would be great. Um, let's see. We've also talked about having a, we, we normally have a student prize. We didn't do one this year because we just didn't have really good time, enough time to get everything organized and, and deal with how we'd actually do that. Um, we probably will do it again for our next conference. And um, so um, that will be something to consider. And of course, we'll announce that as we go along. Uh, I did mention the IAU General Assembly Symposium, and I think that's something that, again, it's, 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 it's nice that organizations, organizations are bringing in components of planetary defense into their discussions. I think that's great. Uh, let's see. This, um, we'll talk more about the year of planetary defense in a bit. Um, one of the things we're trying to do here is to, uh, we've, we've thought about um, uh, bringing in a student grant program, and so I think we'll have some resources we can use for that. Um, we'd like to have some, the grants would be uh, announced at the end, uh, the, the, let's see, we, what we want to do is get applications in by the end of October, end of October, and, um, and then we would make some selections and pro provide grants. Um, that's the basic outline. Uh, so what we would, the grants would go to uh, uh, t uh, professors and student teams at universities uh, who can, uh, to, who would pro submit proposals, and so we need to 
sort of flesh that idea out. If there are people in the uh, that are uh, listening that would like to participate in the development of such a, a program, we'd really appreciate it. It could be that's be something we'd want to participate. We'd want to continue, and uh, we will uh, uh, be discussing that. So again, if anybody's interested, they should let us know. Uh, Alex had the idea of a group picture, and so uh, the Alex, would you like to describe what your what your thoughts are on that? Well, the first question came up. We usually do one, but I was wondering how that would work in the virtual environment. And I think uh, Brent made two su uh, suggestions. Uh, I'm not sure which one is. Well, one is definitely feasible. The other, I'm not sure if we can get everybody's camera on because I think there was a technical limitation on the attendees that we can't see them. Yeah. No, so I have... guess that, that leaves the option too. Um, maybe Brent, if you give me a quick sign, if you created the, the Google page yet. Uh, no, but I'll, I'll do it now and okay. send you the link momentarily. Okay, no, so the, the idea yeah. is that uh, Brent will set up a, a Google Drive um, folder where uh, all the participants can uh, submit a photo of themselves. Um, ideally, the one showing you, maybe right now, take one right now with your webcam, uh, showing you attending the conference, and then uh, we will see how we put that together. This is um, a test, so <laughs> <laughs> to make that clear, uh, we're not sure what the outcome yet will be, but um, uh, we thought that might be a nice idea. So um, yeah, we'll provide the yeah. um, the link in an email. I, I suppose there will be a post uh, post email. Oh, there, he's got it already. He does work fast. That that's great, okay. Brad. Okay, that's great. Thanks. And so, yeah, please su submit your uh, to take a picture of yourself on the screen there, and it, and we will uh, try to include that in some kind of a a, a, a large uh, thing. So, but we've got a lot of people, uh, and um, ideally we'd have it with all the attendees. But you know, having over nine hundred people uh, actually register for the conference uh, would that would make it hard. So, if, you know, if you're around and you're able to submit something, that would be great. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, student grant, the group picture. Okay, now, so one of the things we always talk about on these conference, uh, on these uh, summary uh, discussions is um, this particular conference, what you like and what you didn't like, um, what, what could we improve? Uh, we're, we're thinking about in the improvements side, we're sort of looking at having a hybrid conference that are tw in 2023. There are features of this of this format, which are very nice, and we might want to capture some of those uh, in a, in the, if we do a hybrid conference. Uh, and again, it means it so that people don't have to travel. It's uh, we would likely we probably would have a lot of attendance uh, from people who can't travel, but we'd want to capture your thoughts. So, uh, would anybody like to kick it, kick in their thoughts? Uh, they, you're, I think you love to, Bill. Uh, okay, great. I, I have been really, really pleased with the diversity, the uh, more diversity in the outline. Of course, there's been no cost. We have so many more students from all over the world. Um, I, I'm sad to say, I don't think we had anybody from the continent of Africa, but I've just been so pleased and inspired by hearing what people all over Western Europe, Eastern Europe, America, uh, North America, Canada, it's, China. it's just been, yeah, yeah. China, Japan, <laughs> right. uh, India, it, it's just been wonderful. And I think the virtual format and, and the fact that there's been no cost to participate has been wonderful. And so I hope if we, if we continue into a hybrid um, format that we can reduce the cost for people who don't have access to travel money to travel budgets yeah. that we can because I've, I've heard so many wonderful ideas uh, from people all over the world and it's it's just been lovely and I'm really really pleased to see so many young people joining the community yeah thank you Linda anyone else just comment that it was uh, it was wonderful to have so many decision makers involved this time or our colleagues from the uh, emergency management committee uh, community, uh, the heads of space agencies. We had many people that we've wanted to have at PDC before uh, and it, 
it's been difficult to be able to get their time for traveling to an in-person conference, but for appearing for an hour for a panel that worked beautifully. And if there's a way to do a hybrid conference for all the reasons Linda said, and for these reasons, a quality hybrid conference, you know, more than just the tinny telephone over the, uh, <laughs> over the audio system, I think it would be very, very valuable. Uh, thank you. I think that's true. And uh, Dave Morrison, did you want to say something? I've seen your hand on the screen there. Oh, you turn it, you're, you're muted, you're muted. You're still muted. Okay, well, please, if you, if you don't get a chance to say anything, please um, submit it via chat. We will, uh, of course, we recorded all the chats. We have those things. We're trying to figure out how to include a lot of the chats in our, in our final report. Uh, we may distill them into some form. We're not sure quite what yet, but we've gotten a ton of chats. So we could make the report very long. We won't, we won't be using all of them, I'm sure. And, um, but anyway, please uh, put your in, uh, inputs into the chat uh, and that would be great. Other comments? Let me ask about the, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the uh, time uh, uh, frame that we use this time. We basically ran this on, on Vienna time uh, and uh, we, the goal was to make sure that, or to try to encourage people uh, worldwide to participate. And I think it, it worked, but it made it really hard for some people in weird places like, uh, you know, I'm in California. So some of the stuff I had to miss cause I, it started very early in the morning for me. Uh, my plan, of course, is everything's recorded, so I'll look at that. But uh, what are your thoughts about this? Try to try to do it in a way that can be covered worldwide. Okay. Some. So yeah, somebody said well for the exercise. Yeah, somebody suggests we do a comet ex exercise for that, and I agree with that. Would be really good. Uh, we actually had a fake comet. Uh, thing that we set up one time for one of our conferences and people did use it for a subject for paper. So I think your idea on comments a good one. Um, let's see. Digital, oh, how, how about the, okay, there's a comment about we should have uh, an additional uh, Zoom with the many background rooms. Uh, really, really complimented well. Good, we should include something like that. And I think, again, that might be something that we would want to in a way formalized so that we can uh, take advantage of some of these breakout rooms and things. Yeah, if I might add something, Bill, um, Please. we received some comments. Of course, we had a lot of e-lightning talks and we had uh, posters that you could watch and they were not really part of the main program. It was a bit uh, unfortunate, but we decided this time to have, let's say, the green zone where we had a lot of panel discussions, many more than we ever had in the past, and some uh, inject sessions dedicated or related to the inject, and therefore we had less time for presentations, and there was no real time to present the posters on stage, let's say, live. So we have to think perhaps, if this is a hybrid conference, how this can be a bit improved. But And if you have suggestions, feel free to send them to us even after the conference, how this could be handled better. I think these uh, Zoom breakout rooms were one option and they were organized by individual <coughs> sessions and some for all of them. But of course, this was a, a last minute uh, idea and solution. So I guess this is something that could be done a bit better, but we have to learn also how this can be handled because we had a lot of submitted abstracts which were of high quality. Yes, and yeah. I think, Go ahead. <clears throat> no, I, I, I agree with Gerhardt's comments. I think um, for an in-person conference, we've always benefited from from being single track, which which I would be in favor of, of continuing with. Um, there are some other suggestions we could, we could consider. Um, Lorian put a suggestion in the chat about spreading the conference out over more than just one week, um, which could make it easier to accommodate multiple time zones. But um, so that's something to think about. The other things that I was thinking about were along the lines of what Gerhard said, that we're, we're better off keeping with a traditionally formatted schedule in the local time zone where the in-person conference is being held. That can certainly be broadcast in a software system just like this one. So you have the chat going and, and people whose time zones permit them to participate can. For those who don't, then you've got the recordings. And then also, I think this idea of having these extra Zoom sessions um, at different times that are um, that are appropriate for other time zones around the world, 
as Gerhard was saying, if we just do that with forethought and we plan it in advance instead of having it be kind of more of an afterthought, but you know, get get our um, organizing committee um, engaged there and get that set up more formally in advance. I think that's that's a that's a good way to handle it. Um, provide a virtual participation option for people across time zones. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you, Brent, because I, I have been so pleased that we have had so many young people in our community participating in the conference because it's been no cost, no travel cost, no uh, registration cost, and it's been fascinating and stimulating. And I hope we can work on a, a hybrid um, situation for the future. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And by the way, I, we asked uh, asked for a session, all session chairs and uh, panel chairs to be active for, uh, for well, uh, so that you actually can speak. Uh, so you should be able to uh, input your co verbal comments if you want to do it that way. So uh, I think that's good. Um, one of the things, one of the ways we arranged this conference was to make it so that we, what in that green zone was, uh, we wanted to make the green zone a, a, at a time where people could watch it worldwide because of what we were trying to do, namely put the exercise stuff there so that so that it, that experience could be shared. Um, and all the pan, I think all the panels were in the green zone. So again, that was uh, an effort to try to make that something that could be shared. But potentially, if we did, we hold this in Vienna, we can uh, deal with that, do, deal with it there at that time from zone as well. But um, what were thoughts about that? Did you think that was a, a good way to kind of centralize things to make them more globally available or what? I have a comment about the green zone. Um, Go ahead. It was, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I thought it was really uh, good so we, that we had a core time where everybody could participate. The, the, the downside of it, I think, was that you know in the middle of the you know starting at the beginning of the green zone was difficult for you in california yeah and and staying with yeah. it to the end was i'm guessing difficult for the oh, yeah. japanese and, and chinese yeah. participants yeah. so there really so so there wasn't a time where participants from east asia could actually interact with Californians, and and that was one of the reasons that I had kind of an informal poster and social session at the time I did, which was exactly antipodal to Central Europe. So the Europeans, uh, I, I well, we had one, we had Timo, who, and I think it was three or four o'clock in the morning for him. He 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 was, I think, the only one that called in from Europe. But but I think it is, it probably would be a good idea to at, maybe have something formal. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, you know, 100 degrees, 180 degrees out of phase from Vienna um, next time um, for the virtual. And then the people around the people elsewhere in the world can interact with one another. They don't have to have that sure. central European anchor time. Yeah. So it would, we, we, it would be good to do that. And I think that we have to figure out how to make that work. I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of conferences, but I think we could, as you're saying, I thought the thing you set up was very nice and it would be good to get some feedback or a summary from those kinds of things so that sure. uh, others on could know they should be go looking somewhere for say recordings if you did that. Yeah. And also I think I, 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 really liked having sort of a multiple channel where there was an informal channel where people could gather, you know, like you would at a real conference, you know, in the cafeteria or in the, you know, restaurant or the, you know, local bar afterwards. I mean, that, that, that's a good feature. I think that we should keep even, you know, even if it's only hybrid, if it's not fully really virtual, I think we should still do that. Yes. yes. Good thought. Any, any other comments? I'd like to second uh, Linda's comment about multi-generational participation in the conference. I think this is key to the success of those series. I'm trying to do my own part through family involvement and through involvement of uh, K to 12 schools here with uh, um, much energy injected into those events in the last years. And I really like the student project that is now being initiated where it's going to engage 
high level participation of college students with real research that's going to create the next generation of scientists that are going to be involved with planetary defense. Yeah. Love it, Nahum. And is your son already uh, uh, propagating the next generation? <laughs> He is because uh, through his participation in uh, Cornell, he's going to Cornell for his PhD in, in uh, political science. And he's already engaged with some students, young students that requested uh, his uh, guidance. And so, yeah, he's taking up this role of being uh, a uh, mentor himself. Yes, yeah, I, had a, uh, <clears throat> I had a student that <clears throat> I sent information on the conference. She's working in, he's, she's uh, in law school. And uh, she uh, didn't know anything about this business, you know, and I said, well, this will be an interesting conference. And so she, I got a note from her parents and she said, they said that she has really gotten engaged and thinks it's, it's a wonderful area to work in. I think that's really encouraging for all of us, you know, is to get some of the younger groups, uh, younger people involved that they can carry this ball forward as we go along, so. And I'm sure that uh, to the involvement of those uh, young uh, siblings, uh, today, they must be inspiring to their entire local community and globally. So I think this is super. I'm sure they are well known within their local community over there. That's right. Um, okay, so let's, if, if anybody has, well, any other recommendations for things we might want to do for the 2023 conference? And as you know, that's that's scheduled right now. Uh, well, we don't know when exactly the dates are, but in 2023 at the uh, UN, uh, the Vienna International Center, um, and so that'll be really nice. Um, it's a nice place, and uh, we, I'm sure um, the the UN will help us make it uh, hybrid. I, I would love to be there because I, I love my colleagues in the community, but I hope we do hybrid, yeah. which really improves access. Yeah. for people who do not have travel budgets and also students. We had so much student participation in this meeting, which was wonderful, and they had a lot of great ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Bill, if I may, um, so sure. this was also one of the intentions hosting this conference by the Office for Outer Space Affairs in cooperation with ESA to really make it um, uh, accessible, uh, to make it a global uh, event. And um, uh, I, I know that the participation was really global. We also had some participants from the African continent. We were reaching mm -hmm. out there also to the um, uh, main uh, coordinators that the, for, the, for the space agencies panel. So we hope to bring more on board in, in 2023. Uh, in terms of organization, yes, definitely hybrid mo model is now uh, something that, that also our subcommittees and the main committee um, are pursuing and we will explore the options and of course um, we would like to still welcome you uh, those who are able to join in person because as some of the previous colleagues mentioned um, it is uh, important also to have this uh, uh, networking and gatherings uh, also in person mm -hmm. thank you okay good oh, and can, you, I say, can i say something also sure uh, yeah yeah so first uh, it was a marvelous conference and really you made a great job to organize it because I know it was complicated, so it was great. Uh, for 2023, I just want to, to, to warn you about the Asteroid Comet Meteor Conference that will take place also in 2023. So if the dates are not clear yet when we want to do the Planetary Defense Conference, we have to be careful that it's not a too close proximity to uh, ACM because uh, many people from the asteroid community go to ACM. This is basically the meeting of the community, uh, but the whole community, not only planetary defense, but of course there is an overlap. So just make sure that there is enough time between the two. And the other thing also, if it's hybrid, I would still encourage to find a way to support the travel of students because, I mean, I, when I was a student, I was, it was very important to, to meet in person uh, the, the big guns, uh, if they fly, uh, it's not the same as when it's virtual. So I would uh, make a double effort to to fund mm -hmm. or encourage the students to come uh, uh, face to face if possible. That's really That's good. Um, you know, that's something we, as you know, we've been doing that. Uh, so I think, I think your points are really good ones. So for, for any any live conference, we'll try to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Other comments. 
Somebody suggested it's a good time to have some dedicated time outside the main conference aimed at younger and or new attendees. And I think that's that's probably good. <clears throat> and it, it, as I said, it, it would be interesting to see, um, you know, for example, the way we played the exercise this time, uh, the and and having this this kind of this component, the exercise itself could be played by disaster managers or universities or anybody else right along with us. We they were seeing the same information as the leaders here, and um, and so that that might be something too where we could uh, set up the exercise so that we could have uh, virtual participation uh, or have people doing their own versions of the exercise locally and have that information feeded back to us. And so, uh, but we make that doesn't have to necessarily have to be in real time either. It could be done before or afterwards, and that could be something that uh, could, we could handle. So, although we have to work with the people presenting to make sure they, they you know, they're they have stuff ready on time. So, in any event, um, I think that would be nice. Um, and oh, I'm, by the way, that brings one thing to mind. I also wanted to thank uh, the people who did the exercise. Uh, you know, the uh, let's see, that would be Kelly Fast and Lorian Wheeler and and um, of course, Paul Chodas, who set it up. I mean, those guys put in a lot of time and, you know, they had to massage their stuff because of the time. They didn't have much time to present. So they just did a great job of getting it into a, a, a digestible form, which I thought was very nice. <clears throat> and so I really thank them and you know, for all the work that they put into it. So that was great. And then I, I should should have thanked earlier the volunteers that are sitting in the background running these uh, running the technical parts of this conference. Uh, they were from the local organizing committee and they've done a great job with really um, no pain. And I, I think uh, Peter Cron has done a great job in leading that. So again, thanks to all of you for that. Um, let's see. Is there OK? And then I think maybe uh, if there's anybody have anything else on the conference they want to talk about itself, namely what things we might want to do for the next one. One of the things that I've done uh, back in 2000 and 15, I, be, I believe it was in Frascati, is that I ran a local workshop at a middle school, similar to what we just talked about today. Yeah. And uh, engaging K to, local K to 12 is something that could work out to encourage the next generation locally. Uh, I think one of the uh, objectives is to engage local communities from yeah. the youngest ages possible. So engaging K to 12 with the uh, conference might help out to inspire some of those kids to become the next plant art defenders. That's right. <clears throat> I'm, I'm wondering um, what, what we, one thing we possibly could do is is uh, capture the pr exercise presentations in a in a separate set of videos that could be used by say disaster managers or so whatever if they want to do some through some of a, an exercise for their own for their own purposes. Um, that might be something we will think about too. There could become something, some parts of the conference could be uh, transportable to uh, that, that for a different format. So, in any event, we could think about that. Um, they, could, they, they, could, <clears throat> they could be attached to the website that the seniors put together, where they have yeah. a special page for each of yeah. the scenarios. We could yeah. create a place there for those videos so they can be watched by anyone. Yeah, and then and we wouldn't necessarily have to have the panel discussions. They could have their own. <laughs> you see, so that would be good. Um, let's see. So again, on the student grant program, if again, if people are find interest in that, please let us know. I think that's something we would like to have some help uh, on, and uh, that would be good. Uh, let's see. And it was anything else on the, on the conference formats or that we might want to want to think about. Um, I, I have another comment, um, and that, that's something I put in the chat, but I'd like to emphasize it, uh, a couple okay. of things. Okay. Um, that if we, and it sounds like we are all in agreement that we are going to make this a hybrid conference, and I think we should really go all in from the very beginning on the hybrid nature. You know, we kind of had to improvise this yes, time we because, did. Yes, you know, we, did. we didn't have two years to think about it. Um, but going all in from the very beginning, advertising it that way, and also making sure that the virtual attendees are considered full-fledged attendees and participants, that they're not any, in any way marginalized. I mean, they, they're, you know, ha have them giving presentations and everything else so that, you know, th those of us, and I'm assuming I will be there, that are in Vienna, you know, can see them on a screen for, you know, giving their presentation and that there's, 
you know, maybe, you know, it went very well this time and remarkably well for, for how much time we had, but even better in terms of the ability to chat and interact and so forth with, with other people. Because I think, I mean, I think hybrid conferences and even vir fully virtual conferences are going to become way more normal. I, I mean, I don't think we'll ever return to the way we did things um, up until two years ago. <laughs> I yeah. think just looking at 700 attendees this time versus much less in other conferences is probably the punchline here. We we're able to more than double the people who were interested and participated. And I know that several people were interested to uh, register after the registration had closed. So perhaps something to think about is to uh, relax the limit or set a mechanism for some attendees to attend, uh, even if they're not presenting or uh, contributing in an active way, but just to become aware for uh, outreach. Mm -hmm. On that note, Nahum, we did share uh, because we, we had a buffer about about 100 participants uh, because we shared the links to our member states uh, because in, in conjunction with the Planetary Defense Conference, there was also a session of scientific and technical subcommittee. So each day we would post a link for attendees for member states to join and observers. In addition, we also, when, when we saw basically the, the daily average of participants per events, we also mm -hmm. shared that through our uh, social media. Uh, so just to, 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 so they could join even after the registration was closed. And we were very, very open to that. Whenever I would receive a request, we would you know, share the attendee links. What was important for us at the beginning, because we didn't know in view of a large number of registrations, which is 900, how you know the system would absorb uh, and when, once we saw that the system is actually absorbing uh, the participants uh, normally we share that further so yeah mm -hmm. yeah very good I, I, might, I should mention too you know one of the th one of the things we did on this one is we had to i mean time was really had to be managed quite closely and i want to compliment the uh, session chairs and and the presenters for doing that um we we set a limit of about eight you know normally eight minutes of presentation but you could have fewer people with longer times and so forth but with a with a block of time at the end for discussion uh, how did that uh, from some of the session chairs so how did how did you think that that format worked yeah go ahead la yeah, I thought it was pretty successful. We I had fewer participants on the panel as for the disaster managers, so they gave us a little bit more time. And uh, I think having a time at the end helped out. I think my lesson learned was uh, making sure that whoever's getting some help to keep track of the chat questions better so we can get to more people at the end. But the time at the end was, was very good. All right, thanks. And Andy Chang, you had something. Yeah, I had some feedback. Um, one of our um, invited speakers actually felt that the presentation time was too short, and so they declined to uh, to do, do do it that way. So um, a little more flexibility, maybe. I think for some of the technical topics, the even eight minutes is really just too short. Yes, so, I know. So yeah, so Andy, that um, that aspect was was really driven by the 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 desire to, to balance the quantity of talks versus that green zone the limitations on the extent of that green zone time block is really what drove that so for an in-person conference we would we would definitely you know be aiming to have more than eight <laughs> minutes per talk the the q a format notwithstanding well my experience in in my panel and in the session which i had two co-chairs for uh, the time limits worked really well, and I think that somehow in the virtual format, um, the people, you know, because we, we kept emphasizing, you got eight minutes, eight minutes, eight minutes, um, people really stayed on time, which is great. And, and when we're in person, you know, people get, you know, excited about their topics and kind of go over time. But I think we we've, we've done really, really well in the virtual format, keeping on time, which is wonderful. Yeah, 
And I think no. another element that worked well here was that uh, there were several occasions that recorded talks were inserted to prevent from holes uh, being in the program. So I think that was a, a nice feature that should be maintained. A ba backup recordings. I, I think eight minutes is is sufficient. I mean, that is sort of typical now of AGU type presentations. It's it's hard to give a presentation in that amount of time, but I'm, you you can just see more. You, you you have more opportunities to see different things if if it's limited to eight minutes. If you go longer, you have either much more time and you end up burning out it by the end of it, or you don't have as many speakers. Yeah, that's, that's, that's and I, I have given presentations at uh, a few conferences about my dissertation, which took five years, and I have to <laughs> present it in uh, eight to 10 minutes. And we can do it, you can say a lot in eight minutes. And I've really enjoyed hearing people present their work in eight minutes. It's, it, you, you can do a lot if you think about it. If you think about it, you can. Time. You get the flavor for what they're doing, and you know if you're very interested in the topic, you can always talk to them. Um, I mean, and the, having the chat feature was great because it makes it kind of lowers the barrier for asking questions and interacting. So even right. at a live okay. conference, it would you, it would be great to addresses. You know, you can do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and you know, you're not going to be nobody's interested in every single talk. So you know. If you can do that and, and interact with a speaker right after their talk, it's great. I, I really like being able to do that. Yeah. Anybody that want, want to say, I'm just looking at the chat. These people seem to really have liked the timing and the way it was managed and such. So I, I think we pretty, really appreciate that. And I think it may partly, I think it may partly be, you know, framing if instead of telling people you're coming to give a talk, right? If you frame it where you're coming to give a highlight and then have a just panel discussion, I think if people's expectations of the discussion, it's different than if they're thinking they're gonna give, you know, a 15 minute talk. So part of it might be expectations. Okay. He is meant to cover all areas of planetary defense. And like when Lindley was posting there too, I mean, there's, there's such a variety of areas that it's not meant to be a totally in-depth overly technical conference. There's other conferences to go do that or papers, but this is the chance to give the highlights like Tarek said. And yeah. I also liked the way uh, things were formatted with the talks all together and then time for questions from, from everyone because it generated more discussion and, and also it, it allowed, uh, it sort of gave that slosh for the overhead that accompanies changing talks. And so we weren't all of a sudden faced with the last speaker being rushed out of the virtual room there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that worked well. That's that's true. It did provide some some margin. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to hear all this discussion because going into it, I was I was actually a little concerned that people weren't gonna like the format as much this time um, with the shorter talks and everything, but it seems like it's quite the opposite. It seems like it's worked out pretty well and that people are mostly happy with it. Yeah, and I think for a hybrid conference, you're almost the time management is very important. If, if I think individuals on a time on a, a conference like this would want to be able to come in to see a paper presented, and uh, and they want to they don't want to mess around too much by coming in a half an hour late or you know, whatever, and they missed it. And so I think that's one reason why we tried to really stick to the uh, to the time pretty closely. Uh, it varied with somewhat within the sessions, and I think that's okay. But uh, you know, we we sessions ended on time, and so everybody had about the same amount of you know, if you will, block up time to discuss a topic. I think that, and personally, I thought that worked pretty well. And, and Bill, I think the time management worked really, really well as opposed to in-person meetings. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it, it's it's easier to deal with, isn't it? <laughs> so so that's right. No, I agree. I think the session chairs and all 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 concerned did a great job of that. Yeah, if I might make a comment, Bill. Uh, so I think we now talked about the virtual event, which I think worked much better than I had expected. Thanks to the great support, I think, we got from the local staff. You have to yeah. keep in mind, people had for 10, 11 hours, always change uh, the slides and we always be prepared. And there was not a minute of, of rest. Uh, it was yeah. really enormous what they have done. But we also, I mean, when we planned the conference originally, we thought it would be a face-to-face -face conference. And a few things, of course, we could not have. There was no other choice but having it purely virtual, but are simply missing from a mm -hmm. virtual conference. Just think of a conference dinner. Think of a, yeah, no. 
Yeah. Think uh, of uh, we had planned an exhibition in, in Vienna uh, related to client events. We could have a poster session. You can go out with people uh, to dinner at night. So a few things are just there if you have a face to face meeting. Therefore, if we have uh, a hybrid meeting, which I also think is a good idea and the way of the future, but we also should think that a face to face meeting still offer some advantages. This time we had no choice. And as yeah. in my view, uh, the local organization did a great job. Absolutely great. Absolutely amazing. Uh, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, one thing we ask our presenters to do is to submit submit their presentations uh, in PDF form uh, ahead of time. And uh, we and those I wish I had volunteers in the background who ran those things most of the time. There are some who gave uh, you know presentations themselves, uh, particularly for longer ones. But most were run in the background. And and um, did what did people think of of having to do that? Having to give your uh, give your information on a PDF ahead of, a little bit ahead of time. I think it's wonderful to have the PDFs online because they will stay there. They were there at the beginning of the conference, and they will stay there for a while. I'm not sure you and Usa yeah. can, can yeah. say how long they'll uh, survive, but that's wonderful. So you can follow up, you know, you can get into the details. I think that's great. Yeah. And by the way, the plan is to uh, is that the, everything's been recorded on the conference, and the PDFs, of course, are part of the record of the conference, and all that is going to be permanently uh, available. So that's that's the goal here, and that's what we're working for. So um, oh, I think the, permanent. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah so and I, I posted the um, um, web page link yeah. where you have the PDFs of all the joint presentations and also the um, the recordings available so far. Mm -hmm. Good. So the question that I was asked is that whether the backup recordings are going to also be part of the permanent records of the conference, because yes. some of those presentations contain animations that cannot be accommodated on the PDF. The plan is to capture everything. So, Good. yes. So, I think that's that's nice. Um, let's see. I, I guess the last, if there's nothing else on the on the format of the conference or any of the other things that we might want to include in the next one, um, and if if not, then what I'd like to do then is talk about this uh, international year of uh, planetary defense. And the, the conference has had a record has a record of of uh, having I guess resolutions that we agree on, and um, and if, if every if if people agree on that, we'll. Presented as part of the record, and you know that'll be nice as well. It'd be in our our, our report, uh, but we could make that public in any press releases or whatever we put out as well. And so, um, uh, if I, let's hear some comments, say from the the uh, session chairs about or the conference organizers, uh, organize organizers, I should say, the uh, conference co-chairs as to what their thoughts are about uh, this International Year of Planetary Defense. So, Alex, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, I also like the 2029 date, um, as it coincides with uh, Apophis. It gives us some time. And okay. I, I think what was mentioned earlier by um, uh, Pedro and Kevin uh, was really good that we could um, piggyback on the existing network of the uh, astronomers that are already out there. And I also uh, want to second what, what Sergio Camacho said in terms of um, it would be great to utilize that to um, have these national centers, organizations who work with IWAN so IWAN can get um, uh, to be the trusted source of NEO information. Um, so it's it's like a two in one, and uh, the whole thing uh, as well can be seen to to get uh, maybe um, um, more support for for legal advancements within the UN to to get some some of the things sorted out we discussed on on days two, three, and four, I believe. Yeah. So I think there, there's great merit in 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 writing that way. Okay. And now, whom? What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think that this is a great idea. Uh, it sounds like that it has definitely the international flavor associated with it, which should bring together the world communities. Uh, we should make sure that it has outreach to all continents, even those that did not participate this time might have a chance to participate in such an event, such a uh, project, if it's planned ahead of time. And I think it's a great idea. I completely support it and uh, be glad to uh, help with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Brent. I agree. I think it's a good idea. Um, uh, as Alex was saying, I think it's an opportunity to uh, to, to continue to to, to kind of nurture the work that's already begun in terms of the legal framework of, um, uh, for planetary defense matters that was discussed here. And in fact, I think it's also a good opportunity to to not just continue the the legal work, but also um, the other very interdisciplinary um, aspects of planetary defense that we've seen at, at this conference, um, even more than we have at, at prior editions of the conference, the disaster management, the economics. Um, so all of that, including legal aspects, I think it's a great opportunity to get more engagement on those things. And most, uh, especially at the international level, I think, you know, broadening the international um, nature of, of planetary defense is key. So, um, also, it's it it's the timing's good because by at the earliest that we could get it together, you know, it would be a nice, nice lead up to Apophis, which, you know, would would spark a whole another year of of attention. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could really string together a couple few years of strong attention on planetary defense. Yes. Yeah, and I, and I think I think one more point about uh, having it uh, in twenty twenty nine is that it's going to be the 25th anniversary of the conference series, right? It started in 2004, which will be a good place to create a summary of all of the recommendations that came out of those conferences and uh, uh, became uh, active, uh, you know, resolutions for planetary defense. And uh, a lot of the participants will definitely will contribute 25 years of conference discussions and recommendations. So it's going to be two events that are going to coincide in this year that will give it big exposure, I think, international exposure. Mm -hmm. Very true. And uh, Gerhard, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. May I just jump in and make a remark? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have the date set yet for the PDC 2029, but obviously a purpose is coming April 13. <laughs> so we might think if we want to coincide that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's yeah, a good one. <clears throat> if we had it, or avoid you know, stomping on uh, observing plans, right? Because some of our some of our attendees might be off at telescopes, right? That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, and it might make it difficult to participate in uh, international year events if we're all tied up with the PDC. So that's true. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of opportunities we can think about that as we go forward. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, so to be also in favor, I'm quite supportive. I think it's a good idea, and uh, 29 sounds also uh, a good timeline. Of course, we would have to think uh, what activities are foreseen uh, in that year, which are in addition to what is normally going to be held. I mean, uh, a fleet of small reconnaissance spacecraft to Apophis would just fit in nicely. So I would mm -hmm. uh, be in favor if the uh, PDC, even in our summary, expresses support for having an international planetary defense year, maybe in 2029. Yes, and I, I, I mentioned, yeah, I'm, I'm very supportive as well. It seems, you know, I think that one of the it, one of the things I like about the planetary defense topic is it it, it is something that it's a global issue. Everyone in the, in, on the globe should be interested in this, and it's one of the one of the things that can actually bring together people on the planet, and that's what I think is necessary and something we ought to have as a long term goal is to get uh, get space agencies worldwide involved in discussions on this, and I know they have been since through I one and same page, and uh, but I think we need to encourage that. Uh, we also ought to get some of the undeveloped, uh, say, uh, the non-space faring countries uh, into involved more too, and uh, so we have to think about how how we should do that. And uh, but I think it is a global issue, and we it's something that we all need to think about. And uh, having an inter international year of planetary defense would kind of highlight that. 
Um, so one thing that, that was set recommended is that the, the we would have to, the conference should be should participate in the organization of uh, the development of a proposal for for such a uh, thing, and uh, I'm sure we can find people who would want to participate in that, uh, both among the conference chairs and and and, and organizing committee and otherwise. So I don't think there should be any problem in finding people who want to help us with this. And uh, it looks I thought the information that was planted uh, was presented earlier about the. Uh, what was done for past in the past was very would be very helpful and potentially if we could have a person or two from from that has that experience involved we would go further so um, again i think it's very nice and i really appreciate the idea that doris part forward of having a discussion about that i think that was quite timely and perfect so um is there anything else we need to talk about is, is, let's just say does anybody have any uh, on that's not able to talk or not talking so far do they have any uh, opinions, uh, any any reasons why we should not do that? And if you do, you can send them, you can send them in the, in the chat if you do so. But if you would like to say something uh, just for out of the hinterlands there, please do. Yeah, Bill, I would like to. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was at the very first meeting, you may remember. And in fact, I, I believe I every one of the planetary defense conferences. I may be the only one here except you who's done that. <laughs> yeah. I just want to recognize the tremendous role your leadership has played, creating the very first conference, going all the way through this. Uh, and I just think we owe you a great gratitude. And I want to say that on the record. Uh, well, thank you. It's been, I've enjoyed it. It's been great fun. And I think we've come a long way. You remember that day, you know, that when, when I think, um, well, we had two things. We had Larry Niven talk. Remember, he was at the first conference. So he's a writes science fiction books, and his topic was, uh, "What do we do with about the giggle effect?" Remember, that was an issue. People didn't think the planetary sense was, uh, defense was anything we need to worry about. Well, the asteroids are never going to hit us. What's the problem? And um, and so I think we've come a long way in in trying to get past that problem. And uh, I thought that was very nice. And then also one thing at the time, there was no way to get a warning of, uh, of a, an asteroid threat up to leadership. If, if you remember, you know, I think that question came up and said, okay, how, how does, how, in the United States, how would you get a message to the president? Uh, is there official path to getting a message to the president that there's a, a threat? And there wasn't at the time. There now is, and that's so. Some of these little little things come along, and it makes a big difference. And of course, Lindley wasn't in his job then either, but he was one of the presenters at lunchtime, and uh, he uh, he's helped move this really along in, in his new position, and he's just done a great job. So, I think having the space space agencies involved as they are now, and you look at the things that. Um, uh, Detlef has done it in NISA and some of the other uh, leaders at the, in their countries. It's just amazing to see how this has moved, um, has moved over time. So I think it's quite exciting and when we, we, there's a lot more to go. So I'm really excited about what we, where we've come. So, um, so I think that's, that's good. So thank you very much for that. Any other, anybody have any comments, uh, uh, say negative about the, um, about this idea of uh, international year of planetary defense? And so I would say, if not, I, there will be a recommendation that uh, that this go that idea go forward, and we'll work with Romana and uh, uh, to make sure it's done. The, there that we work with some international uh, international entities to do that, some nation states, and um, and you might think about lobbying in your countries for support to that when we get to that opportunity. So, uh, anything else anybody wants to say? Um, this is Doris. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the response uh, regarding this idea. And uh, um, I, I will uh, repeat what my colleagues and friends mentioned that uh, I send them thank you notes and they even reiterated the fact that uh, uh, their offices and the network uh, who did the astronomy outreach for IYA is willing and ready to help us if we ask them. Excellent. So, thank you. I am really humbled by this response. Thank you. All right. Yeah, well, thank you very much again. Very nice of you to bring it forward and set that panel up. Anything else? <clears throat> 
Bill, I have one comment I mentioned to you yesterday, but I'm not sure if we first want to wrap this conference and the next one up before bringing this up. Otherwise, we shift gears too much, I guess. Okay, so and if, if there's not, <clears throat> and nothing else, we can end the discussion about this conference and the next one. And uh, Alex, what's your concept? Uh, so, um, I had an idea a couple of uh, months ago, and I wanted just to, to put that out to the community and see what uh, you all think about it. Uh, as you know, the, the PPC <clears throat> is a biennial event, so it happens every two years in the, in the odd years. And um, so far, there's nothing in the even years. So, um, what do you think about having a sort of a PDC light in a virtual format in the even years? And that can just be two, three days, maybe over a weekend or so. I mean, we can we can discuss the details. And I don't want to make this a burden on on anyone on on the chairs or the organizing committee. Um, so, I was thinking more like. Um, similar to, to a space up conference where basically the the audience provides the content so um if if we can get some some keynote speakers together or, or just some some breakout rooms to discuss about certain topics um just to keep the community engaged during the years and give a little update what's going on before um like preparing for the next pvc really Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like this idea, Alex, because it, I think you've been uh, part of the conversations about how we need to have uh, a planetary defense conference that focus focuses specifically on communications because this is it, it it's an issue that keeps coming up again and again. And I've been thinking maybe every other year we have the big PDC, and in, in the between years we have. Uh, PDCs that focus on communications or technology or science. I like that idea. Uh, I'm I'm certainly not opposed to there being a, a focused workshop or something in the uh, uh, even years and intervening years. Uh, uh, some of us already have <laughs> workshops in the intervening years <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, events uh, that take place. Uh, so. Um, uh, maybe we organize those and, and make them a little bit wider known. Uh, but I'm sort of against a, you know, official, you know, planetary defense conference at event in the even year. Yeah, you know, I think that's because, uh, many of us already have <laughs> a lot of activity in the even years. <laughs> we do, right? Yeah, and, and organizing a conference is not easy, as you, as you can tell, I'm sure. And so, um, but I, but I, there may be some things like, you know, one of the things that we did, we, we never had a, we never had an asteroid threat in the Southern Hemisphere. I guess that's good. So those guys are feeling pretty good down there. But I'm, I'm just wondering whether or not we, we, we need to get, figure out a way to involve expert and, and scientific people and so so forth in that side of the house and i think it would really be nice to do that i noticed yeah. that the the iau has uh, has uh, sort of done that uh, with you know they got telescopes all over the place and that's very nice but we need well, to involve yeah. some of these in a, in a in this in this particular topic and well I, uh, uh, a, a proposal to host a pdc in the southern hemisphere would be well received let me just put it that way yeah i think that might be something to really consider no question. Yeah. Could buy a house there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Wherever you go, it'll it'll be coming in there, Deadlift. All oh, that insurance money now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So in any event, but we I think there's something we can think about. And if anybody has some good ideas about that, I mean you certainly could do an exercise um in another country. Um and um I think that or a conference down there too. So I think that would be nice too. We I, we should get more involved with uh, have more more parts of the planet involved. So I think that's all good. So maybe uh, a mini PDC in even years could be organized by the younger participants, maybe thirty five and younger, to encourage them to learn how to organize conferences and participate and build their own. Uh, you know. Uh, capabilities and skills to do that. 
maybe you know maybe in our student competition we could uh, put a put a challenge out there if you're, if you've got a team that involves uh, universe other university students other universities or students we can uh, that might get some favorable review as well so anyway, a wonderful yeah. proposal Nahum, because i've been so impressed by the 35 and under people participating in pdc this year it's been wonderful yeah. Yeah, so they could organize a mini event in between and uh, prepare themselves and the general community for the main event in audience. Yep. And, and of course, what one thing nice too is those those those, those entities could report at the conference too, the full conference, and get uh, some publicity for their good work. So, um, all kinds of things we could consider. Just question, and actually, I think this is one thing I'd hope that this International Year of Planetary Defense might spur, is creativity along these lines as to uh, as to what can be done and how these how people can get involved and get more people, more young people involved and so forth. So I think that's really a nice, nice concept. 